This is the NBC Theater. From the NBC Theater in Hollywood, an hour-length dramatization of William Faulkner's tragic novel, The Wild Palm. The Wild Ponds is one of the few William Faulkner novels which departs the time and place of the main body of his work. But it is very good Faulkner indeed, containing some of his most brilliant and terrifying passages. A story of two lovers, doomed as inevitably and almost as poetically as Romeo and Juliet. We bring it to you today in an adaptation for radio by Richard E. Davis of NBC. And at intermission, we bring you a recorded commentary on the works of William Faulkner by a brilliant fellow novelist, Robert Penn Warren, whose book, All the King's Men, has this year been made into a truly magnificent motion picture. Here now is The Wild Palms by William Faulkner. The Mississippi sky was overcast. The dark sea wind blew strong and steady and filled the air with the dry, harsh clashing of palm fronds. The wind hissed through the shack, which, weathered and warped by the damp, salt air, leaked all privacy in the manner of broken socks and trousers. On the beach before the shack, there was a new beach chair where the woman sat, dark-haired, doing nothing, in a pair of faded jean pants and canvas shoes, with queer, hard yellow eyes in a face whose skin was drawn thin, at first sullen and later afraid, not reading, not doing anything, just sitting there while the man, who was young too, and dressed in a pair of cocky slacks and a sleeveless jersey undershirt, sat beside her. time is it, Harry? Almost supper time. It seems... It seems later. The sky has turned so dark. You want to go in now? No. No, I, I think I'll sit out here a while longer. I'm hurting. You've got to hurt, Charlotte. It's the pain that you've no. got to hold on to to keep no. alive. Hang on, hang on to the hurt and you'll be all right. Oh, don't slip away, darling. Well, let's not kid ourselves. I've had my day of defiance. Now I've got to pay up. I'm only holding on so you can get out of here before they come. No, Charlotte, it's still us. There is no more us, Harry. Pretty soon the, the hurt's going to get too big. And that's when I won't be able to hold on. And then there's just going to be you. I'll get a doctor. No. Get away from here and stay away. You promised me. Let me get a doctor. The landlord in the next shack, he's a doctor. He'll know what to do. He'll know that there's been an illegal operation, Harry. And he'll know that you're to blame. He looks like a kind man. I noticed that when he brought over the gumbo his wife made for us. A small town doctor with a good busybody wife. (laughs) Don't faint, Charlotte. Don't faint. You've got to hold on. More gumbo, Doctor? Why, thank you, Martha. Don't mind if I do. I do declare you make the best gumbo in Mississippi. I hope our tenants next door appreciate what you sent over to them. The way they're living beats me. That woman, sitting all day in that beach chair. What do you think makes her sit like that all day? I think she's been hurt deep. Never in my life have I seen so much hate for the race of man in a woman's eyes. Then what did she come down here with him for if she hates him? She don't hate him. She hates the race of men. Masculine. I thought you said she didn't talk. She didn't talk with me. But I see the way she's listening. She's listening the way people do when they listen to an organ die deep inside themselves. They listen to the beat, a flag maybe. Go up and down and up and down. 
and then finally dying. Doctor! Doctor, open up! Open up! That sounds like the fell on the shack. Doctor! I told you she was hurt. More likely she's cut or shot him. Doctor! I'm coming! I don't know what's been going on over there, but something tells me it isn't going to be pretty. <laughs> now you hold her head. Can you do that? Yes, yes, I can do that. <laughs> All of a sudden, she got worse. Well, that'll happen with this kind of a case. I'll see if this ammonia will help. <laughs> That's a girl. I think we can keep her alive till the ambulance gets here. Do you think she'll live? Does she want to live? I, I don't know. You're her husband, aren't you? Not the way you mean. But you told me when you rented this place that you were Mr. and Mrs. Who is this woman, anyway? Mrs. Charlotte. Rittenmeyer. And who does that make you? Harry Wilburn is my name. Dr. Wilburn. You a doctor? Then are you the man who treated this woman? Yes, yes, I did it, I did it. But what you did was illegal, against the law of man and God. I know it, I know it. But she didn't want the baby. Just don't try to leave here. You're going to have a lot of explaining to do when the ambulance gets here, and I turn you over to the deputy sheriff. You're going to have a lot of talking to do. Explaining? How can it be explained, any of it? It all began on the night of my 27th birthday. I had two months to go to finish out my internship in a New Orleans hospital. I was lying on my cot, thinking of the years I had dedicated to poverty. Dr. George, report to Ward 3. Dr. George, report to Ward 3. As I lay on my cot, I looked down toward my foreshortened feet, and it seemed to me that I saw there the 27 irrevocable years diminished and foreshortened beyond them in turn, as though my life were to lie passively on my back, as though I floated effortless and without volition upon an unreturning stream. I seemed to see the empty years in which my youth had vanished. The years for wild oats and daring. For the passionate, ephemeral love of adolescence which had not been for me. This I was thinking with that peace with which a middle-aged eunuch might look back upon the dead time before his alteration. At the fading and edgeless shapes which now inhabited only memory. Hi, Harry. Oh, hello, Flint. This telegram came for you down at the desk. Here. Thanks. Well, it's from my sister. She wishes me happy birthday. Well, the same for me, Harry. You celebrating tonight? No, no, no. I think I'll stay in. No date again. Not even on your birthday. What's the matter? Don't you believe in fun, Harry? Well, to tell you the truth, Flint, I've been so darn busy, I, I don't know anybody, a girl, that is, I could call up for a date. Then why not come along with me? I'm going to a party. A real party down in Frenchtown. <laughs> That's nice of you, Flint, but nobody invited me. Oh, it's not that kind of a party. All there'll be is a mob sitting around on the floor drinking homemade gin. Oh, I've got no dressed clothes. Well, your host will probably be wearing a bathrobe. But if you want a tux, I'll borrow you one. We'll be the two fanciest dams at the whole darn party. <laughs> All right. Why not, Flint? Why not? <laughs> Is this the place? Yeah, this is it, all right. Listen to him. I'll ring the bell. Yeah, I hope this suit looks okay. I, I never wore one before. Harry, sometimes you sound like you've never even been to a party before. To tell the truth, Flint, this is the first time in all my 27 years I ever was at a real party. Well, I'll be... What do I do? Just find yourself a woman and leave the rest up to her. There's so many things that come natural to a woman... That a man just has well, to learn. That's just it, Flint. I've never learned anything except, you know, medical books. What do I do? Well, the first thing, you go over and stand in front of one of the pictures. This place is filled with modern pictures. Somebody will come along with an idea. Wow! Come on in, fellas. Here you go, Harry. Listen, boys and girls, this here is Dr. Wilburn. 
Watch him. He's got a pad of blank checks in his pocket and a scalpel in his sleeve. Well, if that's true, Dr. Wilburn, I'd like to have a consultation with you. Private. Come along, Viola. The doctor's too young for you. Oh, I like that. what do I do? The pictures, like I said. One picture worth a thousand words. Good luck, kid. Having trouble making up your mind about that picture, Dr. Wilburn? I, I beg your pardon? That picture you've been staring at. How do you like it? She was standing beside me. She wasn't beautiful at first glance. She was a young woman and a good deal shorter than I. And for a moment I thought she was fat. Until I saw it was not fat at all. But merely the broad, simple, profoundly delicate and feminine articulation of Arabian mares. A woman under 25 in a print cotton dress. A face which laid no claim to even prettiness and wore no makeup save the painted broad mouth with a faint inch-long scar on one cheek which I recognized as an old burn, doubtless from childhood. Having trouble making up your mind about that picture, Dr. Wilburn? Well, it's a very unusual picture of... Charlotte's my name. Charlotte Rittenmeyer. It's a pleasure, ma'am. Thank you. Uh... What do you think of the picture? Uh, marshmallows with horseradish. <laughs> <laughs> I paint, too, though I prefer to sculpt. Oh, a lady artist. Mm, an artist, anyway. And I can beat that thing hanging there. <laughs> <laughs> Feel here my palm. It's a sculptor's palm. Mm, strong, like a man. That's because I work a lot in clay. And brass, too. That sounds very interesting. What do you make? Oh, I make things you can touch, pick up. Something with... with weight in your hand. Not poking at a piece of cloth with a knife or a brush like you were... like you were trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle with a rotten switch through the bars of a cage. <laughs> you talk like a man, too. <laughs> well, I'm not. But I know a lot about men. Oh, you sound very sure when you say that. That's because all of my family were brothers except me. I like my oldest brother best, but... Well, you can't marry your brother, and he and Rittenmeyer roomed together in school, so I married Rittenmeyer, and now I have two little girls. Oh, I didn't know you were... That right. I was married. Uh-huh. Would it have made any difference? <laughs> well, no, I guess not. I was just hoping that you weren't, that's all. You aren't married. Oh, golly, no. Well, <laughs> well, that's something to be thankful for. Not that I'd care, either. What's your husband like? Oh, his nickname is Rat. What's really important to him is that everybody calls him Rat. Rat's the nickname they give freshmen at the University of Alabama. That's his school. And my husband is the senior living ex-freshman of the University of Alabama. <laughs> um, by the way, are you slumming? I don't know what you mean. That dress suit. Oh. <laughs> well, you see, this is my birthday. Oh. And this is the first time I ever had a dress suit on. Well, <laughs> happy birthday, Harry. Thanks. I'm 27 years old. I'll drink to that. Um, you have had a drink before. Oh, I know all about alcohol. The technical <laughs> side. Hmm. I've performed experiments with mice. So you know how it is with mice. But you don't know how it is with yourself. <laughs> I guess that's about the size of it with a lot of things for me. You see, most of my life has been spent in books reading other people's answers. Well, good morning, Dr. Wilbur. Oh, hello, Flint. It was a good party. Back, welcome back among the living. Come 4 a.m., I was getting worried about you. Oh, I got along all right. I can see that. Hmm? Wipe the lipstick off your nose. Huh? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where'd you two get to, anyway? Oh, we just went out in the garden. There was a big jasmine bush out there. Oh, you just went out in the garden. She's got a husband, Jack. I know that. And kids. She told me all about that. Did she, uh, tell you what happens to country boys who get mixed up with married women with husbands and a couple of kids? I know what you're thinking, Flint. But she's different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're all different. That's why it's so much fun. Sounds to me like you got it bad. Maybe I have, Flint. Maybe I have. I'm going to see her again today for lunch. 
Uh oh. Twenty-seven years I had gone without love. And then there was this. For the next few weeks, we went for lunch in one of those little French cafes in the Vieux Carré in New Orleans, where you could eat on the two dollars I was supposed to send each week to my sister back in Oklahoma. Harry. Hmm? Harry, what are we going to do about this? Well, what can we do? Oh, don't let's kid ourselves. For weeks, we've known that sooner or later we were going to have to figure out what we were going to do. I don't know, Charlotte. I was never in love before. I've been. But I don't know either. Harry, I told Rat. Told him? About these lunches and about how I've been meeting you. I suppose he was angry. No. No, but he said no divorce and he means it. I even offered him ground. Charlotte. Well, Charlotte. what else could I do? Wouldn't it have been worth it? Yeah, but he said no soap. If he had, what would it have done to your children? I wasn't thinking of them. I, I mean, I've already thought of them, so... So now I don't need to think of them anymore because... Because I know the answer to that. And I know I can't change that answer. And I don't think I can change me. Because the second time I ever saw you, I learned what I'd read in books, but I had never actually believed. That love and suffering are the same thing, and that the value of love is, is the sum of what you have to pay for it. And any time you, you get it cheap, you've cheated yourself. So I, I don't need to think about the children. I, I settled that a long time ago. I was thinking about money. Charlotte, I haven't got a cent. If I did, we could go off to Chicago. For two years, ever since I came to the hospital, every week for two years, I've been sending my sister a money order for two dollars and no cents. And to do this, I can't even buy cigarettes. So that's that. All of it, huh? The end of us. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure out something. Listen, tell me again that you haven't got any money. Say it. Hmm? Give me something that I can accept as the strong reason we can't beat. Even if I can't believe or understand that it could be just that. Just money and not anything but just money. Come on and say it. I have no money. All right. All right, it makes sense. It must make sense. It'll have to make sense. Now you can take me home. No. No, put me in a cab and send me home on my money. You pauper. The cab went on fast. It disappeared almost at once, although I was not looking after it. The opposite direction was mine. I started walking along the curb, and after a while I came to a trash bin sitting on the curb edge. And there, resting in the mass of discarded newspapers and fruit skins, was a leather wallet. It held five stubs of five parimutuel tickets from Washington Park a customer's identification card from a national gasoline trust and another from a BPOE lodge in Longview, Texas, and $1,278 in bills. $1,278! And the next day, we left for Chicago. Rat came to the train with Charlotte, and there we were. The husband and the wife, he in the conservative, unassertive dark suit, the face of a college senior revealing nothing, lending an air of impeccable and formal rightness to the paradoxical act of handing the wife to the lover, almost identical with the mumbo-jumbo of father and bride at a wedding in a church. She stood beside him watching the train slide in with that instinctive proficiency in and report for mating even of innocent and unpracticed women. That serene confidence in their amorous destinies, like that of birds on their wings. An utter and complete faith in airy and fragile and untried wings. The airy and fragile symbols of love, which in taking flight, they repudiate. The three of us stood at the door of the coach. Harry, 
Rat's coming with us as far as Hammond. Go in the coach, Charlotte. Go in and sit down there. Well, you don't have to push me, Rat. Remember now, Charlotte. If I don't hear from you by the 10th of each month, I'm going to give the detective the word. Yes. And no lies, yes. see? No lies. Nothing to lie about, Rat. I want to talk to you, Wilburn. You can stay right here on the platform. Goodbye, Rat. I'll be in the coach, Henry. Listen, Wilburn. If any harm comes to her, if you're not on the square with her, I'll know it. If I don't hear from her by the 10th of every month, I'm going to give the detective the word to go ahead. Send him out to Chicago. And I'll know lies, too, see? I see. Wouldn't take any money, so here. What's this? A cashier's check for $300, payable to the Pullman Company of America, and endorsed, as you'll notice, for one railroad ticket to New Orleans, Louisiana. I was going to do that with some of my money. Well, if it's ever cashed and returned to the bank and no ticket bought with it, I'll have you arrested for fraud. You mean you want her to come back? You'll take her back? I ought to suck you. It seemed at that moment that Rat and I both stood aligned in battle doomed and lost before the entire female principal. I took the check and went to sit beside Charlotte in the coach. Where are we now, Harry? On our way to Chicago, north. I mean, the place, this minute. Oh, on a trestle on the water, a way out between Mori Pass and Pontchartrain. A lot of water. All swamp bound and no horizon in sight. I love water. That's where to die. Hmm? That's where I'd like to die. In the water. Not in the hot air above the hot ground. To wait hours for your blood to get cool enough to let you sleep, and and even weeks for your hair to stop growing. The water. The water to cool you cool you quick so that you can sleep. To wash out of your brain and out of your eyes and out of your blood all that you ever saw and thought and felt and denied. Darling, darling, let's look ahead to the new life we both believe in. Now is the honeymoon. Oh, listen. Listen, it's got to be all honeymoon. Always and forever and ever until one of us dies. It can't be anything else. Either heaven or hell... No comfortable, safe purgatory between for you and me to wait. Wait until till good behavior or shame or repentance overtakes us. So it's not me you believe in, put trust in. It's love. Not just me, any man, and love. Yes. Yes, it's love. They say love dies between two people. Oh, that's wrong. It doesn't die. It just leaves you and goes away if you aren't good enough or worthy enough. It doesn't die. You're the one that dies. I've got to get used to love, Charlotte. You, you've got to give me time. I've never tried it before. You see, I'm, I'm ten years behind myself. Oh, yes, Harry, but you're getting used to it. You stole the money we've got now. Wouldn't you do it again? Isn't what we've got now worth it? Even if it goes bust tomorrow and we have to spend the whole rest of our lives paying interest? Yes, Yes, only it's not going to bust tomorrow, nor next month, nor next year. Nor ever. Not as long as we're worthy of keeping it. Good enough and strong enough. Worthy enough to be allowed to keep it. Keep it? Oh, that's what we're going to do, Harry. And that's not a sin. Oh, it can't be a sin. From Hollywood, the NBC Theater is bringing you Wally Mayer as Harry in a radio version of The Wild Palms by William Faulkner. Now, a word of appreciation from those of us connected with this program to the National Council of Teachers of English, who this year gave their sole annual award to the NBC Theater. In their words, it has been the program which has done most to promote greater understanding and appreciation of our literary heritage, to promote powers of intelligent listening and critical thinking, and to raise the ideals of good speech and writing. And now, our intermission commentator, Robert Penn Warren. William Faulkner 
is the author of 18 books, with a 19th announced for publication. This is the fruit of some 30 years of labor, and that body of work will, I imagine, last as long and loom as large as any literary product of our country and this half century. Faulkner has created a world in this fabulous county in Mississippi where most of his stories are laid is as solid and real as any area where surveyor lines run and taxes are paid. But Faulkner does not tell us something about Mississippi. Rather, he makes Mississippi tell us something about ourselves. That is the final measure of his achievement. But let us look at some details of that achievement. First, there is the powerful evocation of the physical world, a brooding relish and intensity in contemplating the rich texture of that physical world, the pine whiny afternoons of August, a dusty road stretching forever across the red clay hills, and a single wagon coming along it, the sinister, moccasin-inhabited, dappled gloom of the forest, and the big river in flood, and little piddling creeks that run backward one day and forward the next, and come busting down on a man full of dead mules and hen houses. Second, they are the people in the stories of this world, the violent, dark, obsessed stories and the violent, dark, obsessed people, the Popeyes and Christmases and Snopeses. But they are also the humorous people and the humorous stories, for Falcon's a great humorist. And always there's a group of suffering and good and devoted people those people who may be outraged by life, but who keep some hold on justice and goodness and are able to endure. Third, Faulkner's stories and novels are deeply felt and deeply thought. They mean something. In one way, we may say that Faulkner is a critic of our modern world, of its moral confusion and indifference, its materialism, its dehumanizing organization, its worship of the bitch goddess success. And that brings us to our novel today, The Wild Palms. It is a strange novel in that it is composed of two independent stories that seem to be entirely without relation to each other. One is the story of a Mississippi convict who in the great flood of 1927 is ordered out in a skiff to a rescue and is caught in the flood and borne away. The other story is that of a man and woman who fall in love and are borne away from their safe and respectable lives, much as the poor convict is borne away on the flood. Both stories then are related in that they are stories of the driven and dispossessed, of people outside society, and in both stories we find a triumphant humanity of courage and humor somehow lightening a dark fate. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Our radio version of The Wild Palms will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. When we got to Chicago, Charlotte took over the problem of finding us an apartment. I don't know what it is about women that makes them so efficient in the domiciling of an affair. Not thrift, not husbandry, but something far beyond that. A completely infallible instinct, a completely uncerebrated rapport. And they all believe they can take Lothario himself and trim the very incorrigible bachelor's ringlets which snared them into the seemly decorum of Monday's hash and suburban trains. It. Found what? An apartment, a studio apartment where I can work so too. Wait a minute, what is this work too? Well, Harry, you don't think that twelve hundred dollars will last forever? Well, we seem to be doing pretty good. There's always the day of reckoning, and for us that day comes on the uh, the fifteenth of September, and on that day we won't have any money left. <laughs> I guess maybe you're right, <laughs> but you see, I'm ten years behind myself. You just wait till I get used to love. I'll think of something. Oh, you think a lot, don't you, Harry? Uh, I do. And the fact is... Now, please, <clears throat> please don't laugh at this. But I was thinking that as long as I don't have a license to practice medicine here in Chicago, I might try to do a little writing about some of the things I've been thinking about. Why, why Harry, I think it's wonderful. Oh, not that I take it seriously, you understand, but I thought... 
Well, you know, they say write about something you know about. So I thought I'd write about love. That was the beginning of our life in Chicago. I rented a typewriter and began writing fiction. true confession stuff, and I sold it. Charlotte began to make little figures which she sold to stores for window displays. Money came in little by little, and we squeaked by the 15th of September that Charlotte had worried about. Cheddar. But then Charlotte got a job decorating in one of the Chicago stores, Days, which left me all alone, Days. And then the Christmas season started. Charlotte began to work nights, evening, that is, and then something happened one night just two days before Christmas. Just a minute, just a minute. I'm coming. Oh, Harry, help me, will you? My oh. arms are so full of packages I couldn't reach. Here, here, I'll, I'll take some of those. Oh, thanks. Well, you're home early tonight. Oh, I simply had to take some time off to do my to do my Christmas shopping. And... Mm. Oh. There. Mm, that's better. I wondered how long I'd have to wait for a spot of necking for you. <laughs> How did your day go? Well, I cranked out 3,000 words from 8 o'clock till sundown. A true epic of confession fiction beginning at 16, I was a mother oh. and a widow. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> oh, it's too bad the publisher won't get it in time to send a check back before Christmas. Well, when your job gives out after the holidays, we'll need every nickel we can get our hands on. Ah, but that's it. I have good news. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They've offered to keep me on at the store after Christmas, clear through the summer at least. Oh, isn't that wonderful, Harry? Charlotte, you shouldn't be working like this. Now, I don't mean to come the heavy husband on you, but it's wrong. Why, for heaven's sake? Because we're never alone anymore. <laughs> you home-wrecking Boy Scout, you. We've always been alone. I know two people could be more alone if they tried. That's not true, Charlotte. Why, with these crazy hours, we never see each other. Oh, but we will. Honestly, I never in my life saw anybody try as hard to be a husband as you do. But all we do is sleep and eat. But that's all other people do. But never together, never alone together. And that's what we bought when we walked out of New Orleans. What we're paying for, to be together and together, and that's what must be. Of course, Harry. That's what we want for us. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just tell them to take their old job and give it to somebody else. Somebody who has a husband who, who doesn't love them as much as mine. She was a better man than I was. She loved that job. But most of all, she wanted for us to be happy. So she quit the job. And three weeks later, I entered a downtown Chicago office building and ascended 20 floors to an opaque glass door lettered Callahan Mine. And there I met a red-faced, cold-eyed man of 50. You want the doctor's job in our Utah mine, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Callahan. And I think I can meet the qualifications. I went four years and graduated... Never mind that. Can you take care of the ordinary injuries that men working in a mine shaft might meet? I was just trying to tell you, sir, that... I heard you. Listen. You're the man to protect the mine owners as well, the fellows who pay your salary. I understand, sir. There'll be no medical inspectors out there to ask to see your license. I want to know if I can count on you to take care of the company first. You know, uh, no lawsuits. Yes, sir. I can do that. All right. You leave Chicago tomorrow. The pay is 1500 and keep. Well, that's not much, Mr. Callahan. I've got a good degree. Then you don't want this job. This job is nowhere near up to your qualifications and your desserts. Good day. I said good morning. If if you'll give me transportation for my wife, I'll take the job. You're on, Wilbur. There's a train leave Chicago for Utah tomorrow night. Be on it. 
So we made ready to leave the apartment in Chicago where we had lived all those months. And in our leaving left no other mark of all of our time of living and loving other than cigarette scars on the table. No mark of the worthwhile believing in relationship that we were trying to build. And when the time came to go, a friend came by for us. McCord, a young fellow who knew one of Charlotte's brothers in New Orleans. McCord was one of those pleasant young fellows called good guys. And Charlotte and I liked him very much. He came by in his car and drove us down to the station. Train number four, the Mountaineer, leaving for the west on track 17 in ten minutes. Well, you two, still time to back out? McCord, we are not to be tempted by last-minute speeches. Well... Before you folks give yourselves up to the winter in Utah, we still have time for just a drink. Oh, will you and Harry have one, Mac? I'm no good at farewell. Charlotte, uh, could I have a kiss from you before you go? Why, sure, Mac. I'll make it one for the road. Only I'm the one that's going down the road, eh? Goodbye, Mac. Keep punching, kid. I'll be along in a couple of minutes, Charlotte. (laughs) Charlotte took that pretty seriously. Oh, I'm sorry, Harry. I didn't mean that. I I just wondered what it was with you. Well, it was that for a second there, I knew I'd never see her again. Oh, how about that drink? What'll it be, gentlemen? Ryan Water. Yes, same for me. Very well, sir. Well, what's eating at you, Mac? Oh, I wish I knew what it's all about. You're, you're leaving Chicago this way. Here you're making fair money, and Charlotte has a good job. You you had a nice place to live in, and then all of a sudden you quit it. Make Charlotte throw up her job and start out in February to live in a mine shaft in Utah. Listen, Mac. Charlotte taught me a long time ago that the best thing in life was to live for the short time you're alone. Breathe, be alive, and know it. So why go all the way to Utah to breathe? What's wrong with Chicago? We're getting respectable, and we don't like what it's doing to us. It's respectability that makes chiropractors and clerks, bill posters and motormen and pulp riders of us all. But you were doing all right, Harry. Mac, I had tied myself hand and foot in a little strip of ink ribbon. Daily, I watched myself getting more and more tangled in it like a a roach in a spider web. And all the while, we thought we were going great guns. What changed your minds? I got afraid. But you had love and money. What was it to be afraid of? Because money you can't depend on. And there's no place in the world for love today. Mankind has eliminated it. Oh, it took us a long time, but man is limitless and resourceful in inventing, too. And so we've got rid of love at last. Why, if Jesus returned today, we would have to crucify him quick in our own defense to justify and preserve the civilization... We have worked and suffered and died and shrieking and rage and impotence and terror for 2,000 years to create and perfect him man's own image. So if you know that's true in Chicago, it's true in a a forsaken mine shaft. The city was part of what was being done to us. Living the way we had to, starving would have been nothing. It could have done nothing but kill us. What we had was worse than death or division even. It was the mausoleum of love and... Well, we chose to get out. But out of the frying pan, what next? So let the next move be up to them. I am vulnerable in neither money nor respectability now. So they will have to find something else to force us to conform to the pattern of human life, which has now evolved to do without love, to conform or die. So I'm afraid, McCord, because they're smart, shrewd, or they'll have to be. If they, if they were to let us beat them, it would be like unchecked murder and robbery, Mac. Well, then you can't beat them. Of course we can't beat them. We're doomed. That's why I'm afraid. Train number four, the Mountaineer, leaving for the west in five minutes. Will you give me your blessing? <laughs> you can take my curse. A 
great dirty canyon served as a bed for the mine shaft. On one wall, a half a dozen houses made mostly of sheet iron and window deep in snow clung. The canyon was not wide. It was a ditch, a gutter. It soared, swooping the pristine snow, scarred and blemished by and dwarfing the shaft entrance, the refuse dump, the few buildings. Beyond the canyon rims, the actual unassailable peaks rose. Cloud raveled in some incredible wind on the dirty sky, and the whole had a quietness that was strange. The Callahan mine looks deserted, Harry. Well, maybe that's the way mines look. It's funny the superintendent didn't come down to meet us. We've come this far. We might as well walk on over to the office and introduce ourselves. Come in. Are you the superintendent? That's right, stranger. You mind closing the door? Well, what can I do for you, mister? I'm Dr. Wilburn, and this is my wife, Charlotte. Pleased to know you. This is Mrs. Buckner. How'd you do? Hello. I'm Bill Buckner. Glad to see you, sir. You and the missus picked a bad day to travel, didn't you? Well, Mr. Callahan said he'd get out of here right away. Callahan? Mm -hmm. You mean he sent you out here? That's right. He hired me in Chicago. <sighs> well, I'll be... <sighs> sent you out here. You hear that, Billy? <laughs> well, what's so funny? <laughs> oh, it isn't a doctor we need. I don't understand this. Callahan said you need a doctor because you had a lot of Chinese workmen and... The uh, Chinese are gone. And Italian workmen. Gone, every last one of them. All we got are poles working night and day to make overtime they're never going to get. I don't understand. Tell him, Buck. Don't keep him in suspense. Come on and tell us. There hasn't been a payroll in here since last September. Callahan mines are broke. Maybe he can hustle up some money now that you're here. I don't know. But it looks to me like the only reason Callahan hired you was to meet examinations by the mine inspectors. In that way, he can keep his mine open and still go on selling stock back in Chicago. Reach over and turn up the stove, will you, Harry? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I must have dozed off. What happened to our friends, the Buckners? They went on up to bed. Oh, Harry, what are we going to do? We can't stay here. Looks like the question is, when do we get out? It's got to be soon, Harry. Well, we can stick it out until we get our bearings and then shove off again after a couple of months. It's... It's got to be sooner than that, Harry. Hmm? What do you mean? <laughs> oh, put your arms around me, Harry. Hold me. Hold me. Well, what's wrong, Charlotte? What's happened? Oh. Believe me, Harry. I'd give anything if only it hadn't happened. But now it has. Darling, what are you trying to say? There's a baby on the way. Charlotte. I didn't mean for it to happen. When? When will it be? In the summer. Oh, it can't be, Harry. I don't want it. Of course we want now. it. No. No. We choose our lives in the way we live. There can never be any children. But it'll still be you and I, Charlotte. A baby can't change us. We don't know. We can't be sure of that, and I don't want it. And you've got to do something about it. What are you getting at? What are you suggesting? Call it what you like. You're a doctor, Harry, and there must be something that you can do. Now, listen. Don't you ever think about that. There are some things a doctor... Don't be a boy scout on me now, Harry. Now, listen to me, Charlotte. You're, you're upset now, dear. All women are, but they get used to the idea. I don't want to get used to the idea. And that's why you've got to do something about it. What you're suggesting is murder. But it's different. You're a doctor. No decent doctor in his right mind would listen to what you're suggesting. Oh, Charlotte, darling, we'll go where it's warm, Charlotte. South, you can have the baby. I've already had two. I don't want this one. Don't say that. Children hurt too much, Harry. Not in the being born, but in the living. You've got to do it, Harry. And finally I did. Because there seemed nothing else to do. I did what Charlotte asked me in the name of our love. 
But something went wrong. In the great doom black tent in which we'd crawled, two people in search of happiness, something went wrong. I kept my promise to Charlotte and took the life she asked. And in the taking, I marked the one I loved to follow the unlamented unborn. Charlotte grew weaker and weaker. Knowing, half guessing, she asked me to take her back to New Orleans so that she might have a chance to say goodbye to Rat and her children. And then we were back in New Orleans where we had started a year before. And once again, Charlotte was standing inside Rittenmeyer's house and I was waiting outside. She was seeing her children, the ones she had born. Was it for the last time? And once the children were out of the room, Rat would try to reason with her. Charlotte, listen to me. I tell you, I won't go to the hospital. But if, if something's gone wrong, you, you can die. Maybe you've got, what do they call it, toxemia, septicemia. You're sick, go to a hospital. I can't go to the hospital. Because you're afraid they'll find out that Harry did it to you and put him in prison for it? It wasn't his fault. I won't let them hurt Harry. I'll assume all the blame, tell all the lies. I want to save you, Charlotte. We're going away. Harry and I are leaving New Orleans. When? This afternoon. We're going to a village on the doctors and hospitals here that can help you, Charlotte. Why are you going away? Sit in the sun until I get better. But if you don't get better? Then... Then I'll sit in the sun. Charlotte, we're almost there. Ah, oh, the sun will be good for you, darling. You'll be all right. Do you love me, Harry, a lot, an awful lot? You know that I do. Then listen, if we're going to get it. Get it? If I don't live, you'll know in time, won't you? We're not going to get anything. You'll hold out. I, I've helped you hold out so far, haven't I? Don't be a fool now. There's no time now. Every minute I get worse. You'll know in time, so... So get out, do you hear? Don't talk that Promise way. Promise me. Don't you know what they'll do to you? You can't lie to anybody, even if you would. And you won't be able to help me if you stay. But you'll know in time. Just telephone an ambulance or the police or something and, and wire rat and get out fast. Promise me. Charlotte. Harry! Oh, Charlotte. Oh, doctor, doctor. Take it easy there, young fellow. <laughs> you better keep calm. The deputy will want to talk to you when he comes. Let him come, but let him come fast. Where's the ambulance? You promised the ambulance would come. You aren't in New Orleans, son. Little Mississippi towns like this don't have many emergencies of this nature. The least they could do is hurry. She's suffering so. You should have thought of that before, son. Before you murdered her. The siren came, and the ambulance appeared, and the deputy, with the indelible mark of 10,000 southern deputy sheriffs, the snapped hat brim, the sadistic eyes, the slightly unmistakably bulged coat, the air not swaggering exactly, but of a formerly pre-absolved brutality, who snapped the handcuffs on my wrist and supervised Charlotte's loading into the ambulance by the intern, who didn't do a thing for her but 
took her name and age and birthday in triplicate and asked me instead of going first to jail, would I like to go to the hospital and wait while the doctors tried to save the life of Rittenmeyer? Charlotte. Mister, I wonder how long they're going to work on that little old girl of yours in there. I, I don't know, officer. Every smart man in the hospital's been in that operating room almost since the minute they wheeled her in. Look, look, you got a cigarette. I told you, you can't smoke in here. You know, you hear a lot of funny stories about doctors and nurses. You think they're true about what goes on in hospitals? They're like the stories you hear about every place else. Hey, now. Look at this sweet little old nurse. Hmm. Mr. Wilburn? I'm Mr. Wilburn. Doctor says I can take you in to see her now, but just for a minute. You mean in a room? On the operating table. Then she she didn't live. Mrs. Rittenmeyer died at eleven oh three. Who? Come on, Jack. Take him to the dispensary, officer. The doctor says you can give him a drink. I don't want it. You better take it, Jack, because over yonder in our little old jail, y'all gonna get some mighty thin lips. Quiet! Quiet down, then. Visitor to see you, Wilburn. Send him down, officer. He's right down there, Mr. Rittenmeyer. Hello, Wilburn. How are you, Rat? I just came from Charlotte's funeral. Is that what you came to tell me? I brought your clothes. I see you have. Thanks. I made your bond. They let you out this morning. Hooray. And I brought you some money. It's the same $300 I gave you in the check when you and she went away the first time. I don't want it now any more than I wanted it then. $300 should get you a long way. I'd say Mexico. What are you getting at? Jump bail? Yes. Get away from here. I'll buy you a railroad ticket and send it to you. I'm sorry. If, if you get to New Orleans, you, you could even ship out on a boat. I'm sorry. Think of her. I wish I could stop. I wish I could. No. No, I don't. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the reason. Then think about me. I wish I could stop that, too. I feel like... Not me. Don't feel sorry for me, see? Rat, maybe I'm sorry be because you can't do anything. You won't go? Maybe if you could tell me why... Time's up, Mr. Rittenmeyer. I'm coming. You forgot the money. So you won't do it. You won't? I'm sorry, Rat. Only if you could just have told me why, maybe I would. Maybe you'll understand a lot of things a little better, Mr. Rittenmeyer, when the state of Mississippi gets them into court. How does the prisoner plead? Guilty, Your Honor. Is the accused trying to throw himself on the mercy of the court? I just plead guilty, Your Honor. Then there's no need for the state to make a case. I will instruct the jury That's it. to... Kill him! Kill him! Who is that man? I'm Francis Rittenmeyer, huh? husband of the deceased. Disarm that man! I'm not armed. What's the meaning of this clowning? If the court pleads, I'd like to say something. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Rittenmeyer, this case is closed. However, if you still wish to make a statement, you may do so. Step forward, please. I, I would like to make a statement. I wish to make a plea for 
mercy for this man. You what? You what? A plea. I would like to make a plea for mercy. Mercy for this man who willfully and deliberately sent your wife to her death? Quiet. Quiet. I'll clear the court. I'll clear the court. Sit down, Mr. Rittenmeyer. I'll get you protection out of town. I don't want protection. Maybe you'll need it. Now sit down. Gentlemen of the jury, you will find the prisoner guilty as charged. And so bring in your verdict, which carries with it a sentence at hard labor in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than 50 years. You may retire. I reckon there's no need of that, Judge. I reckon we all pretty much... You will retire. Uh, Do you wish to be held in contempt? Retire. Even if you come back in two minutes. Oh, I hate to see that evening sun go down. I hate to see the Mississippi wind blew soft and dark through the palms that clashed in the dull of early after sundown dusk, bringing with it the smell of swamps and wild jasmine, blowing on under the dying west and the bright star. It was night. Hello, Wilburn. Huh? Oh, Rat, I, I didn't see you standing there. The deputy let me in. I brought you something. Money? No, a package little package. Here, to take it. Rat, you just won't give up, will you? What is this stuff? Cyanide? Fifty years is a long time. I won't use it, Rat. But I thank you. I thank you, Rat. I'm not doing it for you. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for her. And so it is for this that I am living. But while I am, there is memory to think about, forever and inescapable. So long as there is flesh to respond to memory. And if memory exists outside the flesh, it won't be memory, because it won't know what it remembers. So if she became not, then half of memory became not. And if I become not, then all remembering will cease to be. And between grief and nothing, I will take grief. You have been listening to The Wild Palms, an NBC theater production of the William Faulkner novel. The Wild Palms is available in a signet book reprint. If you wish to increase your knowledge and appreciation of literature, we suggest you might enjoy the college-supervised courses now being offered in connection with the NBC Theater. For full information, write to NBC Theater in care of one of the following universities or colleges. The University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. The University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kansas State Teachers College, Pittsburgh, Kansas. Washington State College, Pullman, Washington. The University of Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, Texas College of Arts and Industries, Kingsville, Texas, or Brooklyn College, Brooklyn, New York. You also have a chance to win a set of the famous Encyclopedia Britannica. Several of the universities and colleges offering these courses are giving the Encyclopedia as prizes to the students doing the best work. Enroll in a supervised course and you may be one of the fortunate ones to win the Encyclopedia Britannica. Next week, the NBC Theater makes this broadcast time available for a celebration of Human Rights Day by the United Nations that will include the Boston Symphony Orchestra with Leonard Bernstein conducting the world premiere of the United Nations Hymn by Aaron Copland. Be with us again at the NBC Theater on December 18th for the first radio production of Thomas Wolfe's wonderful novel, You Can't Go Home Again. And on Christmas Day for a dramatization of Alice in Wonderland, starring Dinah Shore.
The Wild Palms was adapted for the NBC Theater by Richard E. Davis. Wally Mayer was featured as Harry. Lynn Allen was Charlotte. Gloria Ann Simpson was Martha. Jim Nusser was the doctor. Helen Andrews, the nurse. Glenn Denning was Flint. Ann Diamond was Viola. Tom Charlesworth was Rat. Nestor Piva was Callahan. Clark Gordon was McCord. Chuck Mencken, the deputy. And Gain Whitman, narrator. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Our intermission commentator was Robert Penn Warren, whose commentary was recorded. The director of the NBC Theater is Andrew C. Love. This program came to you from Hollywood. What's on NBC tonight? Madeline Carroll and Basil Rathbone co-star in the detective melodrama The Amazing Dr. Clitterhouse on Theater Guild on the Air. And for more detective work, remember to tune for Sam Spade today for his most humorous adventure this season. That's two great programs you'll surely want to hear. Sam Spade and Theater Guild, both on NBC. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. The Jell-O Program, starring Jack Benny with Phil Harris and his orchestra. The orchestra opens a program with Here's Love in Your Eye from Jack's own picture, the big broadcast of 1937. Hang out the welcome sign. Strike up the band. Jack Benny's back with us again. Tonight marks the beginning of Jack's and Mary's third year on the air for Jell-O, and they're raring to go. And judging from all the letters we've had, you're raring to listen. So everybody's happy, and lots of the credit for that goes to you, our audience. Because your enthusiastic support of Jell-O makes it possible for us to continue these programs. The makers of Jell-O have asked me to thank you for your encouragement. And they've also asked me, as official Jell-O spokesman, to thank Jack and Mary for all their grand work in the past, and to wish them great good luck on the new series they begin tonight. So let's give six delicious cheers for the one and only genuine Jell-O, and for Jell-O's one and only Jack Benny. Ladies and gentlemen, after four months' vacation, we present to you the man the whole world is waiting to hear. New York, New York. Who's on the air tonight, dear? Jack Benny. Oh, let's go to a movie. Denver, Colorado. Oh, Daddy, let's go see a picture show tonight. Jack Benny is on the air. I want to see you in Tempo. Glasgow, Indiana. Heather, who's on the radio tonight? Jack Benny. Well, it'll cost me money, but let's go to the movies. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring to you the man who has done more for moving pictures than any other comedian, Jack Benny. Well, Don, Don, would you mind trying one more town? Uh, which one? Oh, anyone. Say, uh, Waukegan, Illinois. Okay. Waukegan, Illinois. Who's on the air tonight, Mr. Benny? My son, Jack. What a boy. <laughs> oh, then you're not going to the movies tonight. No, I saw the picture. <laughs> uh, do you want me to tune in any other time? No, Don, that's enough. Huh? Well, Jello again. This is Jack Benny, who has just returned from his vacation. And I want to tell you, it's great to be back again. Back with this old gang of mine. You mean me, Jack? I sure do. Let's give Wilson a nice big hand. <laughs> 
Yes, sir. <laughs> but no kidding, Don, you look swell. Fit as a bass fiddle. <laughs> I don't know, you're so tan and rugged. Oh, thanks, Jack. You look tan and rugged, too. Uh, where did you so. spend your vacation? Well, Don, <laughs> I worked uh, most of the summer at the Paramount Studio, but I did manage to get a couple of weeks off. So I went to uh, Saratoga Springs to the races. I wasn't very lucky, though. Oh, Saratoga Springs. Oh, yes, I lost an uncle there once. Hmm. Well, I had to put up cash. Oh. <laughs> and, uh... <clears throat> and then I spent a couple of weeks camping up in the Adirondacks. Oh, that's right. Uh, you told me you were going to do that. Yeah, and by the way, Don, I want to thank you for lending me your shirt. Oh, that's all right. It was swell. I had the only tent with a soft collar. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that would go over, didn't I? I like that a lot. Yeah. What have you been doing the last few months, Don? Well, uh, I had your job. I was master of ceremonies on the Jell-O Summer Show. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, you know, Jack, uh, the Jell-O sales increased tremendously. They did, huh? Yes, sir. And, and that means that while I was telling jokes, more people than ever before went out and bought Jell-O. While you were telling jokes. <laughs> well, that's a boost for the product only, you know. Come in. Uh, pardon me. Uh, Lewis is my name. I'm a reporter on the radio guide. Oh, yes, yes. I'm here to get an interview. Oh, of course. Certainly. Uh, pardon me, Don. Right. Has Kenny Baker arrived yet? Not yet. Uh, thanks. I'll wait. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, I'm uh, Jack Benny. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, what were we talking about, Don? Oh, you were saying how tan and rugged I look. Oh, yeah, I thought we went further than that. Uh, oh, Don, look who's here. Hello, Don. Hello, Jack. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. <laughs> well, uh, Mary, it's good to see you. You're looking great. You haven't changed a bit. You look good, too, Jack. Gee, you're so tan and ragged. <laughs> Mary, it's not ragged, it's rugged. I know, but who can get a laugh? Oh, Mary, always thinking of the program. Well, honey, have you had any fun? Did you have a nice vacation? I did until I had to go to the hospital. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't either, Mary. Yeah, and you know, Jack, I had the cutest doctor you ever met. Yeah? You ought to see him. Blue eyes and a little mustache. Mm, what a doll. A doll, huh? Yeah. Last week, he took my tonsils out. Gee, am I excited. Well, why are you excited now? Next week, he's taking me out. <laughs> Oh, boy, is he handsome. Yeah, yeah. Say, Jack. What? How do you get more tonsils? You can't get any more. Gee, I wish I had something else I didn't need. Mary, cut it out, will you? Uh, pardon me, has Kenny Baker arrived yet? No, Mr. Lewis, but if there's any information you want, I'm always glad to talk to a reporter. No, thanks, I'll wait. Who is that, Jack? Oh, some fellow. Well, Mary, didn't you take a vacation at all last summer? Oh, sure, Jack. I went to Coronado Beach for three weeks. You did, huh? Yeah, and I brought you a little present. Here. Oh, Mary, my, what a pretty seashell. <laughs> my goodness, huh? See, just what I needed. <laughs> well, let's see what it says on it. Oh, souvenir of Coronado Beach. Oh, gee. And you know, Jack, if you put it up to your ear, you can hear music. No kidding. I'll try it. Mary, I don't hear any music. You don't? No. Oh, I forgot to tell you, you got to put your other ear up to a radio. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, well, Jack. Yes, Don? Uh, Phil Harris is here. You haven't forgotten about him, have you? Oh, Phil, of course. Gee, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet a new addition to our little group, that famous orchestra leader, Phil Harris. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Jack. I want to apologize, Phil, for not introducing you sooner. Oh, that's all right. You know how it is, the opening program and all the nervousness and excitement and that reporter bothering me all the time, you know. <laughs> but Jack, uh, he didn't ask you for an interview. That's what bothers him. <laughs> Does not. Oh, Mary, this is Phil Harris. Phil, this is Mary Livingston. Hello, Mary. I've always wanted to meet you, and I'm very happy that we're going to be together. Oh, thank you. I'll be glad to have dinner with you tonight. <laughs> Mary, he didn't ask you to go to dinner. What a cheap guy. Don't mind her. One thing I want to tell you, Phil, you're going to enjoy being with us. I never interfere with anything. You can always pick out your own music. In fact, you can be your own boss. And not only that, I'll always see that you get the best jokes. 
What joke? The one about being your own boss. <laughs> Quiet. Well, Phil, how about a little number? Let's hear the new orchestra. Eh? All right, Jack. For the first number, we'll play Bye Bye Baby. Well, uh, pardon me, Mr. Benny. Has Kenny Baker arrived yet? No, but I'll be glad Never to... mind. I'll wait. Mm. <laughs> Play, Don, or John. Or what's your first name, Phil? Steve. Oh, yes, play, Frank. <laughs> La Porter. Baby, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, with Johnny Green at the piano on another program. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you, Phil, as one musician to another, that excellent music. Thanks, Jack. Say, Phil, you don't mind if I describe you to our listeners, do you? After all, they will be interested. In no, it. but, uh, well, don't build me up too much. I won't. <laughs> 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 you don't know nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, folks, in describing Phil, I might say he's tall, rather good-looking, the ladies like him, but still, he's the kind of a guy you can trust with your best girl, if you can trust your best girl. <laughs> oh, Jack, why don't you quit ribbing? I'm not ribbing you, Phil. I just happened to run across a joke. Well, you're about due. <laughs> First time your orchestra laughed at anything, isn't it? <laughs> First program. Well, anyway, folks, I said before, Phil is the romantic tri type. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I didn't mean that. Well, that was really, that was really a slip. I didn't mean that. Uh, Phil is a romantic type. Yes, sir. He's got fire in his eyes, a wave in his hair, a smile on his face. And rhythm on the range. Quiet, Irene. Okay, Tim. You know, Jack, Phil Harris is cute, isn't he? Yeah. He looks just like my doctor. Mary, forget that doctor, will you? Gee, I can't get him off my mind. Oh, doctor. I wish you'd have stayed home till you came out of the ether. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to hear about that guy all season, huh? Uh, pardon me, are you sure Kenny Baker hasn't arrived yet? No, Mr. Lewis, I know he hasn't. Then you, Mr. Benny, tell me. Do you think radio is here to stay? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not. Goodbye. <laughs> I knew I'd get an interview. <laughs> Hey, Don. Yes, Jack? Uh, open the closet and let Kenny out. Okay. Here he is. Hiya, Kenny. Hello. Oh, Kenny, you're not sore because I locked you in the closet, are you? No, but you didn't have to hang me on a hook. Well, I'm always neat. <laughs> Hey, I was saving you for that big entrance. You heard that applause, didn't you? Oh, sure. Thanks, Jack. Certainly. Hello, Kenny. Hello, Mary. Hi, Don. Hello, Kenny. Say, Kenny, have you noticed uh, Don's put on a lot of weight? Yeah, he looks so ton and rugged. <laughs> <laughs> At 
think we've carried that joke far enough. And Kenny, I want you to shake hands with our new orchestra leader, Mr. Harris. Glad to know you, Kenny. Gee, it's a Phil. <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. And why didn't you stop him? Oh, I took your line. I'm sorry, man. Well, tell me, uh... <laughs> tell me, Kenny... <laughs> tell me, Kenny, what kind of a vacation did you have? <laughs> huh? Oh, pretty fair. It was all right, I guess. Uh, where were you? <laughs> well, I spent two months in Catalina, four weeks in New York... And a half hour in the closet. <laughs> well, it wasn't his fault. Boy, is he dumb. He is not. He is, too. He didn't even notice I had my tonsils out. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mary. Why don't you tell him about that doctor you're so crazy about? He's crazy about me, too. Yeah. Well, Kenny, it's been a long time since we heard you sing. How about a little number right now? All right, Jack. I'll sing The Way You Look Tonight. Oh, your voice is better than that, Kenny, huh? <laughs> um... <laughs> hey, I didn't think that was gonna go over that big, did it? Well, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Oh, the phone. Wait a minute. Hello? Yes? Oh, it's for you, Mary. Uh, hello? Yes? Oh, hello, doctor. It's my doctor, Jack. All right, stop trembling. <laughs> How are my tonsils? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> mm. What's that? You have? Well, I've been thinking of you, too. I wish she'd leave her romance out of this program. Shh. What? <laughs> oh, doctor. No. No, doc, you'll have to coax me. No. Mm. No, you'll have to coax me. You'll have to coax me. Fine. Oh, doctor, this oh. is so sweet. Sudden. What does he want, Mary? A check for the operation. <laughs> oh. Some nerve. I'm glad I met Phil Harris. Yeah, sing, Kenny. Baker singing The Way You Look Tonight, written by Jerome Kern for the picture Swing Time. Well, Kenny, your vacation must have done you a lot of good because you're singing better than ever. I mean, your voice has a better quality. It's clearer and sweeter. Thanks, kid. <laughs> <laughs> kid, well, 
Time marches backward. <laughs> Say, Jack, uh, will you do me a favor? What is it? Hmm? I brought my girl over to our first broadcast, and she's dying to meet you. She just wants to say hello. Oh, I didn't know you had a girl. Sure. I met her this summer over at Catalina. <laughs> Boy, she thinks I'm pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> Bring her in, Jenny. I'll be glad to meet her. All right. She's kind of dopey, though. <laughs> yeah, I figured that. Yeah. Now bring her in, huh? Come here, honey. I want you to meet Jack Benny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hello. Hello yourself and see how you like it. <laughs> well, well, so you're the little girl from Catalina. Yeah. What's your name? Lena Cat. Oh, go on. Who told you to say that? Kenny. Ain't he screwy? Well, Kenny, you sure know how to pick him. You got a nice little girl there. Yes, but she's fickle. She likes Fred McMurray, too. Oh, Fred McMurray, the movie star? Yeah, he's my dream man. She's smarter than I thought she was. Mary. <laughs> so you like uh, Fred McMurray, huh? I'll say. Gee, I'd go to see him even if it wasn't bank night. <laughs> Well, I don't blame you. <laughs> oh, Mr. Benny, I hope you don't think I'm too fresh, but, uh, well, um... What is it? Come on, don't be bashful. Would you give me a lock of your hair for a souvenir? <laughs> ah, you are fickle. But isn't that cute, Mary? She wants a lock of my hair. Why don't you give her the whole wig? <laughs> what, and catch a cold? Some other time, Lena. Say, your girl's all right, Kenny. She's talented, too. I wish you could use her on the program sometime. Oh, yeah? What's she got that I haven't got? Tonsils. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, that's good, you know. Well, Jack, Jack. What is it, Don? Uh, your guest star's just arrived. Oh, did he get here? Gee, I was worried there for a minute. Keep him in the entrance till I introduce him. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I know that all of you have heard and read about that hazardous transatlantic flight made by Harry Richmond and Dick Merrill, one of the greatest achievements of mechanical skill and human daring the world has ever known. This round-trip flight was made in exactly 39 hours and 17 minutes. What courage, what stamina to endure the rigors of such a flight. So now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor and distinction that I present to you the man who drove the truck that carried the gas that filled the tank of Harry Richmond's plane. <laughs> None other than Mr. Samuel T. Butchvener. <laughs> Mr. Butchvener, I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your appearance on our program this evening. Thank you. Now, how did you feel when you were given this assignment to deliver the gas to Mr. Richmond? Well, I was a little nervous at first, but I knew I could do it. I see. <laughs> well, uh, tell us about your trip. Well... After a light breakfast consisting of a New England boiled dinner, mm -hmm. I took on a big cargo of gasoline. Uh, how much? Oh, just oodles of it. <laughs> oodles of gasoline, I think. Yes, well, anyway, I swung into my truck and took off at exactly 3.10 a.m. From the gas station? Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> I made moderate speed through 59th Street until I reached the Queensboro Bridge, and then I let her out. How thrilling. From then on, it was smooth driving until I reached Flushing Boulevard. Oh, Flushing. Is that that winding street? No, it's a straight flush. <laughs> now, tell me, on your trip to the airport, did you encounter any headwinds? Yes, but it was all right. For buoyancy, I'd filled my truck with 40,000 cannonballs. <laughs> Now, what kind of a reception do you receive on your arrival at the airport? It was sensational. And what did Mr. Richmond say to you when you delivered the gas? I'll pay you later. I see. <laughs> now, Mr. Bushman, before I lose my temper entirely, uh, besides driving a truck, what other notable contribution to aviation have you made? Well, during the World War, I took up flying. Oh, you did, uh, Were you a promising student? Oh, yes. My instructor told me that in no time, I'd make an ace of myself. <laughs> Uh, getting back to your journey, 
<laughs> Did you have any trouble on your return trip? Yes, I hit a road pocket and was thrown out of my truck into an open manhole. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Mary, what are you laughing at? An ace in the hole. <laughs> Okay, now, just uh, one more question. Did you make this trip alone? No, I had my assistant driver with me, Mr. Borscht. Well, I, uh, I don't want to appear personal, but there has been a report that you and your co-driver have been on rather unfriendly terms, especially on this last trip. Is there any truth to that? Definitely no. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. In fact, there's never been any jealous flow, see? I get it. So do I, and thank you. Is Mr. Borsch here with you? Yes, he's sitting right in the audience. Well, put him on a plate and bring him up. <laughs> uh, Mr. Borsch, will you come up here, please? <laughs> uh, I wish I had known this sooner. So you also made this trip, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> well, tell me, when you get behind the wheel of a truck, what road do you like to travel best? You mean my favorite highway? Yes. Oh, Jack, give me the road. The white winding highway. Then let me know the unbeaten byway, and I'll travel along. Singing a man, give me the road, Mary, give me the road. Come on, Mary, give me that road, Mary. Go on, Mary, come on. All right, we're yellow. Play, Phil. picture of the same name. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our first program is nearly over, and I'd like to announce our feature attraction for next Sunday night. Most of you have read that outstanding novel by Hervey Allen called Anthony Adverse, and many of you have already seen Warner Brothers' great production. If you haven't, see it this week, because next Sunday night, we are going to present our version of that famous classic, our own super, gigantic, stupid, uh, stupendous, <laughs> colossal presentation, Anthony Adverse. Don't miss it, folks. Next Sunday night, you'll cheer. Hooray! You'll laugh. <laughs> you'll cry. <laughs> you'll sneeze. <laughs> Next Sunday night, folks, when we bring you Anthony Adver Adverse, in addition to the regular newsreel, short subjects and bank night, bring your own bank. What thrills, what chills, what glamour. What are you talking about? I don't know. Next Sunday night, Anthony Adverse. <laughs> I have a real piece of news for you tonight, grand good news. The makers of Jell-O now present you with a brand new product, Jell-O chocolate pudding, the best tasting chocolate pudding that's ever come your way. It's smoother, it's creamier, it's more chocolatey. Jell-O chocolate pudding has that swell homemade flavor, the same goodness you used to enjoy when your grandmother made chocolate pudding. And Jell-O chocolate pudding is so easy to make, just mix the contents of the package with some milk in the top of your double boiler 
and let it cook until it becomes thick and satin smooth. Then when the mixture's cooled, pour it into the sherbet glasses, and you're ready to surprise your friends and family with a fine, rich, thoroughly delicious chocolate pudding. Each package gives you six servings and sells for the same low price as Jell-O. Ask your grocer for Jell-O chocolate pudding in the morning. Remember the name, Jell-O chocolate pudding. last number of the first program in the third Jell-O series, and we'll be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Meanwhile, I'd like to announce that the chap who played the part of the truck driver on tonight's program was Benny Baker of Paramount Pictures. <laughs> and Benny, you... Benny, you certainly played the part of that truck driver very, very well. Well, that's what I used to be before I went into pictures. Don't sell your truck. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> Mary, isn't he nice looking? Nah, he looks like my doctor. Oh, good night, folks. The Jell-O program starring Jack Benny has originated in the NBC studios in Hollywood over the Red Network. This is the national broadcasting company. From the NBC University Theater, a first radio production of the most challenging novel of 1949, George Orwell's 1984. Our star, Mr. David Niven. Here with a disturbing broadcast, a dramatization by Milton Wayne of George Orwell's 1984. In his current and very widely discussed novel, Mr. Orwell has projected the totalitarian techniques abroad in the world today to their terrible extreme. The plight of the individual in this world, we leave you to assess for yourselves as you listen to the story of Mr. Winston Smith, portrayed today by the internationally known British actor David Niven. At intermission, we will bring you a commentary on Mr. Orwell's writing by another distinguished author, Mr. James Hilton. Here, then, is David Niven in George Orwell's 1984. The clocks of London are striking 13. On this cold April day, you hurry to escape the vile wind. You slip quickly through the glass doors of Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with you. The hallway smells of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At one end of it, an enormous colored poster with a man's face more than three feet wide. The face, a ruggedly handsome forty-five with a heavy black mustache. Big brother is watching you. What's that? Oh, no need to jump like that, Mr. Smith. I was just reading off what it says on that poster. Oh, of course. It's seven flights up to your flat. It's slow going for you, Winston Smith. Frail and underweight and 39 and tormented by a varicose ulcer above your right ankle. You have to rest several times on the way. On each landing, the poster with the enormous face looks down on you. And the eyes follow you. Big Brother is watching you. Everywhere, from every wall, from every building. Big Brother is watching you. You're in your flat. But you are not alone. You are never alone. Thus, the total production of pig iron is 58,328,912 tons. The voice comes from an oblong metal plaque like a dulled mirror which forms part of the surface of the right-hand wall. You turn a switch and the voice sinks somewhat. But there is no way of shutting it off completely. The telescreen receives and transmits simultaneously. 
So long as you remain in its field of vision, you can be seen as well as heard. And there is no way of knowing when the thought police might plug in on your wire. There is no way of knowing. You move over to the window. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. You stand at your window and you look down. You think with a vague distaste. This is London. This, the chief city of Airstrip One. The third most populous of the provinces of Oceania. Was it always like this? Always these rotting houses, their windows patched with cardboard, their roofs with corrugated iron, their crazy garden walls sagging in all directions? Was it always? When I was a child... I can't remember. I can't remember. I never can. You turn quickly from the window, and you go to the table in the small alcove where you are cut off from... from being seen by the telescreen. Quickly, you take the secretly bought notebook, the archaic pen point and holder out of the drawer. What you are about to do can mean death. It's not illegal to keep a diary. Nothing is illegal since there are no more laws. But if the thought police find out, it's death. Or at least 25 years in a forced labor camp. You ink the pen, and you falter for just a second. A tremor goes through you. I must start. I must mark the paper. April 4th, 1984. But how do I know? How can I be certain that that is 1984? No, it must be. I'm fairly sure that I'm 39. I believe I was born in 1944 or 45. But it's never possible nowadays to pin down any date within a year or two. But what difference does it make? How can I speak to the future? If it's like the present, no one will listen. If it's different, how will they understand the things happening now? I mustn't think about it. I must begin now. April 4th. Last night to the flicks, all war films, one of a ship full of refugees being bombed somewhere in the Mediterranean. Audience, much amused by a shot of a helicopter firing at a man swimming away. He was full of holes. The sea around him turned pink. Audience shouting with laughter when he sank. And then you saw a lifeboat full of children with a helicopter over it. You write on, wildly ridding your mind of painful memory. But as you write, another memory comes clear in your mind. It happened during the two minutes hate period at the ministry that very morning. After the chant of loyalty to Big Brother, Winston Smith noticed O'Brien, the big man wearing glasses and the black overalls of the powerful inner party. That morning, O'Brien had turned and his eyes had met Winston's. And Winston knew that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. It was as if O'Brien was saying, I am with you. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust. But don't worry. I am on your side. And then O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as everybody else's. But even that was a memorable event in the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Down with Big Brother. Down with Big Brother. I'll fill the page with it or the whole book. Makes no difference now. The thought police will get me just the same. Even if I never put the pen to paper, I have committed thought crime. And for that, they're bound to get you. Sooner or later, but they'll get you. Always during the night, you simply disappear. Your name removed from the registers. Every record of you wiped out. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized. They'll shoot me in the back. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. They always shoot you in the back of the neck. I don't care. Down with Big Brother. Already. You sit still. Maybe they'll go away. The worst thing would be to delay. You get up and you move heavily toward the door. Oh, comrade. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up and... I'll... I'll see what I can do, Mrs. Parsons. I'm sorry to bother you. Of course, it's it's only because Tom isn't home. Amid the clutter of the flat, you notice the banners of the Youth League and the spies on the wall. 
and a full-size poster of Big Brother. Don't mind the looks of the place. It's the children. They haven't been out today. Have you got a spanner? A spanner? I, I don't know. Perhaps the children... Up with your hands! The tough-looking boy springs at you with a pointed toy automatic pistol. He is dressed in the uniform of the spies. Higher! Get them up higher! Is this high enough? You're a traitor! You're a thought criminal! Freddy, please let Mr. Smith fix the sink. He's a traitor or a thought criminal. Oh, he and his sister are disappointed because they couldn't go to the park to see the hanging of the Eurasian war prisoners. Why can't we go? All the other children are going. <sighs> Take you next time. Oh, that won't be for another month. There, Mrs. Parsons, I think that does it. Thank you, comrade. Say thank you, Freddy. I will not. He's a traitor. He's a follower of Goldstein. You go to the window. Down in the street, the wind flaps a torn poster with the word Ingsoc. You stand watching it. The three sacred principles of Ingsoc. New speak, double think, the mutability of the past. What past? The past is dead. The future is unimaginable. I am alone, lost in a monstrous world. What living human creature is on my side? How do I know that the power of the party won't endure forever? Like an answer, the three slogans on the white face of the Ministry of Truth come back to you. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. The telescreen strikes. You have to leave in ten minutes to be back at your work at 14.30. You see the diary on the table. Who am I writing it for? Only the thought police will read it before they wipe it out of existence and out of memory. But there are things I must say or I can't stay sane. You go back to the table, dip your pen, and write. To the future or to the past. To a time when thought is free, when men are different one from another and do not live alone. To a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. From the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of double think. Greetings. I am already dead, for I am committing thought crime, and thought crime is death. You're just the man I was looking for. Well, what can I do for you, Simon? Tell me, have you got any razor blades? Not one. I've been using the same for six weeks. Keep an eye on me. Next, please. Uh, did you go and see the prisoners hanged yesterday? I was working. I'll see it on the flicks, I suppose. A very inadequate substitute. It's a good hanging, Smith. I think it spoils it when they tie their feet together. Next. Oh, there's a table over there, under the telescreen. Let's pick up a gin on the way. Uh. Sime, how's that dictionary of new speak getting on? Slowly. I'm on the adjectives. It's fascinating. I must have quite a job inventing new words. Oh, that's not our chief job at all. We're destroying words. What sense is there in having a whole string of useless, vague words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning. Or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Don't you see the beauty of that, Winston? It was B.B.'s idea originally, of course. Well, I know that's I'm one of Big Brother's most revolutionary ideas. Oh, it's not just words. In the end, we shall make thought crime impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Has it ever occurred to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, not a single human will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we're now having? Oh, except the proletarians, of course. Oh, the proletarians are not human beings. Proles and animals are free. The whole literature of the past would have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll exist only in new speak versions. Then they'll be changed into something different? Well, even the slogans of the party will change. How can you have a slogan like, Freedom is slavery, when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Hello, 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 hello. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, uh, Parsons. Uh, by the way, old boy, I hear a little beggar of mine gave you a rough time yesterday. I think he was a little upset at not going to the execution. <laughs> oh, well... Shows the right spirit, doesn't it? Oh, by the way, do you know what that little girl of mine did last Saturday when her troop was in a hike out Berkhamsted Way? She got two other girls to go with her and spent the whole afternoon following a strange man. And then, when they got to Amersham, handed him over to the patrols. What did they do that for? Ah! Oh, my kid made sure he was some enemy agent. Well, might have been dropped by parachute. Pretty smart for a nipper of seven, eh? <laughs> what happened to the man? Oh, uh, well, uh, that I couldn't say, of course, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was now an unperson. Oh, good. Of course, we can't afford to take chances. Oh, what I mean to say is there's a war on. 
So, uh, I suppose you don't have any razor blades you can let me have? Hmm? Not one. Hmm. Just thought I'd ask you, old boy. I'm uh, sorry. Well, it's back to work, old boy. You sit in your flat, listening to the telescreen voice. The diary is open before you, but you're not writing. Once again, you feel the protest in your stomach, in your skin. The feeling that you've been cheated of something that you had a right to. You try, but you can't remember anything different. You turn to writing in your diary. How can I know what used to be? There is the party slogan. Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. The party can thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened. And this is more terrifying than mere torture and death. The party says, reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It is the final, most essential command. Maybe, maybe I'm a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic is simply a, a minority of one. But the obvious, the silly, the true, has got to be defended. The solid world exists. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall towards the Earth's center. Freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four. If that is granted, all else follows. It's a dangerous thing you're doing now. You've walked for several miles through the proletarian section where the thought police would have many questions to ask if they found you. Now you find yourself inside the junk store where you had bought the diary. I recognized you on the pavement. You're the gentleman that bought the keepsake album. I was passing. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular, Mr. Jarrington. Nah, it's just as well, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. Now, there's another room upstairs that you might care to see. You lived here at one time? Until my wife died. Now, don't you think this is a quiet, cozy room? There's no telescreen. Uh, I never had one of those things. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints... Uh, here, sir. The frame's fixed to the wall, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, Mr. Charrington. It's a ruin now. It's... It's in the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, sir. It was a church at one time. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that? Oh, uh, that was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. A full 60 years ago. How does it go on? I don't remember, but I do know how it ended up. Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It, it was a kind of dance. And when they came to, uh, here comes a chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just the names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. I never knew it had been a church. Oh, there's lots of them left, really. Though they've been put to other uses. How did the rhyme go? Ah, I've got it. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There now. That's as far as I can get. A farthing. That was a small copper coin. Looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's? Mm. That's still standing in Victoria Square. It's the building where they have the models of the rock bonnets and the floating fortresses and, and the pictures of enemy atrocities. St. Martin's in the fields, it used to be called. You leave, Mr. Charrington. You should never have come back here without knowing if the old man could be trusted. You start down the street. You'll come back to buy the engraving of St. Clement's Dane and carry it home, hidden under the jacket of your overalls. And you'll even drag the rest of the poem out of Mr. Charrington's memory. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement. You owe me three farthings, say the... Suddenly, your heart turns to ice. 
A figure in blue overalls is coming toward you. A dark-haired girl in her 20s. The narrow scarlet sash of the junior anti-sex league is wound around her waist. You know her, but you've never spoken to her. She looks straight into your face, and then walks on quickly as though she hadn't seen you. For a few seconds, you're, you're too paralyzed to move. Then you turn and walk heavily away. It's at night they come for you. Always at night. The proper thing is to kill yourself before they get you. And they'll get you. Once you've succumbed to thought crime, you're dead. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you David Niven in a radio version of George Orwell's 1984. And now, our intermission commentator, the distinguished author, Mr. James Hilton. George Orwell is a distinguished English writer who is desperately concerned, as many others of us are today, with the shape of things to come. And he is also aware that such earlier prophecies as those of Mr. Wells and Mr. Aldous Huxley were not so much incorrect as incomplete, and are now in need of restatement and revision before a modern audience. Thus, Mr. Wells forecasts the engulfment of modern civilization in total war. But war, says Mr. Orwell, is not all, nor is it quite the worst imaginable thing. And as long ago as 1932, Mr. Huxley satirized the regimented state in his book called Brave New World. But some people in those days probably missed the satire and thought that with all its mass production techniques and scientific management, Mr. Huxley's new world might even be worth looking forward to. But today, no one is so naive as that. Indeed, the crisis of our civilization is in some danger of becoming a cliché for after-dinner speakers. Mr. Orwell, however, is the first writer to warn us in the form of fictional satire what might conceivably happen if all the worst features that exist anywhere in our modern world were to prevail over all the others, and if, in addition, all these worst features were to spread all over the earth. Since the story is told with nightmarish detail and inexorable logic, the commentator can perhaps serve best by a few mild warnings of his own. First, that despite any easy assumptions that might readily and even excusably occur to both listener and reader, Mr. Orwell's satire does not bear exclusively against any one country. Certain early symptoms of that breakdown of the human soul which he forecasts are diagnosable in all countries today. And most of us also, to a greater or less extent, are already victims of certain types of double-think. And it would be a useful private exercise to examine near home for such instances as well as to recognize them more spectacularly in other parts of the world. Personally, I find Mr. Orwell's picture horrible and timely and fascinating. It will probably take its place among the memorable works of its kind, both for its technical virtuosity and for a sort of intellectual passion that pervades it throughout. Mr. Orwell is, as we say, burned up about the state of the world, but the fuel of that fire is not only in the world, but in his own mind. And this is what makes the satirist at all times and in all ages, and it's why, having read Mr. Orwell's 1984, you may not feel you'd like to meet any of its characters, but you do feel you'd like to meet Mr. Orwell, if only for an argument. Outside of literature, however, it might be said that 1984 suffers from a philosophic flaw inherent in all such prophetic fiction. It does not allow for the fact that history is not an exact science, perhaps not even a science at all, and that any equation of the future is bound to contain many variables. And yet, with all the reservations some of us might make, this book that Mr. Orwell has written deserves our serious attention. It is not a likable story, and one may hope and even believe that it is not a likely story either. But when we think of all that has happened throughout the world during our own lifetimes, it does not seem quite an impossible story. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. It's the middle of the morning, and you've left the work cubicle to go to the lavatory. A solitary figure comes toward you from the other end of the long, brightly lit corridor. It's the girl with the dark hair. Four days ago, you ran into her outside the junk shop. She's about ten feet from you. Oh, are you hurt? It's nothing. My arm, I'll be all right in a second. You haven't broken anything? No, no, I'm all right. It just hurt for a moment, that's all. Here, let me help you up. Thanks. I'll be all right. I only gave my wrist a bit of a bang. Thanks, comrade. She walks off briskly. While you were helping her up, she slipped something into your hand. A scrap of paper folded into a square. 
You will open it when you are away from the telescreens in the corridor and in the lavatory. Whatever's on the paper, it must have some kind of political meaning. She's an agent of the Thought Police. They have reasons for the message. Maybe a threat, a summons, an order to commit suicide, a trap. May... Maybe not that at all. Maybe a note from an underground organization. Perhaps the Brotherhood exists after all. No, absurd. The message means only one thing. Death. Ten minutes later, in your cubicle, you open it. In a large, unformed handwriting... I love you. It's hard to conceal your agitation from the telescreen. I've got to get in touch with her. Arrange a meeting somewhere. But I don't know her name or where she lives. I can't follow her home. That would mean loitering outside the ministry bound to be noticed. There's one place. The canteen. At a table by herself, not too near the telescreen. With a chatter of conversation all around. For only 30 seconds. For only a few words. A week goes by. At last it happens. You both sit eating the watery stew. You continue eating, you don't look up. What time do you leave work? 18.30. Where can we meet? Victory Square, near the monument. Full of telescreens. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd. Any signal? No. Don't come up until you see me among a lot of people. And don't look at me. Just keep somewhere near me. What time? 19 hours. All right. Paddington Station. Take train 14 to Fenchurch. Turn left outside the station and you'll come to a gate with a top bar missing. Go across that field to a track between bushes. Stay on that until you come to a dead tree with moss on it. Can you remember that? Yes. You turn left, then right, then left again, and the gate's got no top bar. Yes, what time? About 15. You may have to wait. I'll get there by another way. Are you sure you remember everything? Yes. Then get away from me as quick as you can. Here we are. I didn't want to say anything in the lane in case there was a mic hidden there. We're all right here, though. I didn't meet any patrols. I watched for them all the way from the station. Oh, we're safe here. What are you grinning at? <laughs> Would you believe that till this moment, I didn't know the color of your eyes. Now that you've seen what I'm really like, can you still bear to look at me? Oh, yes, easily. I'm 39 years old. I've got a wife I can't get rid of. I've got varicose veins and I've got five false teeth. I couldn't care less. <laughs> darling. Oh, darling. Precious. Oh, my dearest, dearest love. We've got the whole afternoon. Isn't this... What's your name? Julia. I know yours. It's Winston. Winston Smith. How did you find that out? (laughs) I expect I'm better at finding out things than you are, dear. Tell me, what did you think of me before that day I gave you the note? I hated the sight of you. I wanted to hurt you, murder you. If you really want to know, I imagine that you had something to do with the thought police. Oh, no. Not the thought police. Well, perhaps not exactly that, but from your general appearance, merely because you're young and fresh and healthy, I thought that probably... You thought I was a good party member. And you also thought that if I had a quarter of a chance, I'd denounce you as a thought criminal and get you killed off. Yes, something of that kind. Well, a great many young girls are like that, you know. It's bloody sash that does it. Wait, I'll rip the thing off. There. Have a piece of chocolate. Where did you get this? Black market. You're very young. Ten years younger than I am. What could attract you in a man like me? As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. Against the party. Against the bloody rotten swine in the inner party. Julia, listen. 
I'm against the purity the party preaches and the goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bones. Well, then, I ought to suit you, dear. I'm corrupt to the very bones. You never go back to the clearing in the wood. You and Julia can meet only in the streets, in a different place every evening, and never for more than a half hour at a time. You don't even discuss the possibility of getting married. No committee would sanction it, even if Catherine could somehow be gotten rid of. It's hopeless, even as a daydream. What was she like, your wife? She was, uh, you know, the news speak word, good, thinkful, meaning naturally orthodox, incapable of thinking of bad thoughts. I know the kind of person right enough. Everything is always our duty to the party. How do you know that? I've been at school too, dear. Why didn't you shove her off the cliff? I would have. Perhaps if I'd been the same person I am now. Are you sorry you didn't? Now, Are you sorry you didn't? Yes. On the whole, I'm sorry I didn't. But it doesn't really matter. In this game we're playing, we can't win. We are the dead. We're not dead yet. Not physically. Six months, a year, five years conceivably. I'm afraid of death. You're young, so you're more afraid of it. We put it off as long as we can, but it makes very little difference. Oh, rubbish. Don't you enjoy being alive? Look, darling. I'm real. I'm solid. Alive. Don't you like that? Yes, I <laughs> like that. Stop talking about dying, then. Where shall we meet next time? Julia, I've rented the room for Mr. Charrington. Sooner or later we'll be caught. I know. It's madness. Yes. Wait for me there. Day after tomorrow. Wait. Just let me show you what I've brought. Look here. Go on. Go on, open it. Sugar. Real, not saccharin. And here, a loaf of white bread. But look, this is the one I'm really proud of. Coffee. <laughs> real coffee. <laughs> There's a whole kilo here. Well, how'd you manage to get hold of all these things? Oh, it's all in a party stuff. And look, I've got a little packet of tea, too. Real tea. Not blackberry leaves. Been a lot of tea about lately. They captured India or something. But listen, dear, I want you to turn your back on me for a bit. And don't turn around till I tell you. You can turn around now. Well? Beautiful. I've never seen a woman of the party with cosmetics on her face. And scent, too. Yes, dear. And scent, too. And do you know what I'm going to do next? I'm going to get hold of a real woman's frock and silk stockings and high heels. Oh, darling, in this room, I'm going to be a woman, not a party comrade, a woman. I'll make some coffee in another moment. We've still got an hour. What time do they cut the lights off at your flats? 23, 30. It's 23 at the hostel. Hi! Get out of there, you filthy brute! What was it? A rat. I saw his beastly nose. Oh, there's a hole down there. Rats? In this room? Ah, oh, they're all over. Some parts of London are just swarming with them. A woman daren't leave a baby alone for two minutes. It's the great huge brown ones that do it, and the brutes always Don't come Don't go on! Darling, what's the matter? Oh, of all the horrors in the world, a rat! Oh, no, darling, no. Now, don't worry. We're not going to have the filthy brutes in here. I'll stuff the hole before we go. Oh, come on. Help me make the coffee. Darling, I've been meaning to ask you. That picture over there on the wall, would that be about 100 years old? More. 200, I dare say. One can't tell. It's impossible to discover the age of anything nowadays. What is that place? I've seen it before somewhere. It's a church, or at least it used to be. St. Clement's Dane, its name was. Oranges and lemons, oh. say the bells of St. Clement's. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. Oh, I can't remember how it goes after that. 
But anyway, I remember it ends up, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Who taught you that? <laughs> My grandfather. He was vaporized when I was eight. I wonder what a lemon was. Oh, I can remember lemons. They were quite common in the 50s. They were so sour, it would set your teeth on edge even to smell them. <laughs> oh, dear. I suppose it's almost time we were leaving. I should start washing this paint off. I'll get the lipstick off your face afterwards. It happens at last. The expected message comes. We're walking down the long corridor of the ministry. <clears throat> you turn around. It's O'Brien. I was reading one of your Newspeak articles the other day. You take a scholarly interest in Newspeak, I believe. Well, hardly scholarly. I'm only an amateur. I never had anything to do with the construction of the language. But you write it very elegantly. Have you seen the 10th edition of the Newspeak Dictionary? No, I didn't think it had been issued yet. A few advanced copies have been circulated. I have one myself. It might interest you to uh, look at it, perhaps. Yes, very much so. Some of the new developments are most ingenious. Let me see. Uh, perhaps you could pick it up uh, at my flat sometime that suited you. Uh, wait. Let me give you my address. Julia, darling, it was like a message. As if O'Brien was saying, if you ever want to see me, this is where I can be found. But he's an important member of the Inner Party, dear. If it's a trap... Darling, this is part of something that happened years ago. First... It was a secret, involuntary thought. Then I started a diary. I'd moved from thoughts to words. And now, from words to action. Where will it end? In the Ministry of Love. I've accepted that. The end was contained in the beginning. Has it ever occurred to you that the best thing for us to do would be simply to walk out of here before it's too late and never see each other again? Yes, dear. It's occurred to me several times. But I'm not going to do it all the same. We've been lucky. It can't last much longer. What you do, I'm going to do. We may be together for another six months, a year. There's no knowing. At the end, we're certain to be apart. Do you realize how utterly alone we shall be? When once they get hold of us, there's nothing. Nothing either of us can do for the other. If I confess, they'll shoot you. If I don't, they'll shoot you just the same. Neither of us will even know whether the other is alive or dead. The one thing that matters is that we shouldn't betray one another. Although... Even that can't make the slightest difference. Everybody always confesses. You can't help it. They torture you. Oh, I don't mean confessing. Confession is not betrayal. What you say or do doesn't matter. Only feelings matter. If they could mean you, that would be the real betrayal. They can't do that. They can make you say anything, anything. But they can't make you believe it. They can't get inside of you. No, that's quite true. They can't get inside you. If you can feel that staying human is worthwhile, even when it can't have any result whatever, then you've beaten them. Darling, whenever it is you go to O'Brien, I'm going with you. Just a moment. You can turn it off. Yes, Winston. We have that privilege. Well, uh, shall I say it, or will you? I'll say it. That thing is really turned off? Yes. Everything is turned off. We are alone. All right. We have come here because we believe that there is some kind of secret conspiracy, some kind of secret organization working against the party and that you are involved in it. We want to join it and work for it. We are enemies of the party. We disbelieve in the principles of Ingsoc. We are thought criminals... We are also adulterers. I tell you this because we want to put ourselves at your mercy. Yes. First, let us all take a drink. I think it's fitting that we should begin by drinking a health. To our leader. To Emmanuel Goldstein. Then there is such a person as Goldstein. Yes, and he's alive. Where, well, I don't know. And the conspiracy, the organization, it is real? It's not simply an invention of the thought police? No, it's real. Brotherhood, we call it. You'll never know much more about it than that it exists and that you belong to it. I'll come back to that presently. Out of the matter. What are you prepared to do? 
Anything we are capable of. You are prepared to give your lives? Yes. To commit murder? Yes. To commit acts of sabotage which may cost the deaths of hundreds of innocent people? Yes. To cheat, to forge, to blackmail, to corrupt the minds of children, to distribute habit-forming drugs, to do anything which is likely to weaken the power of the party? Yes. You are prepared to commit suicide if and when we order it? Yes. You are prepared, the two of you, to separate and never see one another again? No. No. You did well to tell me. You understand that you'll be fighting in the dark. Later, I shall send you a book from which you will learn the true nature of the society we live in and the strategy by which we shall destroy it. Without hope, we are the dead. Our only true life is in the future. Do you carry a briefcase to work? As a rule, yes. What is it like? Oh, black, very shabby, two straps. Good. One day soon in the street, a man will touch you on the arm and say, I think you've dropped your briefcase. The one he gives you will contain a copy of Goldstein's book. You'll return it within 14 days. Mm, uh, you must leave in a couple of minutes. We shall meet again, if we do meet again. In the place where there is no darkness? In the place where there is no darkness. In the meantime, is there anything you wish to say before you leave? Any question? Yes. Did you ever hear an old rhyme that begins, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement. Yes, Winston. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I get rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. You knew the last line. Yes, I knew the last line. And now I'm afraid it's time for you to go. Julia, I've got the book. We must read it. You two, all members of the Brotherhood, have to read it. You read it aloud. That's the best way. Then you can explain it to me as you go. The new movements which appeared in the middle years of the century, Ingsoc in Oceania, Neo-Bolshevism in Eurasia, death, worship in East Asia, had the conscious aim of perpetuating unfreedom and inequality. The new movements grew out of the old ones. And then... Even the names of the four ministries exhibit an impotence in their deliberate reversal of the facts. The Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war. The Ministry of Truth, with lies. The Ministry of Love, with torture. The Ministry of Plenty, with starvation. These contradictions are not accidental. They are deliberate exercises in double-think. For it is only by reconciling contradictions that power... Oh, that's the Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, darling, the stove's gone out. And there's no oil. Oh, we can get some from old Charrington, I expect. Oh, gosh, but it's cold in here. Do you remember the thrush that sang to us that first day mm -hmm. at the edge of the wood? He wasn't singing to us. He was just singing. No, not to us. We are the dead. We are the dead. You are the dead! <laughs> you are the dead! It was behind the picture. It was behind the picture. Remain exactly where you are. Make no movement until you are ordered. Now we can see you. Now we can see you. Stand out in the middle of the room. Stand back to back. Clasp your hands behind your head. Do not touch one another. The house is surrounded. I suppose that we may as well say goodbye. You may as well say goodbye. And by the way, while we are on the subject, here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. You don't know where you are. The windowless cell with white porcelain walls might be in the Ministry of Love. Concealed lamps flooded with a cold light. There's a low, steady humming sound. It is the place where there is no darkness. Smith! 6079, Smith W. Hands out of the pocket in the cell. There is a telescreen on each wall. You started to reach into your overalls for stray breadcrumbs. You haven't eaten since you were arrested. 
Ampleforth. Smith. You too? What are you in for? There is only one offense, is there not? Crime thought. And you have committed it? Apparently. We were producing a definitive edition of Kipling. I allowed the word God to remain at the end of a line. I couldn't help it. The rhyme was Rod. There are only 12 rhymes to Rod in the language. There was no other rhyme. Do you know what time it is? No, I don't. There's no difference between night and day in this place. Don't talk in the cells. Ample forth, room 101. Time passes. Your hunger grows. Prisoners, men and women, are brought into your cell and are taken out. To room 101. Then the cell door opens once again. O'Brien and a guard come in. You start to your feet. You forget the telescreen. They got you too. They got me a long time ago. You knew this, Winston. You've always known it. Guard? Oh! Oh! With that blow, the nightmare starts, and you confess to anything and everything. The confessions are a formality. The torture is real. And it goes on and on and on and on. Now you're lying strapped to a table. You can't move. There's a strong light falling in your face. O'Brien is standing at your side. On the other side, a man in a white coat holding a hypodermic syringe. I told you that we met here again. Yes, would Oh! That's only a sample of what I can do by turning this dial. Remember that. If you lie to me, you will cry out of pain instantly. Do you understand that? Yes. I'm taking trouble with you, Winston, because you are worth trouble. You suffer from a defective memory. Fortunately, it is curable. There's a party slogan dealing with the control of the past. Repeat it, if you please. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Good. Is it your opinion, Winston, that the past has any real existence? No. Then where does the past exist, if at all? In records, it's written down in the mind, in human memories. But we, the party, control all records, and we control all memories. Then we control the past, do we not? But how can you stop people remembering things? How can you control memory? You've not controlled mine. On the contrary, you have not controlled it. That is what has brought you here. Do you remember writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four? How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it's not four, but five, then how many? Four. Four. How many fingers, Winston? Four! How many fingers, Winston? Four! Four! What else can I say? Four! How many fingers, Winston? Four! Stop it! Stop it! Four! Four! How many fingers, Winston? Five. 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 You're lying. You still think there are four. How many, please? Four! Five! Four! Anything you like! Stop it! Stop the pain! Stop! <laughs> You're a slow learner, Winston. How can I help it? How can I help seeing what's in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston. Sometimes they are five or three or all of them at once. You must try harder. It's not easy to become sane. It's not easy. It goes on endlessly. The questions, the drugs, the questions, the torture machines. Endlessly. Do you know where you are, Winston? I don't know. I can guess. In the Ministry of Love. Do you know how long you've been here? I don't know. I think it's months. And why do you imagine we bring people to this place? To make them confess? No. That's not the reason. Try again. To punish them? No. To cure you. To make you sane. The party is not interested in the overt act. The thought is all we care about. We do not merely destroy our enemies. We change them. 
What happens to you here is forever. Even if we choose to let you live out the natural term of your life, you can never escape from us. Holton, set the machine for 2,000. Yes, comrade. This time it won't hurt you, Winston. Keep your eyes fixed on mine. Now, how many fingers am I holding? Five. Do you see five? Yes. You see now uh, that it's at any rate possible. Yes. Before we bring the session to an end, you can ask me a few questions if you choose. The machine is switched off. What is your first question? What have you done with Julia? She betrayed you, Winston. All her rebelliousness, her deceit, her folly, her dirty-mindedness. Everything has been burnt out of her. It was a perfect conversion. You tortured her? Next question. Does Big Brother exist? Of course he exists. The party exists. Big Brother is the embodiment of the party. Will Big Brother ever die? Of course not. How could he die? Next question. What is in room 101? You know that, Winston. Everyone knows what's in room 101. Holton, the hypodermic. We have beaten you, Winston. We have broken you. Can you think of any single degradation that has not happened to you? I have not betrayed Julia. No. That is perfectly true. You have not betrayed Julia. Tell me, how soon will they shoot me? It might be a long time. You're a difficult case. But don't give up hope. Everyone is cured sooner or later. In the end, we shall shoot you. You're much better now. Weeks or months have passed. But you have no way of knowing. And one day, O'Brien is in your cell. And with him are the guards. Get up, Winston. Come here. You've had thoughts of deceiving me. Stand up straighter. Look me in the face. Tell me, Winston. And remember, no lies. Tell me, what are your true feelings toward Big Brother? I hate him. You hate him? Good. Then the time has come for you to take the last step. You must love Big Brother. It is not enough to obey him. You must love him. Guard, take him... Room 101. You're strapped upright in a chair, so tightly that you can move nothing, not even your head. There are two small tables in front of you, and for a moment you're alone. Then O'Brien comes in. Winston, you asked me once what was in room 101. Everyone knows the answer. The thing that is in room 101 is the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world varies from individual to individual. It may be death by fire, by drowning, by impalement, or 50 other deaths. In your case, it happens to be rats. Here. I place the cage on the table so you can see them. Well, you, you can't do that. You couldn't. It's impossible, O'Brien. You, you know this isn't necessary. What do you want me to do? For everyone, there is something unendurable. Courage and cowardice are not involved. For you, the unendurable is rats. They're a form of pressure you cannot withstand. You will do what is required of you. But what is it? What is it? How can I do it if I don't know what it is? No, don't bring them any closer! You only understand the construction of this cage. This mask will fit over your head, leaving no other exit. When I press this lever... These starving brutes will leap at your face. Sometimes they attack the eyes. No, no, don't, don't put them across the No, no, no. Do it to Julia. Do it to Julia, not to me. I don't care what you do to her. Tell her face off. Strip of the bones. Not me, Julia. Not me. the lonely hour of 15. Café is almost empty. You sit at your usual place, drinking victory gin and studying the chess problems and the times. Nobody pays any attention to you. 
You've even seen Julia again. There was no danger in it. On a cold, biting March day, you had come across her in the park. I betrayed you. I betrayed you. Sometimes they threaten you with something. Something you can't even think about. Then you don't care. You want it to happen to the other person. And that's what you keep shouting. All you care about is yourself. All you care about is yourself. You don't feel the same toward the other person any longer. No, you don't feel the same. What happens to you there is forever. Something is burned out. We must meet again. Yes, we must meet again. Now in the dust on the cafe table, your finger traces unconsciously. Two plus two equals five. And on the wall, Big Brother gazes down at you from a poster. You gaze up at the enormous face. Forty years it has taken you to learn what kind of smile is hidden beneath the dark moustache. Oh, cruel, needless misunderstanding. Oh, stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast. (laughs) Two gin-soaked tears trickle down the sides of your nose. It's all right. Everything is all right. The struggle is finished. You have won the victory over yourself. I... I love you, big brother. have been listening to 1984, an NBC University Theater production of the novel by George Orwell, starring David Niven. This is the BBC Home Service and the British Forces Broadcasting Service. Saturday Night Theatre. We present David March, Rona Anderson and Gudrun Yor in Shadow of Murder, adapted from her novel by Charity Blackstock. Shadow of Murder. daughter how nice it would be to have someone to talk to, wasn't that, Keith? Yes. Oh, I assure you, I wouldn't dream of disturbing you. I expect there are empty cats. There's a corner seat for you. I shall be getting off at Balahoonish. Ah, you'll be staying at the station hotel, then. I know. The past the Glencoe and the police assistance. Oh, damn. You'll have to dry your paper out before you can read it. Oh, I see. Do you mind if I smoke? Of course not. Uh, perhaps uh, your daughter... Oh, would... no, no, thank oh, you. Kate never smokes, do you, darling? Such a dangerous habit. Besides, I think it's a wee bit unfeminine. 
So you're staying as the three sisters. That means we are practically neighbours. I'm Mrs. Stewart of Etty Farm, and this is my bad little daughter, Kate. She looks such a cross patch, but I think she's rather nice, though maybe I'm prejudiced. Oh, it's going to be marvellous having you so near. You must, of course, come to see us, Mr... Mr... Such a bleak place you've chosen for your holiday. But Mrs. Forbes is a nice little buddy, and I'm sure she'll do her best for you. There are only two other guests at the moment. You will be an artist, of course. Uh, no. If you insist on knowing, I'm a writer. Oh, but how thrilling. Kate, do you hear that? Yes, Mummy. Oh, she's such a reader, you know. Are you writing about the massacre? Oh, Mummy, you should... Uh, no, I'm not writing anything. I have just divorced my wife, Miss Stewart. I've heard, if it interests you, one hell of a time. And the reason I've chosen so bleak a place is that I don't want to see anyone or talk to anyone. Oh, you poor man. In that case, Mr... Oh, I'm afraid I didn't quite catch your name. I didn't give it to you. Shawfield's the name. John Shawfield. Oh. Why, of course I remember now. You were married to Sylvia Court, the actress. It was in the papers, wasn't it? It was. Well, we'll just have to try and cheer you up, won't we, Katie? Well, you've been very quiet, darling. Oh, she never talks much, Mr. Shawfield, but I know she's as sorry for you as I am. Oh, Mummy, really? It's all right, Miss Stewart. I don't need anyone's pity. That's probably just as well, Mr. Shawfield. Now, what? I understand exactly how you feel. You see, I was divorced, too. Oh, such terrible tricks life plays in one. And Sylvia Court's the loveliest girl. I adored her last film. No one could deny her she was a good actress. Now, we're not going to let you brood. The past is so isolated. But I'm sure the McDonald boy will be only too delighted to meet a fellow scribe. Uh, who's McDonald? Oh, he's at the hotel too, the dearest boy. He's doing a book on the massacre, getting the local colour. He says he wants it to soak in. <laughs> that should be easy enough in this climate. <laughs> his ancestor was in it, you know. Alexander MacDonald of Achtriochen, who was carried to the hills by his nurse in that terrible night. Young Ian is his descendant. Oh, he's a fanatical Jacobite. Though actually, he's lived all his life in the South. You said your name was Shawfield. I did. Oh, I should have recognized it, of course. Campbell of Shawfield. Oh, young MacDonald will have his knife into you, you know. I assure you, my name... The word is... Kruachan will naturally be familiar to you. Why on earth should it be? It's the Campbell battle cry. It's a word that has the bitterest significance in Glen Cove. <laughs> I'm afraid I fail to see why this is amusing. Oh, Mummy, he can't help his name. Thank you, Kate. I'm quite capable of seeing that for myself. Well, I'm not blaming you, Mr. Shawfield. There are good Campbells as well as bad. Well, that's fair enough. Uh, who, by the way, is my other fellow guest? You did say there were two of them. Oh, Mr. Curtis. Such a dear wee man. Uh, is he a clansman, too? Oh, dear me, no. He's very English. A retired bank manager. I believe he's had a nervous breakdown and is here on doctor's orders. Oh, he's very quiet. Only goes out occasionally for a wee spin in his car. He's so devoted to Huey, it's quite touching. So devoted to Huey? Oh, yes. He even buys apples for him. Huey is a horse, Mr. Shawfield. Oh, a, a Jacobite horse, I presume. Oh, that's just silly. <laughs> no sillier than the rest of it. Oh, Huey's a darling. Mrs. Forbes adores him. We call him the Lord Provost of Glencoe. Well, now, we've told him everything, haven't we, Kate? I do hope you'll not be bored with us, Mr. Shawfield. I don't see how I could possibly be. Well, if you are, you must come and see us. But don't walk alone in the pass at night, will you? Not with that murderer around. Murderer? What murderer? Oh, Mummy, please do. Oh, don't be so silly, darling. You're not a baby. Of course Mr. Shawfield must be told about it. Didn't you read about that dreadful man who killed his wife and buried her under the floorboard? Oh, now you come to mention it, I did. We shared headlines, as it were. But I had no idea we were also sharing a holiday. It was really shocking. Of course, Kate is so sensitive. She takes after me and I don't want to frighten her, but... He cut her up into little bits, Mr. Shawfield, and they seemed such a devoted couple. Nobody knew about it at first. He said she'd gone away to stay with her sister, and then he went away himself, but of course... Well, I mean, he put disinfectant down, but anyway, they dug her up in pieces. In tiny pieces, Mr. Shawfield. Can you imagine it? Yes, better than you might credit. The things people do. And the police think he's somewhere around here. The local people are convinced he's actually hiding in Ossian's cave on the cliffs of Hanukdu. <laughs> Though how he could ever climb up there. We're all so scared we might suddenly meet him. He cut her up into little bits. His own wife. What gets into people, Mr. Shawfield, that they do such awful things? Uh, perhaps you can only take so much for so long. It might happen to any of us, Mrs. Stewart. It might so easily have happened to me. To you? 
You're not a murderer. Well, aren't we all? <laughs> but you've no need to be afraid of him. His state is far worse than yours could ever be. If you met him, he'd do the running away. I'm oh, sure he... we're here. There's a halt here and we can get a lift the whole way home. Oh, if you'd just help me down with my baggage. Oh, yes, sir, of course. That's it, thank one. you. Oh, goodbye, uh, Mr. Campbell. We'll be seeing each other very soon and then you can tell me all about your book. Oh, Kate, hold this for goodness yes, sake. You know they don't stop here for more than a minute. Mummy, his name is not... Don't forget to call on us. Goodbye just now. Will you be Mr. Shawfield? That's correct. Uh, the car's here for you, sir, from the Three Sisters. I'll be taking you up the path. How far's the hotel now? Oh, it'll be half a mile. Uh, a mile, perhaps. Then stop, please. I'm going to walk it. Walk? It's a terrible night. Well, never mind. It suits my mood. But uh, you'd better take my case on for me. It'd be easier if I took you on as well. Mistress Forbes will think it's strange if I arrive without you. Look, surely there's no law against my walking if I want to. <laughs> Do you think the murderer will get me? They say he's a little man and I'm six foot odd. Ah, uh, I expect he's asleep now anyway. Tucked up cosily in Ossian's cave. Poor devil. I hope he's got a hot water bottle. I don't know what Mistress Forbes will say. After all, I was supposed to fetch you, and she'll not be too pleased to think I've left you in the middle of the pass. It seems daft to me. Are you sure you'll not change your mind, sir? No, I need to stretch my legs and breathe a little honest-to-God fresh air. Uh, tell Mrs. Forbes I won't be long. I'll be as hungry as a hunter and needing a nice stiff drink. Ah, I'll be on my way, then. What a night for a massacre. What the devil's that? Who's there? Are you by any chance a Campbell? Kruachan! Oh, why? It's... it's Huey! <laughs> oh, my boy, Huey! <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm afraid I'm nothing for you, old boy. Hey, leave my raincoat alone, will you, you fat clot? You're bulging it up without my buttons. <laughs> oh, off you go, friend. It's too damn cold to stay gossiping here. And I haven't got as much flesh on me as you have. Next time, Huey, I'll have an apple for you. Good night, old boy. I've no doubt we'll be seeing a lot of each other. Oh, hello, Mrs. Forbes. Oh, I there you are. hope I haven't kept you waiting. It's a brute of a night. Oh, that dinner smells good. Well, I've kept it hot for you, Mr. Shoffman. Uh. Oh, this is one of your fellow guests, Mr. Custard. How'd you do? Pleased to meet you. And this mm -hmm. is Mr. MacDonald. How do you do? Uh, well, there are just the three of you. We are never full in the winter. Now, would you like a drink? Oh, very much indeed. Yeah. Large whiskey, please. Uh, perhaps you two gentlemen care to join me. Oh, that's most kind. I don't usually indulge just after the meal, but a small port would be very enjoyable. Good. And you, sir? I haven't got the money to drink. I understand you write books, too. How does she do it? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Forbes. I need that. Cheers. Yes, Mr. MacDonald, I, uh, I write books, too. I gather you're writing on the massacre. It's only fair to tell you my book has been commissioned and is due to come out soon. You've no need to worry. I'm no more interested in massacres than I am in murderers. I'm here for a rest. Not interested. But, of course, you would say that with your ancestry. <clears throat> Such a nice port. I do like a sweet port. You're very good health, Mr. Shawfield. Shawfield. As you say, Shawfield. Cheers, Mr. Curtis. You. Are you sure you won't drink, Mr. MacDonald? I do not drink with Campbell's. Oh, one should drink with everyone, even if one dirks them afterwards. Well, I gather my dinner's ready, and after that I'm going straight to bed. Ah. Should I perhaps say good night to the murderer? Why do you say that? Well, isn't the poor beggar supposed to be hiding out there? I don't envy him. I think I'd rather be in prison. Do we have to endure this gale? We'll all get our death of cold. There are worse deaths. And it's he who's cold. Fancy lying out there with a ghost of a disintegrated wife. No, oh, do please shut that window. My chest oh, is I'm not... sorry, a... Mr. Curtis. I'm a selfish devil. There are no ghosts. Only the old mate Hewitt patrolling the old military road. 
There. Well, I'll be off to my dinner now. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. Good morning. Oh, I uh, see where to sit at the same table. I think Mrs. Forbes felt it was a bit silly to sit at different corners of the room, as there are just three of us. Uh, may I pass you the condiments? Oh, my God! Do you have to use that word? You'll be crooking your little finger next. I fear I do not have the advantages of your education, Mr. MacDonald. I'm sorry if my way of expressing myself displeases you. I'm afraid Mr. MacDonald's education doesn't extend to his manners. Pay no attention, Mr. Curtis, and uh, I should like the condiments very much. This angry young man simply showing off. I'm not staying here to be insulted. Well, well. So silly to sit at different corners of the room. Or is it? Oh, dear me. Dear me. I'm afraid we'll have to ask his parents to remove that boy. We've had a lot of this. Well, he, he's an artist, of course. I believe all artists are a little nervous. No, forgive me, but that's just baloney. Why do you put up with it? I endeavor not to judge my fellow men. Only I do think animals are more agreeable than humans. Uh, by the way, Mr... Uh, uh, Shawfield. Of course. My memory. I was just going to say that you can always use my car when you need it. You need never hesitate to ask. Oh, how kind of you. I'll probably take advantage of that one day. Well, you're very welcome. I always say it would be a sad world if we didn't help each other. Yes, I suppose it would. I gather you're a great friend of Huey's. Oh, we're the greatest, greatest friends. Such a human animal. And I fear he's a little greedy. The local farmers have to lock their guests against him at night. Unfortunately, once Mrs. Stewart, she owns the Etty farm near Dalnes. I know. A very sweet lady. She, she locked her gates once, only she made a mistake. She didn't lock Huey out, she locked him in. Oh. And he ate a whole sack of oats. Oh, good heavens. But it was serious, you see, because if he'd drunk water after that, he'd have burst. <laughs> oh, it wasn't funny, I assure you. Fortunately, the dear old chap couldn't find anything to drink. Oh. Well, well, why does Mrs. Forbes let him wander about like that? Oh, he likes his freedom. You know, Mr. Shawfield, I sometimes wonder if the soul of the MacDonald chieftain, McEarn, inhabits dear Huey's body. <laughs> Certainly plenty of room. Well, when one watches him walking the pass night after night, one really gets the impression he's still brooding on the massacre. If one only knew the sorts in his wise old head. Oh, apples, biscuits, oats, I should imagine. Oh, no. No, 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 you don't understand. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make fun of him. Well, I, I, I think I'll take my little constitutional. I, I've not been very well, you know. I've not been well at all. Well, it's bitterly cold out. And I need fresh air. I, I don't like being cooped up. Hmm. Oh, I wonder if this coffee is still hot. Oh, yes. Oh, was that Mr. Curtis going out? Yes, he's braver than I am. <laughs> I'm just going to sit by your lovely fire. <laughs> I see old Huey's just outside. I bet he'd come in here if you gave him half a chance. Oh, him. He'll stay there in the hopes of an apple. <laughs> Mr. Curtis always feeds him, so he's come to expect it. Well, Kate feeds him, too, when she's over. Kate Stewart, you know, from Etty's farm. Oh, but of course you met her mother on the train. I did, indeed. Oh, well, she's a bit of a talker, but the lassie's a nice wee thing. Though I do wish she wasn't so much under her mother's thumb... Uh, Mrs. Stewart was a great beauty in her day, you know, and poor Katie gets depressed because she thinks she's so plain. Oh, she's got magnificent red hair. Ah, uh, if she'd only do it properly. Uh, she's a capable lassie, anyway. It's a pity she's not in charge of the farm. I'm afraid they'll end by being evicted. Uh -huh. They never got the hay in at all last year, and three of their cattle starved to death. Uh. Mr. Curtis was very upset about it. Ah, but I mustn't stand here blethering. You'll be wanting to get on with your book. Oh, what is the subject, or shouldn't I ask? Oh, I uh, just uh, write novels. Oh, I do so like a good tale. I must read one of them. Oh, if you want something to read, there are some magazines and papers over there. And perhaps Mr. MacDonald would lend you something. He's a good boy, but very highly strung. Mm. He lets the massacre prey on his mind, as if it wasn't bad enough to have this terrible murderer so near us. Of course, I bolt the doors and windows every night. I think you'd better be careful you don't lock him in by mistake, <laughs> like Huey and the Oats. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Don't say things like that, Mr. Shawfield. 
this isn't really important, but has it struck you that one of us almost certainly has met the murderer? Hmm? What do you mean? Our friend outside, Huey. Aye. Well, I must get on with my work. <laughs> Old hopeful, aren't you, Huey? And I've still nothing for you. What's the murderer like? Did he ever tell you why he murdered? <laughs> so that's your considerable big visit. But I'll tell you something you don't know. I nearly killed my own wife once. Only somehow they didn't quite make it. But he did, Lionel Merritt. That's his name. Married to Violet Merritt. They seemed a happy couple. They even had a cat. But no children. We had no children either. Sylvia. Wood. Oh, am I boring you, Huey? This isn't really the stuff for a nice, respectable horse. You go for your walk. I think I'll do the same. I'm glad I've caught you. I want to apologize. Apologize for what? To think that I tried to shut the poor creature up. What on earth are you talking about? Tell me, how are you describing him? Who? The little man from Surbiton. <laughs> oh, I can just see it. And to think that I, a fellow writer, did my best to spoil it for you. What a good thing Mrs. Forbes told me you write novels. I don't know if I'm following all this, but I gather I'm supposed to be putting Mr. Curtis in a book. <laughs> Pass the condiments. Marvellous, marvellous. You seem to think my manners are worse than your own. Huh? Do you imagine I pull the strings to make a person dance for me? How dare you. You better get back to your thieving Highland Reavers. Though God knows they'd probably chuck you into Loch Etty for the lousy little Sutherland that you are. I'm a Scotch! Uh, where were your cradles, Sandy? In the corridors of the Charing Cross Road? Of course, with your name, you don't dare believe I'm descended from MacDonald of Artrioch. The only pity is you ever descended at all. Oh, I'm going out for a walk. And I warn you, if you make fun of Mr. Curtis again, I'll throw the condiments in your face. Hey, who's chucking away perfectly good apples? Why, it's Miss Stewart. Hello there. You're a long way from home, aren't you? Oh, hello, Mr. Shawfield. I was on my way to Tyndrum. Nice to see you again, Tibby Fowler. Well, the Tibby Fowler was rich. That's why the men came after her. We haven't got any money at all. We're going to be evicted. Oh, in that case, it seems a pity to waste good apples. Let me pick them up for you. <laughs> Mrs. Forbes promised me these. I biked up you with a message for her, then oh, I dropped my bag. I see. Well, I suppose I'd better be getting along. Oh, why? I should be glad to talk to a civilized person. Since I've been here, nobody mentions anything but murder and the devil. Oh, when I was a little girl, I had to read the Bible to my grandfather, and he'd never allow me to mention the devil. Huh. So I had to read out things like the world, the flesh, and the word I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> I should imagine there are a great many words that you're not supposed to say. <laughs> well, I don't know why you should think that. Uh, uh, why don't you sit down? Oh, is it too cold? Uh, we could go back to the hotel, if you'd rather, and have a drink. Oh, no, no. Why not? Well, Mummy wouldn't like it. Oh, I hadn't realised I was making an immoral proposition. Well, in Scotland, ladies don't go into public houses. Of course, it's different in your part of the world. Ladies there can go wherever they like. They... So you too read your papers. Well, I... I must be getting along. <laughs> Mummy... I should never have come here. So you've read all about me, Miss Stewart. It must have greatly improved your knowledge of all the words you're not supposed to say. Why are you talking to me like this? Well, of course, I read the papers. And, of course, I recognised you. <laughs> you were front-page news, and you're very good-looking. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to be impertinent. When you see, well, I, I'd read all your books, and I liked them. And they're not the kind to go with all that sort of beastliness. <sighs> your last one was wonderful. Oh, wouldn't you like an autograph copy, as straight as it were from Gehenna? Oh, no, thank you. I get them from the library, where you don't want to go squandering your royalties and me. Good heavens. And besides, you're so angry with me. I, oh, I'm afraid I'm a clumsy person. I biked out specially to meet you. You know, before my mummy arrived. I 
dropped the apples on purpose. I expect you were finding this funny. You could put it into a book sometime. Would you, uh, like a cigarette, Kate? No. Well, why not? After all, Mummy can't smell it from here. Oh, come on. Let me light it for you. I'm sorry I jumped down your throat like that. Of course you've read the newspapers. And I'm an odd face and an odd name, too. It's a Campbell name. So everybody makes a point of telling me. Oh, never mind. What about our contemporary murderer? What's the latest news? Oh, he shot you off the front pages, Mr. Shortland. <laughs> you impertinent baggage. If you're going to be so cheeky, you better call me John. Or even, as my friends do, Johnny. I'm beginning to feel pushed into the elderly gentleman class. Of course. John. It comes easier after the first ten years. Uh, so our murderer has replaced me, has he? Oh, Mr. Shawfield. Uh, uh, John, the poor creature. They're so certain he's here. Do you think he can really be hiding in these hills? God help him if he is. Oh, to be on the run like that. I don't know how he can endure it. The Pass of Glencoe is no place for a lonely, frightened man. Girl, I think you'd better come and have that drink with me. But what sort of a person can he be? A person like you and me, neither better nor worse, Kate. The human mind is like metal, you know. There's always a breaking point. Some of us murder, some of us mop and mow, some of us simply go to the devil. He chopped his wife up. That's just how it took him. You're being awfully nasty. Ah, only because I'm afraid. Nothing makes people nastier. That's why I was so rude to you just now. Oh, well, let's walk back. We'll freeze if we don't. I'll wheel your bike for you. Oh, oh and you better give me your bag, too. I can't have you dropping it again. Oh, I can Oh, don't be silly. I wanted to talk to you, too. Why don't you have lunch with me? Well, there's nothing even John Knox could say against that. You'll be superbly chaperoned with Mr. Curtis passing the condiments on one side and Mr. MacDonald having a tantrum on the other. Oh, I can't. How cold it is. I'm sure it's going to snow. Why can't you? Mummy expects me to be back at the farm. Well, can't you ring somebody? Oh, there's no telephone around here. Mrs. Forbes has been trying to get one for ages. Oh, but it's so difficult to lay down the wires or whatever it is one does. Oh, that must be awkward when it snows. Oh, if it snows, you probably won't get out at all. Oh, very jolly. What does one do about food? I hope we don't have to add an outbreak of cannibalism to everything else. You really have a horrid mind. Oh, don't worry. Mrs. Forbes talks up for emergencies. There'd be plenty to drink anyway. Well, that's all right, then. So you're definitely not lunching with me? <laughs> no. You know, you're... How old are you? I'm, uh, 25. What, do you think your mother has the right to run your life for you? I'm not, after all... Forgive my crudity, suggesting we go to bed together. All I want is for you to share with me the midday roast and two veg. Well, you're only asking me out of kindness. Oh. I hate people being kind to me. Oh, if you're going to talk like that, I've nothing more to say to you. Go back to Mummy, Kate, and tell her from me she's made a shocking mess of your upbringing. She was so lovely when she was young. Was she? I was engaged once. Congratulations. I brought him home. <laughs> There is an old song now, isn't there? Now I have to call him father. You mean to say she married him? Oh, no, no. But he fell in love with her. And that was that. Oh, there are other kinds of murder, you know, Mr. Shawfield, than chopping people up. <laughs> oh, I simply can't call you John. I don't know why. And Mummy will be calling you by your first name in five minutes. Oh, call me what you like. There's the hotel. You might remember, Kate, that Mummy isn't as young as she was and that young men with Oedipus complexes don't make the best husbands. So I'll be meeting your mother again soon, will I? Yes. And she'll be turning on all her charm for me. <laughs> uh, before I go in, just tell me this. Has she read all my books? Uh, well, then. Um... She borrowed them from the librarian last night. She was busy on them the whole evening. <laughs> Do you know, I think there's hope for you yet, Kate. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting your mother again. And I don't mean that quite as you may imagine.
Oh, there's Mrs. Stewart asking for you, Mr. Shawfield. Oh. I did say you were all at dinner, but... Uh... Oh, I'm disturbing you, and Mr. Kurt is just about to carve to you, isn't it a shame? Katie said you'd be eating, didn't you, Kate, and I just didn't listen. Now, you're just to go on eating, you poor hungry creatures, as if I wasn't here. I'll be away in a minute. I want a wee word with Mr. Shawfield. Oh, no. Sure, we're all delighted to see you. We hadn't really started. Uh, do sit down. Oh, the hell, there's the pepper. <laughs> Confound it. Hello, Kate. <laughs> Damn. Uh, you see, Mrs. Stewart, the effect you have on us all. <laughs> Hello, Kate. Hello, Mr. Schofield. Oh, so we're back in square one, are we? I don't know what you mean. I just came to ask you to tea tomorrow afternoon, Mr. Schofield. <laughs> And I'm not asking you, Ian. You've caught a cold, you poor boy. It's the pepper. Anyway, I'm not asking you because I know what you writers are. You'll be talking shop all the time and poor Katie and I'll not understand a word of it. As for you, Mr. Curtis, dear, I want you all to myself when you come. Oh, you've no idea how he helps us, Mr. Shawfield. He knows so much about animals. Oh, how kind of you. Uh, actually, I once studied to be a vet, but I fear my knowledge is sadly rusty. Of course it isn't, you silly man. But now, Mr. Shawfield, so fascinating our meeting like this. I don't think these things are coincidences, do you? I think they're meant. After all, I've been a fan of yours for ages. Indeed. I must say, it's interesting to meet people who've really read one's books. Uh, most of them just flip over the pages so that they can say the right things. Uh, you must have noticed this, Kate. I... oh, no, I can't say I have. Haven't you? Once or twice I nearly wrote to you, but I, I didn't quite have the nerve. That second book of yours, A Lion Among the Ladies, haunted me for a long time. Do you remember, Kate? Oh, but I'm afraid my little daughter prefers thrillers. Oh, come, Kate. Surely you remember. Uh, I didn't realise I was saying anything funny, Kate. Oh, of course not, Mummy. Oh, well, never mind. If you want to laugh at your poor old mother, why not? But now, Mr. Shawfield, you'll come tomorrow, won't you? I will indeed. I shall look forward to it. Well, then, that's settled. Oh, Mr. Curtis, you do go on with the carving. You all look so hungry. Well, if you're sure you don't mind. How clever of you to know how to carve. He's definitely here, you know. Oh, Mummy, please. The murderer. He's been seen in the glen, actually seen. Please don't let me disturb your meal, only I thought you'd like to know. I'm not hungry. They have a description of him, you know. Apparently, he's got a scar. A scar? Yes. Oh, it's so terrible. A creature like that is no better than a wild beast. Oh, he's mad, of course. No sane person could carve a... cut up his wife. Well, I've disturbed you more than enough. Come on, Kate, darling. We must tidy up our little home before the famous Mr. Shawfield sees it, mustn't we? Would you think me very forward if I called you John? It would be a privilege. I hope, Kate, you will do the same. It sounds so much more friendly. Oh, I don't think she'd dare. Kate is very shy, aren't you, darling? Well, we must go. Bye just now. Uh, tomorrow at four, Johnny. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, oh Mr. Curtis, anything wrong? I, I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I'm not feeling very well. Oh, can I do anything? No. No, I, I, I'll go upstairs and rest a little. That woman's a damn show-off. Is she? Oh, you wait till tomorrow. You'll get a magnificent tea and you'll see your books in the case at the far end. Uh, not near enough to be obtrusive, but uh, where you can't miss them. She did the same to me. Best of luck to her. Oh, you would say that. I'm going to tell you something. Every time you tell me something, you create an earthquake. What is it now? I've decided I'm going to marry her daughter. Oh, have you informed Kate of your decision? It's none of your business. I don't know why I'm telling you any of this. For all I know, you might be this murderer. I could say the same of you. You've got that kind of face. Is there a murderer's face? As it happens, my wife, my ex-wife, is very much alive. If you knew what you looked like when you said that, one day you will do a murder yourself. <laughs> Perhaps I will. You'd better be careful, MacDonald. There are other victims than wives. <laughs> what was this you were saying about marrying the girl? Oh, Kate. I think it's time she settled down. I need someone to look after me. She'll never have a name in lights, but she's a good girl. I fancy she'd marry anyone to get away from that mother of hers. I don't think she'd be any better off with you. What the hell do you mean by that? I'd give her my name and a home. She'd have married status. That's all women ever want. 
She'd be very well off with me. After all, let's face it, she's pretty plain. We can't all look like Sylvia Court, can we? I, I, I warn you, if you hit me, I'll summons you. Oh, for pity's sake, I was merely going to light a cigarette. But I do find it a bit distasteful that you should speak like this of your prospective wife. After all, she's a person in her own right. I'll tell you something. I'll hold on to the tablecloth. We're all together, aren't we? Getting on each other's nerves like fun. And now it's going to snow. So your intended warned me. And when it does, anything might happen. Anything. How jolly. The murderer will have to come out for one thing. He'd freeze to death in Ossian's cave. And the Glen's a queer place, you know. Ghosts aren't the only kind of haunting. And you, being what you are... What the hell am I? <laughs> I'm going to show you something. Wait a minute. Oh, what now? Look, how do you like that, Mr. Shawfield? What's the point of all this drama? All right, it's a pistol. Am I to take this as a challenge to a duel or something? I see you handle it as to the manner born. It looks very old. 300 years old. A real Highland pistol. They call it over and under because one barrel is laid over the other. There's only one lock and hammer required because the second barrel can be turned round by hand. Here. Yeah. After the first has been fired. It's a nice job. I, I should go easy with it if I were you. It's loaded. Both barrels. Do you mean to tell me that you leave a loaded weapon lying around like that in a drawer which isn't even locked? This thing would go off at the slightest pressure. You, you must be out of your mind. It's mine. I do what I like with it. I'm not being dictated to by you. For all your right bestsellers. Oh, damn my bestsellers. Anyone would think they were a crime. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Curtis, uh, are you feeling better? What's that? Oh, it's all right. We've decided to use swords instead. This is something that has killed. Mm, it has indeed. Ask Mr. Shawfield. Oh, do please put it away. I can't bear to look at it. It's wicked. It's done murder. Put it away, you imbecile. Oh, all right. Nowadays, they laugh at killing. I fear we've lost all sense of decency. We even sacrifice animals in the name of science. I don't like having a weapon lying about the house. It puts ideas into people's heads. It's all right, sir. Don't distress yourself. MacDonald isn't going to leave it here. I am. Why shouldn't I? I tell you what we're going to do, MacDonald. We're going to take a nice walk together. I think we both need some fresh air. I don't need any fresh air. Oh, yes, you do, before it snows. We're going to leave you in peace, Mr. Curtis. You can take a nice little nap. What is all this? I don't want to walk with you. Well, you are walking with me. Serves you right for baiting that poor little creature. It's a pity you don't mind your own business. Okay, okay. Oh, God, it's cold. Can't you smell the snow? Ah, oh, that poor devil. This is no place for a murderer on the run. Tell me about the massacre, MacDonald. I'm in the mood. Wasn't it this kind of weather when it happened? Why, he has old McKeon himself to give local colour. Hey, boy! Ah, it appears he's not feeling sociable. A revolting slob of an animal. He ought to be sent to the knacker's yard. Would you murder your own clansman? What about my history lesson? I'm beginning to believe you know nothing about the massacre at all. I know it by heart. So should you, Mr. Shawfield. No wonder you can face the ghosts, you murderer. There are other ghosts. There's Violet, for instance. Don't forget Violet. And you call me mad. Who the blazes is Violet? Is she somebody here? She is a little dispersed. But she's here, all right. She's here. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. But I'll tell you of ghosts. The master of Stair. You'll have heard of him. He ordered the massacre. I hope the soldiers will not trouble the government with prisoners. That's what he said. He wanted them killed. Women, children and all. A little dispersed. Her hands here, her feet there. I wonder if he sees her still on the slopes of Anachdub. It was down these slopes that they fled, naked and screaming in a blizzard. The sky was red with her cottages going up in flames. They shot the old man from behind. They stripped his wife and tore the rings from her fingers with their teeth. It was bloody murder. This was bloody murder, too. When it was all over, the Campbells played a tune on the pipes from Loch Leven Shore. The Glen is mine. That's what the tune was called. The MacDonalds were dead. There was nothing left of them. There was nothing much left of Violet either. Poor Violet. It might so easily have been poor Sylvia. I nearly throttled her once. Only... Ah, well, I didn't. If I had, it would be me in Ossian's cave. Perhaps it might be even now. Well, 
Now you know all about it. And now you know why I call you a murderer, Mr. Campbell of Shawfield. What do you say? What? Oh, my God, you look it. What an ass you are. I'm no murderer. I saw you handle that pistol. It belonged to your ancestor. He murdered mine, John MacDonald of Atrilchen. When did all this take place? 1692 in the month of February. Well, it's now 1965, the month of January. And I'm going to chuck that pistol away the moment I'm back. Oh, let's stop this nonsense. Tell me about this precious book of yours. When's it coming out? I think you ought to dedicate it to me. You and your best sellers! I don't want to talk to you anymore. I wish you'd never come. Are we all mad? My best sellers. You couldn't even leave me that, Sylvia. Well, now, I hope you had a nice walk, Mr. Shawfield. Oh, are you looking for something in that drawer? There's nothing there. It's empty. Yes, it's empty. Oh, is anything wrong? You look quite strange. No, nothing's wrong. Well, uh, you must give me some idea of my route. Tomorrow I go to Etty Farm. Kate! What on earth are you doing here in the middle of the road? And what's all this furniture? Or do you have to move house in the snow? Oh, my dear girl, what has happened? We've, we've been evicted. Oh. It's all Mummy's fault. Oh, what am I to do? What am I to do? I don't know what the hell this is all about, but I do know it's pretty well a blizzard and cold as charity. You can't stay here. You'll freeze to death. You're coming straight back to the hotel with me so that you can get those sopping clothes off. And I shall give you a large brandy, whether you like it or not. Oh. You can pretend it's medicinal. Come along at once. Yes, but, but these things, they're, they're ruined. Oh. They're my piano. A piano in the parts of Glencoe. <laughs> Does it still play? Ah, oh, never mind. Clan Diarmid's dead and Clan Donald, too. Girl, are you coming or aren't you? Well, I can't just leave everything here. You can and you will. Mummy won't be dreadfully upset. Well, I'm dreadfully upset too. <laughs> there was I dreaming of hot scones and a blazing fire. The next time you ask a poor London chap to tea, you might plan the weather better. <laughs> oh, Kate, come on, for pity's sake. You're the most idiotic, pig-headed girl I've ever met. I trouble you not to speak to me like that, Mr. Shawfield. Bah! Oh, really, <laughs> Mr. Shawfield! Mr. Shawfield, put me down this instant. I won't be casted around like a baby. In a moment, I'll sling you over my shoulders like a sack of potatoes. Oh. In fact, if you go on like this, Miss Stewart, I shall smack you, which will oh. be very undignified, and create a certain amount of tension at our future meeting. There is not the least need to shout at me, Mr. Shawfield. I do not like it. I am quite prepared to go to the hotel. If you kindly put me down like this instant. It's a pleasure, Miss Stewart. Oh. Do ask me again, won't you? You must both have tea with me sometime in Ossian's cave. <laughs> oh, that's better. <laughs> Here, I'll take that case. Now, for God's sake, walk as fast as you can. This is as bad as the night of the massacre. <laughs> oh, it was worse than this. Uh, anyway, the massacre is something I should prefer to forget. It's nothing to do with me. Only I must admit... MacDonald has quite a gift for evoking the past. His book should be really impressive. Oh, he doesn't really write at all, you know. What? Oh. Now, look, oh. I'm not being familiar. I'm only holding you to warm you a little. Oh, I don't mind. My poor lamb, you're frozen. Oh, perhaps I, I should have slapped you after all as a remedial measure. Oh, well, I don't think that you should speak to me like that. I... I am 25, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying about MacDonald? Oh, well, I thought you knew. He means to write the book, of course, but he'll never really get down to it. He's a failure, you know, like me. Like you? Oh, yes. He's always making a mess of things. Even as a school teacher. That's what he is, you know. Oh, he's really quite nice under all the nonsense. He... Uh, he wants to marry me. <laughs> he thinks I'd look after him while he writes. And are you going to marry him? Mm, I don't think so. Oh, it would be such a responsibility. I'm not sure if you should let yourself be so devoured by passion, Kate. 
Why are you laughing at me? Have I said something funny? No, of course not. Well, I did consider it, of course. I, I've always been scared of not marrying. There's no earthly reason why you shouldn't get married. Now, marriage isn't all it's cracked up to be. But if you're so frightened about it, you could always take up a cause. You'd do it very well, red hair flying and all. <laughs> In fact, I think you'd be quite terrifying. Oh, do you think so? And what cause would you suggest, Mr. Shawfield? Oh, I wouldn't dare commit myself. Oh, we're nearly home. Shall I pick you up and run for it? My legs are much longer than yours. No, thank you. I do hope you won't catch cold, Mr. Shawfield. You must take a good tot of whiskey when you go to bed and get Mrs. Forbes to give you a hot water bottle. You are the most extraordinary girl. You know, you haven't told me what all this is about yet. And where's your mother? Did she forget she'd asked me round? Well, you see, we knew they were going to evict us. They said we didn't manage the farm properly. Mummy's never taken it seriously, but when the final note came, she got frightened and went out, thinking that they couldn't do anything if she wasn't there. Only, it didn't make any difference. They just took everything out and dumped it by the roadside. And what about your mother? Oh, I expect she's gone to Edinburgh. What the blazes do you mean? We have cousins there. I don't find that an adequate answer. Well, what was there for her to do? She doesn't get on very well with Mrs. Forbes, you know. She probably parked her bicycle somewhere and got a lift to Oban. Oh, I'll hear from her in a day or so. You tell me your mother leaves you to cope and waltzes off to Edinburgh? I hope she sinks in a ten-foot drift and freezes stiff. She should be shot. Really, Mr. Shawfield? I am quite capable of coping with the situation. Oh, sure. When I saw you this afternoon, I was amazed by the way you had everything under control, down to the bottom C of the piano. Oh, sir. Uh, oh. Oh, there was such a lovely tea for you, too. Beautiful cake. I made it myself, uh, uh, Mr. Shawfield. Uh, oh, oh, Mr. Shawfield, put me down. Put me, I, I won't have I'm it. not putting you down. I'm Let getting me, you back oh, as soon as I can. Oh. Look, we're home. Stop crying, my darling silly girl. Ian is watching you from the doorway. Huh? He looks like a new massacre. You should speak more respectfully of the Glen. Shouldn't she, MacDonald? Shouldn't she, boy? Shouldn't she what? What's happened? Why are you carrying her? Is she hurt? Hurt? Oh, Kate? Never. Here. Take her. <laughs> oh, I'd not be tossed about between the pair of you. What do you think I am, a tennis ball? Don't put me down. Oh, do oh. oh, Mrs. Fox. Oh, I, I'm terribly sorry to land myself on you like this. That's a bit dreadful thing has happened. We've been evicted and I simply know where to go. Close the door, McDonald. By the way... What happened to your precious pistol? I don't know what you're talking about. The pistol, MacDonald. The pistol I shot you with 300 years ago. The pistol I may be shooting you with any moment now. Look, all I want to know is, did you take that pistol away yesterday? I don't see what business is it of yours. But I took it up to my room half an hour ago. What were you carrying Kate in your arms for? Oh, having just sacked the farm, I thought I might as well do things properly, so I ravished her as well. Will you let me pass, please? You may enjoy chatting in an icy hallway, but I want to go into the sitting room and warm up a bit. Oh, may I join you, Mr. Curtis? Mrs. Forbes says we won't be able to get out at all. Oh, you don't think the snow's as bad as that, do you? Gosh, I'm cold. Oh, bless Mrs. Forbes for this glorious fire. What? Oh, I don't know. It's really coming down with a vengeance now. But I must get out tomorrow. I simply can't stay in all day. It's bad for me. I've not been well, you know. The doctor said it was essential I should have fresh air. Oh, Lord knows it's fresh enough. My dear chap, I don't like being cooped up any more than you do. In any case, I want to get down to Balahulish tomorrow, see about Kate's belongings. She's been evicted into the snow, you know. And frankly, I don't think any of us will get out if it goes on like this. But I must... Mind you, I do understand I... how you feel. We're not exactly a coordinated group. 
If you feel you simply can't stand us, why don't you stay in your room? I'm sure Mrs. Forbes wouldn't mind. I know what the need for privacy is, God knows. Do you? Oh, yes, I had a wife once, you know. And wouldn't she leave you alone? Not for a minute, not even to write. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you all this. You stay in your room, Mr. Curtis. Walls are good, 18th century workmanship. You won't hear us brawling downstairs. It might thaw tomorrow. It might. I must get out. You don't understand. I must. That, that pistol. Oh, now, don't worry about that. McDonald's taking it away. And high time, too. Well, I'm going to get myself a drink. I think I've earned it. Would you like something? Oh, no, thank you. It's very kind of you, but alcohol doesn't suit my constitution. Suits mine. Here, now. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Forbes. I needed that. Oh, how's our Kate? Oh, she's all right. She's had a hot bath and a good drop of brandy. I lent her my dressing gown and put her by my sitting room fire. Oh. Fancy Mrs. Stewart leaving the poor lassie in the snow and going to Edinburgh. Yeah. I could wring that woman's neck. Uh, things were different before Mr. Stewart left her. Oh, of course. Her husband. Aye, uh, he couldn't take it. He's married someone else now. The poor lassie's never been the same since. Not that Mrs. Stewart would care. She always used her as a kind of servant and keeps on telling her how plain she is. If she was lying dead in the snow this very minute, I'd not care. <laughs> Perhaps she is. No, you'll have a refill. Oh, Mrs. Forbes, you're making a lash out of me. Oh, no. <laughs> well, no. why not? It's one hell of a night. Um, Mr. Shawfield. Hmm? Oh, cheers. <laughs> I was thinking maybe you'd go up and have a word with Kate. I know she'd like to see you. She wants to thank you. Oh, there's nothing to thank me for. Of course I'll go. Oh. And you won't uh, mind the dressing gown? <laughs> I think I could survive it. <laughs> I was warned about your dressing gown, Kate. <laughs> you look rather sweet in it, actually. Well, just a bit on the large size. How are you feeling? I made a horrid scene, didn't I? Oh, poor Mr. Shawfield. Oh. Have you had a drink? Uh, I have indeed. I believe I'm a little drunk. It'll do you good. Oh. Kate, I don't think you should look after everyone like this. Simply means that people take advantage of you. I take advantage of you myself. Yes, you ravish me, don't you? I, I heard I... you say that. Oh, Kate, I, I'm most sincerely sorry. I think McDonald brings out the worst in me. Well, that doesn't make it any better. Please, try to forgive me. Oh, I don't really mind. I was a little surprised, that's all. Oh, what a nice girl you are. Thank God you're here. Looks as if we're going to be snowbound. It's just as well there'll be one civilized person among us. No, I'm not as civilized as all that. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. <laughs> You'd better go. Oh. You should have a good hot meal. Oh, well, there you go again. Only I wonder... I wonder if you would kiss me goodnight before you go. Yeah, of course. Well, I, I know I, I shouldn't ask you. Oh, I was going to do it in any case, whether you asked me or not. Oh, no, you weren't. It's nice of you to say so, though, but... Oh, I know I'm embarrassing you. Oh, for God's sake. Come here. Come here, you idiotic girl. Mr. Shawfield. Mr. Shawfield. Kate. Silly, nice little Kate. Why don't you relax now? You're hurting relax. me. Well, you asked for it, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did, didn't I? Well... You better get down to your dinner now. And don't forget your aspirin. No. Good night, Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> oh. Well, well, you'll not be going far this morning, gentlemen. There are six foot drifts outside. <sighs> Hughie is just sunk in one up to his ears, the daft creature. <laughs> Well, I do hope it clears by tomorrow, because if it does, there's a little treat for you. Oh, and what's that, Mrs. Forbes? Oh, there's the cinema at Kinloch Leven. It comes round to all the villages once a fortnight. Oh, perhaps you could drive them down, Mr. Curtis. Oh, I fear I'm not one for the films. Oh. But, of course, my car is entirely at the disposal of anyone who wants to go. Ah, well, then, Mr. Shawfield and Mr. MacDonald can take Miss Stewart down. Oh, Kate, we were just talking about you. I was saying you must all go to the cinema tomorrow. Eh? Good morning. Well, yes, I should like that. No, I've no time for such things. I have my book to get on with. Besides, I don't want to be intruding. Oh, and 
what makes you say that, Ian? Yes, what makes you say that, Ian? It's a very interesting remark. We should all be delighted to hear your explanation. It's uh, falling very heavily. It's really quite but, uh, blinding. one can only hope, can't one? Well, um, just clear away the breakfast things. I'll help you, Mrs. No, Cox. no, no, dear. No, you just rest a while. Well, one can only hope, can't one? I wouldn't want to spoil your fun. It's a case of two's company, no doubt. I don't like playing gooseberry. Perhaps you would care to enlarge on these odd statements. Uh, I believe, I really believe it's not quite so heavy. I oh, think I know I, your uh, kind. If you I've read the newspapers me, too. I know all about really you and your precious wife. Ask. And I now you honour us with your walk. presence there, dashing Mr. Shawfield. And naturally you make a pass at any girl you see. Your sword would seduce your own grandmother, given half an opportunity. Right. Please, Mr. Shawfield. I'll deal with this. Now, what is the matter with you, Ian? Mr. Shawfield's never made a pass at me. Uh, he was going to hit me. Well, I'm not surprised. I think you ought to apologise. You better hold your hand out, MacDonald. Or should I call you Ian? You are being silly too, Mr. Shawfield. Really, I've no patience with either of you. Oh, I can see when I'm not wanted. Oh, looks as if you and I will be going to the cinema alone. Well, that'll be very nice. Ian uh, is very highly strung. He'll be strung a good deal higher if he goes on like this. Oh, surely you're big enough not to mind what he says. He's so unhappy and mixed up. And but anyway, knocking people down doesn't do any good. Thanks for the sermon. I, I didn't mean to. Well, uh, I must go and help Mrs. Ford. She said she didn't need it. Talk to me instead. Well, I don't see what there is to talk about. Kate. What is it? Don't look so frightened. I'm not. I'm not going to say anything rude or unpleasant. I know I've been both to you. I'm sorry. And MacDonald was perfectly right. I'm just the mess he said I am. I'm not sure if I'll ever be anything else. Not as long as my wife sticks in my memory. And then I meet someone like you. And you're sweet, Kate. Ooh. But you are. Only I'm not the sort of person for you. When I kissed you last night... I asked you to kiss me. Don't you remember, Mr. Shaw? Oh, damn your eyes for an exact and pedantic little prig. All right, then. Now, I am asking you to kiss me. No. Have it your own way. I'm just nothing now. You mustn't bother about me anymore. Shall I tell you what I think? If you must. I think you're lying. Oh, you do, do you? Yes. Oh, I knew exactly why you walked out on me like that last night. You thought... Oh, dear. Now she's going to hang around my neck. She seems such a nice, sensible girl, and now she's just going to be a nuisance. You didn't find me really attractive, you see. Men never have scruples about attractive women. But I knew you'd say something dramatic like this. All writers like drama. That would serve you damn well right if I took hold of you this very instant and gave you a practical demonstration of the facts of life. I suppose it won't. But it would be rather awkward for you, now, wouldn't it, if I fell into your arms? Would you care to try? Anyway, I'm not as ignorant as you always seem to think. Would you like to come here a moment? No, no, I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've spoiled all your grand scene. <laughs> Only... Oh, I wish I hadn't come here. I wish I'd never met you. Never mind, Kate. Tomorrow evening we'll go to the cinema and behave like civilized human beings. I think it'll do us both a lot of good. I suppose it will take our mind off things. What things? Well, Kate. Do you um play cards, Mr. Shawfield? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Are you suggesting we settle down to a nice quiet game of cutthroat? And perhaps it's not a very good idea. No, I don't think it is, really. But it's no reason for me to go on cutting your throat. I apologize, Kate, for being an absolute so-and-so. Why are you frightened? I keep thinking of the murderer. So do I. 
It's as if he's forcing his thoughts on us, making us all think of dreadful things. Yes, yes. We're all ordinary people, aren't we? Ian's really quite sensible when you get him on his own, and well, Mr. Curtis is just a nice, respectable little man who probably goes to work every day in a bowler hat with a rolled umbrella. Well, that should certainly liven up the city. Ah, you laughing at me again. You should be glad. It means you're exercising my demons for me. But of course, you're perfectly right, as you always are. It is frightening, my darling. And we are all behaving like lunatics. Well, where are you going? Are you leaving me? Don't go. Oh, I must go and help Mrs. Forbes with the dinner. Dear, now I'm afraid it's just you and Mr. MacDonald today. Kate is eating with me, and poor Mr. Curtis is having his meal upstairs. He doesn't look at all well. Oh, I hope he's not sickening for something. Uh, it's very worrying. However, I must leave you two gentlemen to your meal. I'll thank you to lay off that girl. Did you hear what I said? I did. Look, I've known Kate for some time. She's a good girl. I'm going to marry her. So you've already notified and me. And you come along. Of course, you've all the tricks of the trade. You turn on the charm, no oh, doubt. Oh, don't you think this is all a little unnecessary? What is the matter with you, man? You always assume that I'm hell-bent on seducing your Kate when I assure you nothing is further from my mind. She thinks she's in love with you. Nonsense. You're insulting her. She's not the kind to make flirty eyes at everything in trousers. If you want to marry her, that's okay with me. But do some courting instead of shrieking abuse at me. Talk some sense for once. Why don't you tell me about your book? What a filthy, abominable swine you are. You talk of courting. You weren't so successful in your own, were you? Wasn't I? I suppose it just doesn't matter to you. That little chap outside has more guts than you. He killed her. He chopped her up. But I don't suppose you even mind all that muck in the papers. It's just more material for your cheap jack novels. I suppose it is. Well, I'm going for a walk. I'll leave you to do your courting. I must admit that the thought of you as a wooer seems rather like Huey in tights doing a tap dance. But Kate is a very compassionate girl. Pretentious swine. Kate! Kate! Uh, come here a moment. I, I want to talk to you. I thought you were up in your room, Mr. Curtis. I really don't think you ought to be out in this weather. I know it stopped snowing, but it's bitterly cold. Yes, I'm well wrapped up. Are you looking for something, sir? Why should I be? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were ferreting around with your stick. <laughs> but of course, it's a damn silly question. You couldn't find a house in all this snow. I'm just taking a little constitution. Hardly the weather for it. I wonder if they've caught the murderer yet. Well, of course not. Of course? With half the Shire looking for him? Actually... I've developed a theory about him. And what is that? I don't think he's shut out at all. I think he's shut in. And the best of luck to him, poor devil. Oh, was that Huey over there? No. You looked over your shoulder. I saw him wandering about a few minutes ago. I wish you wouldn't keep on asking me questions. I beg your pardon. I didn't mean to... Well, it's really very irritating. It worries me. I don't like silly questions. I do hope it's a nice, jolly film tomorrow. I'm sure Miss Stewart will enjoy it. She's such a charming lady, I always think. Yes, she is, isn't she? She's kind. It's a quality one doesn't often meet in the modern generation. I've often watched her with Huey. I always feel the way people behave with animals is very revealing. I can't abide cruelty to animals. Shouldn't you come in now, sir? I'm sure Mrs. Forbes has a good fire waiting for oh, us. Do stop bothering me. I like the fresh air, I tell you. All right, all right. I don't. Not when it's as fresh as this. I'm going back to the lounge. Ian, do you stop pawing me about like this. I don't want to kiss you. I've already said a dozen times that I'm not going to marry you. Thank you very much. I suppose I... you want to remain an old oh, maid. I do wish you'd be sensible. Why don't you listen? You just go on from where you left off without paying the faintest attention to what I've been saying. I've said no, and I mean no, and... Oh. I'm so sorry. Am I intruding? <gasps> this is too much. You did this on purpose. You're spying on us. 
Oh, dear. I didn't mean to gate crash a crisis. I'm honestly sorry. I'm afraid I ruined his kiss. Do you think I'd let a great big Jesse like that kiss me? Let me help you pick up those magazines. MacDonald seems to do his courting as he does everything else. Like a car with a steering gone. Why are you always so beastly about him? He said you'd been terribly rude to him. Ah, we all come to you for comfort, you see. I'm here for comfort myself. Comfort? <laughs> a shoulder to weep on, I know. No, oh, it always makes me laugh when I read those magazine stories about strong, silent heroes taking the little woman into their manly arms. <laughs> The poor creature ought to know that in a wee while she'll be reeling under the full 16 stone of him patting his shoulder and drying his tears. I don't know why you're complaining. Before you know where you are, Mr. Curtis will be asking you to partake of his couch and condiments. I don't find that in the least bit funny. Oh, I don't seem to be very popular this evening. Come and have a drink with me. Let's go to pieces. Well, Tippy. See you drink your whiskey like a good Scots girl. After all, Mr. Shawfield, I am precisely that. I want to talk to you. And I should like to listen. Your shoulders are weep on. Though I don't weigh 16 stone. I want to kiss you. No. Why not? Just no. Tell me about it instead. Oh, I suspect you're well used to people telling you things. Oh, I always give excellent advice. But only for others, not for myself. It's your wife, isn't it? You're really still in love with her. In love? Girl, I hate her. I want to murder her. I want to cut her into tiny pieces so that nothing remains. Do you think that would lay her ghost? Ah, uh, you're a clever girl. I don't know. Only Lionel could answer that. Lionel? Murderer. Oh. Oh, I forgot that that was his name. I've been thinking about him so much. I don't know him, but I do know that by destroying her, he's destroyed himself. Do you mean that? I'm sure of it. I think murder leaves a shadow. It's like this glen where murder has sunk deep into the soil. Ah, that's the voice of whiskey, my love. Perhaps it's the voice of Lionel. Don't add yours to it. Was your wife so terrible? She had to destroy, too. Even my part to write. And if I can't write, Kate, I'm lost and damned. But you, my darling, you'd never understand this. I don't suppose you've ever hated in your kind little life. Oh, yes, I have. Hmm? I love my father very much, Mr. Shawfield. She drove him away. No man could ignore the life she led him. I think if he'd stayed, I should be different. I shouldn't be such a thrawn, crabbed old mate. Uh. Oh, I'm talking too much. I'm being silly again. You're all right, girl. Oh, don't go away. Let me hold you. I, I really must go up to bed. Uh. I do believe I'm a little tipsy. <laughs> Whatever will Mrs. Forbes think? Kate... Oh, I've bothered you quite enough for one night. You needn't worry. I won't hang about your neck, I promise. Good night, Mr. Shawfield. Kate. Oh. I want someone to talk to. I must have someone to talk to. Huey. My boy, Huey! Where are you, huh? Ah, oh, damn the horse. He's never there when he's wanted. My God, what's that? Lionel! It's all right, man. She's dead, isn't she? Come in and talk to me. After all, we're all of us murderers. Lionel! 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 Mrs. Forbes! Oh, I can't hear a thing through this. Here, now, what did you say, Mr. Shawfield? I just wondered, uh, did you uh, hear anything last night? What do you mean? Like, like someone crying. Oh, I sleep very heavily. 
He's still in the papers, but they don't think he's hiding out now. They think he's in a hotel. Someone saw him at Balahulish. It's that scar, you know. It's on his wrist. They think it may be where the knife slipped. Uh, they never found the weapon, you know. London has a deep and wide river, Mrs. Forbes. Oh, well, it's nothing to do with us, is it? Oh, I hear Mr. Curtis is lending you his car. Mm. Oh, what a blessing it is, it's thawing. You'll need to start about six tonight. How pretty you look, Kate. You should always use lipstick. Mrs. Forbes lent it to me. I hope I've not put on too much. Mummy would be very cross with me. No comment. Let the old lady enjoy herself in Edinburgh. We're going to enjoy our cinema. Ah, you look really nice. I like the hairstyle, too. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shawfield. Kate. <laughs> yes, Mr. Shawfield. <laughs> I thought as much. <laughs> this is deliberate impertinence. All right, my girl. Either you call me by my proper name or I turn this car around, go back to the hotel, carry you up to bed, oh. and go to the pictures on my own. Oh. Well, would you like to put it to the test? No, John. I should think so. What happened? I just want to celebrate this unprecedented occasion. Oh, John, please, please. Oh, Kate. You're not being fair. Now, oh, why must you spoil a nice evening? For pity's sake, I was only going to give you a nice, friendly kiss. Oh. Kate. Oh! Damn! Oh. oh, now, what is it? Oh, you've hurt yourself. Your wrist's bleeding. What the hell does he keep down the car seat? Looks like a razor blade. Oh, now, I'll bind it for you. It's, it's not a deep cut. It'll, it'll stop bleeding in a moment. No, it, it's nothing. Uh, don't fuss me. I'm sorry I made such an ass of myself. Will you just try to forget it? Your guardian angel is obviously trained in commando tactics. Accept my apologies, please. Are you sure you feel all right? I'm fine. Why not? After all, I now share the same distinguishing mark as the murderer. Well, where do we go from here? I don't know the way to Kinloch, do you? Straight on, and then to the right. Can you get it? Quite a coincidence, wasn't it? But it should have been one of Sylvia's films. Did you enjoy it, darling? It is very nice. Should we drive somewhere and get a drink? Uh, no, thank you. You sure? Yes, thank you. Oh, all right, then I'll drive you home. What did you think of my wife? Oh, she's very lovely. <laughs> it's all rather amusing, actually. Well, it is funny, don't you think so? Oh, for God's sake, I must say you're not the most enlivening of companions. You better have the radio on, perhaps it'll wake you up a bit. What the hell do you think you're doing? Did Mummy never tell you not to grab at a driver's arm, especially on a slippery mountain road? You might have killed a pair of us. Johnny, Johnny. I know you hated her. I know she's hurt you dreadfully, but leave her be now. She doesn't matter. She can't hurt you anymore. She'll get what she deserves in the end. She will oh, indeed. Please, Johnny, Johnny, listen. Please, you must listen. It was wicked that it should be that, Phil. And I, I wish I'd known, but does it really matter so much to you? That part of your life is over and done with. You need never see her again. I have to see her again. No, 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 please. Let her go to the devil any way she pleases. <laughs> I'm surprised at you, Kate. What would your grandfather say? Oh, are you going to ruin your life for her? You fool. Can't you see that is what she wants you to do? What do you mean by that, Kate? I should like an answer. We're not moving till I get one. All right. I'll answer. I think you're planning to kill her. You're going tonight, Johnny. I know you are. All right. If you have to know, I am going tonight. I had a letter this morning from my solicitors. Oh, there's been no post for two days. I put a call through this morning. There is no telephone. And you said it was a letter. Oh, you're driving me mad with all this insanity. It'd serve you right if I put you out of the car and made you walk home. You are going to kill her. I know it. 
you win. I'm going to see her anyway. <laughs> Honey, I don't know if I'm going to kill her. Uh, oh, don't be frightened, Kate. There's no need. I'll try not to do anything silly. Georgie. Johnny, you're not to go. I have to. I, I'll go for you. I, I'll give her any message you want. Oh, my darling idiot. She'd eat you alive. Oh, I'm not afraid of her. I can sort her, all right? You don't know me, Johnny. You don't know me at all. I'm beginning to see that. But I have to go, Kate. I can't explain exactly why, even to myself. It's as if there's something in this confounded glen that's pushing me on. It's your novels, Johnny. I know you're right again. I'll make you right again. Oh, Johnny, if it would help you, I'll, I'll do anything you want, Johnny. Anything. I love you. I'd give up the whole wide world to stop you going. I'm not as silly as I used to be. If you want me to... What? Oh, Kate. Oh, my dear, dear girl. Thank you, Kate. I'll, I'll never forget that. But I wouldn't want it to be like that for you. You deserve better. Uh, dear Kate, I'll be honest with you. I have to go to London. But what will happen when I get there, I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. Come, darling. We must go. Long after midnight, we'll have the elders of the Kirk talking. <laughs> what a good thing Hugh is here to chaperone you. Oh, he's away to the village. Goodbye, Kate. I'll leave Mr. Curtis's car out for the night. Snow's melting fast. It won't come to any harm. <laughs> Johnny! Johnny! There must be an end to hate. Even here in Glencoe. I could do far more for you than she could. She can only destroy. Why won't you trust me? Oh, not that. I do trust you. And it's not that. <laughs> Goodbye, Kate. I'll be waiting for you when you come back. Damnation, what's that? Oh, this is just about the last straw. What the hell are you doing out of this hour in the morning, MacDonald? And is this confounded bicycle yours? Left, presumably, to trip me up. I've been waiting for oh, you. Oh, go back to bed, you confounded idiot, and take your bike with you. Oh, no, you don't get away with it like that, you murderous Campbell. Look here, MacDonald. I've had just as much as I can take. Let me tell you once and for all that I am not a Campbell. I never was a Campbell. And I'm never, thank God, likely to be a Campbell. Of course. Seducing a nice girl like that means nothing to you. And what do you mean by that? The cinema ended at half past ten. It didn't take you two hours to drive back, did it? Oh, will you get out of my road? I've got to get to Balakulish. You neurotic little moonshiner, you're mad. You've got Campbells on the brain. You're not going to get away with this. I heard her go to her room and cry her heart out for what you'd done to her. She was still crying when I left. Oh, but you wouldn't care. You just take what you want on the hell with it. You're muddling up your times a bit, aren't you? I am not one of your wenching gallants of three centuries. What's that in your pocket? Put that away, you idiot. Do you want to commit a murder? It's a hair trigger. Oh, for God's sake, you are mad. Don't you like my pistol, Shawfield? Perhaps you prefer to be at the other end of it. Put that down! Oh. <laughs> Get up, you damn fool. Well, you don't expect me to help you, do you? I must say, I never thought I, I'd owe my life to a bicycle. I'll take that pistol from you, thank you very much. So both barrels have been fired. Oh, stop that stupid noise, you infernal lunatic. Whose bicycle is this? Mrs. Stewart's. I might have guessed. So the murderer was locked in after all. Come on. 
Get up, you nutcase. You're going to help me. I want to shove away some of this snow. I can't. If you don't, I'll bury you in it, so help me. Oh, come on, man. Pull yourself together. to leave lethal weapons about. Come along, we better get back. We've made enough asses of ourselves to create a new massacre. You, you, you can't leave that poor lady lying there. You imagine either of us is in any state to carry her. Besides, the police will have to be notified. She is dead. I can't feel any more for the dead. It's time I concentrated on the living. Only, I want to tell you this, MacDonald. You keep on calling me Campbell of Shawfield. Well, as it happens, my grandfather was a Jew. He came from Hamburg, and his name was Schoenfeld. He changed it to Shawfield. He thought it sounded prettier. We've never shouted Kruchen. Our war chant is, oi vai, oi vai. Oh, all right, all right. Oh, stop dragging at me. This is the hotel, isn't it? Oh, I want to go to bed. Leave me alone. I have every intention of leaving you alone. Ah, oh, just one more thing. You are not to say a word of this to Kate. She'll know in the morning, soon enough. There's something I've got to do. But when I've finished, I'm going in to say good night to Kate. Any objection? Oh, have it your own way. What are you rummaging in Curtis's car for? Death. I suppose you think that makes sense. Where are you going? I'm going to see Mr. Curtis. What do you want? I have two things to show you, Mr. Curtis. One, a 17th century pistol. And this. That's my surgical knife. Yes. I, I don't like lethal weapons. Why do you bring these horrid things into my room? Take them away at once. One is lethal no longer. Both barrels have been fired. Why did you have to kill Mrs. Stewart? I suppose you couldn't find her body in the snow. I wondered what you were looking for all the time. She was well buried. You wouldn't have found her till the thaw. But it's all up, you know. And what do you mean by that? Oh, for pity's sake, man, of course it's all up. The police will be here tomorrow. They have your description. Even if this hadn't happened, it would only have been a question of time. They got your scar wrong, sir, didn't they? I see it's on the pad of your thumb. Not on your wrist at all. I suppose the knife slipped. I don't care for these personal remarks. You talk as if nothing had happened. Even if I were prepared to connive at your escape, how on earth do you think you could get away? I fear you underestimate my intelligence. You haven't answered me. Why did you kill her? Why? Didn't you see it took away your last chance of escape? And of course I killed her. She knew about my scar. I couldn't possibly let her live. She was cycling down the road and I shot her. She was cruel. She let her cattle die of starvation. I've no patience with people who ill use dumb animals. It's wicked, vile. We had such a lovely cat. He was called Ricky. After Kipling's mongoose, you know, he was the dearest little fellow. Don't you ever think of humans? Humans? Oh, humans. No, Mr. Shawfield. Why should I? They've never thought of me. Give me Huey any day. But he's only an animal. That's what Violet said. He was such a dear little fellow. He used to run and meet me when I came back from work. He talked to me, you know. I've always loved animals. I believe I told you that I trained to be a vet. Oh, of course. That's why you have a surgical knife. Why didn't you throw it away? It wasn't very clever of you to keep it in the car. I still keep my instruments. I wish you'd seen little Ricky. He understood everything I said. And she waited until my back was turned. And then had him destroyed. My lovely cat! Oh, she must have had her reasons. Reasons? What possible reasons could there be for such a dreadful thing? She said he was dirty. After all, he was an old gentleman, 15 years old. It wasn't his fault if he occasionally made a mistake. But she couldn't bear anything dirty in her home. She took him round to the vet while I was at work and had him put to sleep. So I killed her. 
I suppose you are going to repeat all this to the police. What else can I do? You litter the place with corpses like a battlefield. Mr. Curtis, I want you to tell me something. Pardon? You killed your wife. I don't know why you keep on asking me that. I've never attempted to deny it. Of course I did. I was very clever about it. All right, you were clever. But tell me this. Why do you always look over your shoulder? What on earth do you mean? Why are you always turning? As if there's someone behind you. I, I, She's I just... still there, isn't she, Lionel? Violet is always there. Maybe there's a jigsaw pattern across her, but she's still there. No! Uh, I'm sorry, dear. I won't keep you waiting long. I just have to speak to this gentleman. Oh, don't be angry, dear. I'm just coming. Mr. Curtis, you're not well. Oh, yes, I am. And I'm clever, too. I'm clever than you. They'll never catch someone as clever as me. You're not going to the police. I shall make my getaway as I always have. I suppose you're going to see Kate now. Yes. The only person I could bear to talk to. I don't really mind. I'm leaving here. I'm going back to teaching. That sounds about the most sensible thing I've ever heard you say. I can do my book in my spare time. Yeah, I expect you can. What's the matter with Curtis? I saw him tearing down the stairs just now, as if all the devils in hell were after him. I imagine they were. I'm not driving fast, dear. Yes, dear, I did signal I was going right. Of course, dear. Just as you say, dear. Well, after all, dear, we have to get away, don't we? Huey! Oh, look away! There's a good old chap! Huey! I can't stop you! What am I going to do? Huey! Huey! you might like to know I'm back. I'm not going out again. You needn't worry any more, Kate. Oh. oh, my darling, my poor darling. You've been crying yourself sick. Oh, don't cry anymore. Go to sleep now. Oh, so terribly white. What happened? Are you really not going back to Sylvia? Sylvia? Oh, she's in the past, Kate. She's nothing to do with me anymore. I should have had the sense to know it a long time ago. Oh, my dear darling, you're worth a dozen of her. And I'm sorry I frightened you so. Listen to me, Kate. The shadow of murder is gone. And we're alive. We're going to stay alive and be happy. And, oh, my darling Kate, I love you very much. That was David March as John Shawfield, Rena Anderson as Mrs. Stewart, and Gudrun Yeo as Kate Stewart in Shadow of Murder by Charity Blackstock, with Eric Anderson as Curtis, Fraser Carr as MacDonald, Molly Rankin as Mrs. Forbes, Arthur Lawrence as the taxi driver. The production, which was recorded, was by Audrey Cameron.
After the 11 o'clock news summary, Music at Night is a programme of British chamber music, a piano recital given by Alan Rowlands. And he'll be playing works by E.J. Moran and Arnold Bax. And the main work is the Sonata by John Ireland. That's Music at Night at approximately two minutes past 11 in the home service. Now, in just a few seconds, the chimes of Big Ben and the 10 o'clock news. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news read by Michael Murray. India has accused Pakistan of using tanks in a new border clash. Mr George Brown has said he's going to issue a shop steward's guide very soon on his prices and incomes policy. Chelsea, watched by the eight players suspended from training, were beaten 6-2 at Burnley and are now out of the running for the league championship. In one of tonight's matches, Portsmouth escaped relegation from the second division by drawing away to one of the promoted clubs, Northampton. The P&O liner Arcadia has been refloated after going aground in the Suez Canal. Lord Hives, former chairman of Rolls-Royce, has died at the age of 79. Indian and Pakistan troops engaged each other today in a new border clash, and judging by Indian accounts, it seems to have been a particularly vicious one, with the Pakistanis using tanks. The scene was the boggy wilderness known as the Ran of Kutch, where fighting has been going on intermittently for the past fortnight. It's in this area that the Indian border runs closest to Karachi, West Pakistan's biggest city. Most of the details of the fighting have come so far from the Indian side. According to their spokesman, Pakistan troops, numbering about 3,000, attacked a post held by a small Indian force. The Indians fought back, destroying three Pakistan tanks. The latest reports indicated that fighting was still going on. The Indian spokesman said Pakistan had brought up a substantial force, including, as well as tanks, medium artillery and two squadrons of fighter bombers. The scale of these preparations, he said, suggested that Pakistan was taking an increasingly threatening attitude. When you start using tanks, he added, it is very near war. A Pakistan spokesman has said that Pakistan forces retaliated after repeated firing from Indian positions in the Ran of Kutch. He claimed that the Indians suffered considerable casualties. It's not clear whether the Pakistan statement refers to the same engagement as described by the Indians or to another incident in the area. Our Commonwealth correspondent says the tone of the Indian spokesman's remarks is unusually tough, and if indeed Pakistan has been using tanks, then the situation will undoubtedly cause international concern. The British government is keeping a close watch on developments. Mr George Brown has said he hopes to get out very soon a layman's guide, or shop steward's guide, to his new prices and incomes policy. At a union conference in Manchester, he said there would be a temptation to applaud the policy, but then to act as though it applied to the other fellow. There would be battles to fight within the unions over this. The policy was not one of restraint. It was a policy for more rapid expansion of income in real terms than we'd ever achieved before. It could mean that a man earning £16 a week last year would be able to earn £20 a week in 1970. Not simply a paper increase, but a rise of 25% in his real spending power. Mr Brown referred to groups such as teachers and nurses whose pay had fallen seriously out of line with the level for similar work and added, I could mention others much in the public eye at the moment. He'd seen people interviewed on television who still thought that so long as you cracked down on teachers or nurses or railwaymen, you were running an incomes policy. This was absolute rubbish, and it was time we stood out for a sensible and intelligent approach to this problem. Before the meeting, Mr Brown said he was feeling much better after his ten days rest. The former Conservative Minister of Labour, Mr Godber, speaking at Newcastle on Tyne, said that Mr Brown's incomes policy was already beginning to look more than a little meaningless. Over the last six months, wages had been rising at an average rate of more than 8% a year. This, said Mr Godber, 
would be good if everyone didn't know that it must mean a big rise in the cost of living. The eight Chelsea players who were suspended from training earlier this week were spectators today when a makeshift side which included four 18-year-olds lost their game at Burnley 6-2 and with it Chelsea's remaining chance of the league championship. Lockhead scored five times for Burnley. Afterwards, in an interview in the BBC's sports report, the Chelsea manager Tommy Doherty said the eight players hadn't been banned, they'd merely been sent home for staying out late. They would definitely go on to the club's coming tour of Australia. The league championship now rests between Leeds and Manchester United, who both won. Portsmouth, by drawing their match this evening at Northampton, escaped relegation to the third division by one point. They were helped by Jimmy Dickinson playing his last game for the club on his 40th birthday. Swindon and Swansea go down. In this afternoon's soccer, the Scottish Cup was won by Celtic, who beat Dunfermline 3-2 at Hampden Park, equalling Rangers' record of 18 wins. The Scottish First Division champions are Kilmarnock, after winning 2-0 away to Hearts, who are runners-up. At Wembley, Hendon won the FA Amateur Cup, beating Whitby Town 3-1. In the third division, Bristol City won promotion with Carlisle and Luton, beaten 8-1 at Scunthorpe, will go down. The 30,000-tonne P&O liner Arcadia went aground today in the Suez Canal but has since been refloated and has anchored in Port Side. It's not thought that the ship has been damaged. The Arcadia, on a voyage from Britain to Australia, is carrying nearly 1,200 passengers. Southern region electric train crews have called off their threat to go slow from Monday. This was decided at a meeting in London today of representatives from about 30 depots in the southeastern division. After an appeal by Mr Griffiths, General Secretary of the Drivers' Union, Aslef, the men agreed to wait next week's meeting of the union executive. Some 600 motormen had said they'd worked to rule because of continued delay in settling their claim for a productivity bonus. Lord Hives, a former chairman of Rolls-Royce, died today in the National Hospital for Nervous Diseases in London. He was 79 and had been in a coma since he went there more than two years ago after a stroke. Lord Hives joined the staff of Rolls-Royce as a mechanic at the age of 22 and became managing director in 1946. He was made a companion of honour in 1943. The Minister of Land and Natural Resources, Mr Fred Willey, Today attended the official opening of the Pennine Way, Britain's first statutory long-distance footpath that stretches 250 miles from Edale in Derbyshire to just over the Scottish border at Kirkyetham. At the ceremony at Malham Lings in Yorkshire, he said he was making an urgent and comprehensive review of a policy for the countryside. This would have the backing of all the necessary powers to ensure that people could enjoy the countryside in all its aspects. The American government has published the results of a six months experiment to find out how people and property react to the bangs made by the supersonic aircraft over a long period. Oklahoma, Oklahoma City was chosen for the test and American Air Force planes made over 1,200 bangs at the rate of about seven or eight a day. Our Washington correspondent says it was found that damage to property was fairly slight. Windows seemed to have broken only where they were damaged or badly installed in the first place and much the same was the case with plaster. More interesting was the reaction of people. At first, over 90% of those questions, questioned said they thought they could learn to accept the bangs. But halfway through the test, only 80% thought they could get used to it, and by the end of six months, a quarter of those asked said no. They thought they could never learn to live with the bangs. Socialist leaders from 13 countries have been entertained at Chequers today at a meeting of the Socialist International. Informal talks, which went on throughout the day and into the evening, were concentrated on the problems of European economic cooperation, Southeast Asia and Africa. After the full conference, a special after-dinner session between the Prime Ministers of Norway and Sweden, the Vice-Chancellor of Austria and Mr Harold Wilson, discussed means of bringing the countries of EFTA and the common market closer together. The expenses of the conference, it is said, are being met by Mr Wilson, as this was not a government but a party occasion. 74 of the 77 riders in the Vintage Motorcycling Club's Coventry to Brighton run arrived in Brighton tonight. The other three broke down on the way. The six oldest machines, all built more than 50 years ago, 
completed the 150-mile run. So did the only woman competitor, Mrs. Margaret McMahon of Coventry, who rode a 35-year-old machine. The Soviet Foreign Minister, Mr. Gromyko, according to the New York Times, is to have an executive type of American limousine costing about £6,000. It is equipped with a bar and a television, and the report says it is already being shipped to Russia. The car, a Lincoln, will take eight people. The weather... Tomorrow is expected to be dry for much of the day, with some sunshine in eastern areas. Rain will later spread from the west. That's the end of the news. From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays with John Chapman. Best Plays, the series of hour-length dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now John Chapman, editor of the theatrical yearbook Best Plays and drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory in Patrick Hamilton's Rope. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Patrick Hamilton of London is one of the best men at the business of scaring innocent audiences like yourselves. He has a fondness for writing about characters who are somewhat on the lunatic side. Previously on this program, you may have heard Angel Street. But anyhow, you must know it. And you'll remember the sinister Mr. Manningham who tried to make his wife as crazy as he was. This evening's best play is Mr. Hamilton's Rope which was a Broadway success some years back under the title Rope's End. In Rope, we shall meet some rather weird characters and hear some strange events. The two principal characters in this cat-and-mouse drama about a murder in the usually calm precincts of Oxford University will be played by Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. Are you ready? All right, we'll begin. It is dark in the room. The light from the street lamp outside throws shadows against the ceiling. And even in the half-light, these moving figures seem to be dancing, circling in some primitive rite about the chest. The lock. It won't. Give it to me. That's it. There it is. Closed tight. Stop there. No. Don't put on the light. Steady, Grano. You all right? Grano. Give me a match. (laughs) You all right? It's time you pulled yourself together. Brandon, you understand what we've done? Yes. I know what I've done. I've committed murder. Passionless, faultless, and clueless murder. Yes, Brandon. An immaculate murder. I have killed. I have killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. Yet I am alive. May I put on the light now? No. Brandon, when he... When Ronald came in, you were standing at the door. Yes, Did you see anyone standing there, up the street? No. There was someone. There was a man. I saw him. I remember. Well? 
Nothing. Brandis? Yes? When I met Ronald coming out of the Coliseum... When I met him, why shouldn't someone have seen us? Did we think of that, Brendan? I did. Do you think we'll get away with it? You mean later this evening? Do you think some psychic force emanating from that chest there is going to advise Sir Johnston Kentley that within is the lifeless entire... Stop it! ...of his only son and heir? Listen. Now, what is it, Grenillo? What is... Listen. I thought it was Sabo. Sabo will not be here until five minutes to nine. Mathematics is important, Grana. At two o'clock, Ronald Kentley leaves his father's house. After tea, in this room, precisely at 6.45, he is done to death by strangulation and rope. And then... Let it alone! Tonight at nine, his father and several well-chosen friends of our own will be here for a light entertainment. And then, after... This party isn't a slip, is it, Brent? My dear Grano, have we not agreed that the entire beauty and piquancy of the evening is in the party itself? At eleven, you and I leave by car for Oxford, and our fellow undergraduate here at present is never heard from again. That is the perfection of criminality. I am quite lucid, am I not? Yes. The party itself, so far from being our most vulnerable point, is the very apex and consummation of our feat. Consider its ingredients. First, Sir Johnston Kentley, his father. He lends the macabre quality to the evening. And then I... Brent! Answer it. Hello? This is Mayfair 6143. What? Brandon, put out that light! Put out that light! Put down the telephone. You're telling London you're afraid. Put it down. That's better. Now, the party. Perfect. Perfect. The father, Kenneth Ragland. I don't like that, Brandon. Ronald's best friend. But that's precisely the pleasure of it. The same youth, the same lack of intelligence. The one dead in the chest, the other alive, unknowing. And Lila, Lila, so much in love with him. Brandon, don't touch it. And now we come to Rupert. A very intriguing proposition. A man who might see this thing from our angle, the artistic one. You know, I even toyed with the idea of inviting him to share our dangers. Rupert is a poet, brilliant Capable of comprehending the beauty and the enchantment of this. What time is it? But Rupert remains in as blissful ignorance as the others. The crowning touch, the one man who could appreciate it, is kept in ignorance. We choose not to share with him. May I put on the light now? Go on. I'm all right. I'm better now. I thought you were going to lose your nerve for a moment, Grano. So did I. But I haven't. Easy. Well, let me alone. Just remember that. You idiot! I told you to clean up in here. What's the matter? Ronald's ticket to the Coliseum. It's caught under this chest here. Help me get it out. It's Terry! Now, wait, wait. I'll lift the chest. All right. How in heaven's name... Grinello, do you realize we could hang on that? Brendan, listen. That's Sabo. Now quiet yourself and sit down. The ticket! In your pocket. There. In here, Sabo. The evening paper, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Grano, you don't want to drink before dinner, do you? But I... Was that... Do you? All right. Excuse me, sir. The table in the dining room, it's covered with books. Yes, you may lay the table here. Here? On the chest. Oh, but I could bring the table from upstairs, sir. Oh, no, set it here. On the chest. Very good, sir. Ah, here we are. 
Early, whoever it is. In here, sir? Yes, in here. Very good, sir. Hello. This way, sir. Hello, Raglan. Hello there. Oh, I I say, I'm terribly sorry. I've come dressed. My fault entirely. Do sit down. I should have explained. We're going up to Oxford tonight. Oh, no. Are you? Drink with gin and Italian. We leave tonight about 12. The place is simply covered with books. Uh, I see. Here you are. Thanks. You see, I've, I've come into a library. Of course, books aren't entirely your line, are they, Kenneth? Uh, no, not really. Only P.G. Woodhouse. An uncle of mine died just lately, and I have his library. It was bestowed on me. It broke up Sir Johnston Kentley. He had his eye on the collection for himself. He'll be here directly. You mean old Kentley lives in Grosvenor Square? Ronnie's father? Yes, Ronnie's father. Of course, you know Ronnie. Oh, rather. You mean you're having Sir Johnston here just to have him grind his teeth with envy over your books? On the contrary. I'm going to let him have exactly what he wants, provided I don't want it. That explains the mess that we're in. Mess? Well, you'll observe we're having our meal off a chest. Oh, yes, yes. I thought it looked odd. Your man laying a cloth on it. Here we are. Mm, I wonder if that's Rupert. Did you ever meet Rupert, Kenneth? Rupert Cadell? Uh, No, I can't say I have. Not your set, I imagine. This way, madam. Thank you. Ah, the ravishing Lila. (laughs) You know Grano, don't you? Hello. Hello, Kenneth. Missed you at tennis this morning. Bad night, you know. Kenneth's having gin and Italian. I'd adore one. You'll have to excuse our mess. I've just been telling Kenneth. I've come into a library. Come into a library? My dear, how weird. And I hope you don't think you'll get much to eat, because we're off to Oxford tonight, and so we're being very humble. Well, I had a simply gluttonous tea. Just gorge, my dear. Here you are. Oh, thank you. You know, I feel most ghastly dressed. Boiled shirt and all. Why? I'm sure you couldn't tell. I guessed myself. It's not proper cocktail time. Too early for dinner. The whole thing is weird and mysterious. What do you mean, weird and mysterious? Well, what? Don't you think it is? I mean, well, I just feel it is. Here we are. I'll bet that's old Kentley. I didn't know you were having Ronnie's father. Oh, yes. He's to look at the books. Ah, how do you do, Grinello? Brand how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, ah, Lila, uh, where's my son? I'm sure I haven't the faintest, Sir Johnston. Is he coming here? I don't think so. I couldn't get in touch with him. Gin and Italian, Sir Johnston. What? Oh, oh, certainly not. Won't you sit down, Sir Johnston, this armchair? We're going to feed from the chest, as it were. You'll be quite close to it here. The chest? It's, uh, it's not a cassoni, is it? Uh, perhaps if I look more closely... No, sir, it's not genuine. It's a reproduction, but it's rather a nice piece. Do you like it? Eh? Oh, yeah, I suppose so. And now, uh, those books I'm to see, where are they? They're in the other room, the dining room. There's more space in there. I, I shall be interested to see them. Wickham had a remarkable lot of Shakespeareana. Well, I'm afraid the folios were sold off before he died. Oh, pity. There's a deal of Baconian stuff. I'm told it's very fine. Hello, Brandon. Am I late? Rupert, the last as usual. Do come in. I'll keep my sticks, Abel. Oh, of course. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Cadell, Sir Johnston Kentley. How do you do? Kenneth Ragland. How do you do? Miss Arden. How do you do? Tell me, have I come dressed or undressed? (laughs) Oh, I see there's several shades of opinion. I wasn't able to inquire. Well, what's this? A chest. We're having supper off a chest, Rupert. Oh, are we? Yes. Why? Because it's a very nice chest. And because the table in the dining room is covered with books. Rupert, aren't you going to have a cocktail? No, thank you. I've I've had four already. Sabo, I'll ring when we're through and you make clear. Very good, sir. When do we begin the meal, Brandon? Personally, I'm I'm famished. And we've been waiting for you, Rupert. Now, there are lots of plates and knives and sandwiches, caviar and whatnot. Now gather round and help yourselves. Oh, I suppose good. I could manage I'm a little. Sure. Sure. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. That's oh. delicious. Oh. I'd like to have your two of uh, Are you the on. great Cadell, then? The great Cadell, sir? And what do you know about me? I've read your poems, some of them. No, I, I knew a Cadell once. Uh, Louisa Cadell. Horrible old hag she was, too. Dear heaven, the young man is alluding to my aunt. Oh, I say, I'm terribly sorry. Have I dropped a brick? No, you have said a mouthful. 
Frankly, I could cheerfully murder her. Murder? Mm. With glee. A horrible old woman. The world would be well rid of her. You wouldn't, Mr. Cadell. Mm. Why not? You'd be hauled into Old Bailey and brought to justice. I've heard of people being brought to Old Bailey, but seldom to justice. Uh, I hope you're not confusing the two. But I say you're not one of those people who doesn't approve of capital punishment. Possibly. I approve of murder too much to approve of capital punishment. You approve of murder, Rupert? Of course. There are so many people I would so willingly murder, mostly members of my own family. Furthermore, I have already committed murder myself. How do you get that? You, my friends, have paradoxically a horror of murder on a small scale and a veneration for it on a large. One gentleman murders another in a back alleyway in London for, oh, let us say, the gold fillings in his teeth. And all society shrieks for revenge upon the miscreant. But when the entire manhood of one nation rises up to go slaughter another, lacking even the excuse of the gold fillings, that society condones and applauds and calls it war. Really, Mr. Cadell? I, I carry my cane as a souvenir of my career of murder. Why, you'd be the first to be horrified by real murder if it appeared under your nose. I wonder... You must have some moral standards. Really? I can't recall any. You wouldn't hurt a fly. Wouldn't I? I've hurt thousands of my time. Tell me, Miss... Miss Arden, have you moral standards? Lila? Oh, she believes in the Ten Commandments. Oh, surely not. Why? What's wrong with the Ten Commandments? Nothing whatever. I have no doubt they were of profound significance to the nomadic needs of the tribe to which they were delivered. Their inadequacy for a day must be sufficient to condemn them. I don't believe it's possible to observe a one of them. The only one I'm sincerely capable of adhering to is that little stricture concerning my neighbor's ox and my neighbor's ass. And I don't believe I've got a neighbor so equipped. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Although it might be different if I lived in a rural area. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I'm afraid I approve of murder most heartily. And, oh, oh, oh. Spilled the wine. Look, must we eat on this chest? I'm afraid so, Rupert. Let me pour you another glass. Well, thank you. Lady Kentley any better, Sir John? Yes, I'm afraid she's still in bed. And how's Ronald getting on? Merely idling, just like you and Grunello here. Does he like it, or does he want to get back to Oxford? Oh, Grunello, he doesn't want to get back. He has a great time. Do... Do I remember seeing Ronald's portrait in the papers recently? Something something about uh, winning the high jump or some other form of violent exercise. That's right. Oh, yes, 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 I do remember. I remember quite well. There was a picture of me right next to it. Was there? I didn't know you were athletic, Mr. Cadell. Oh, no, no. There had been someone pleasant with, with my publisher, and he was suing me for breach of contract. Ronald looked quite the healthier of the two photographs. I remember he was some six feet off the ground, hovering over the bar. <laughs> yes, he's a sprightly lad, is Ronald. Lively, full of life. <coughs> All right, Grano? <coughs> uh, yes, yes. Went down the wrong way. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, in what way? Well, he's a sort of general youthfulness. Ronald's rather like Kenneth here, don't you think so? Good heavens, no. But he is. Oh, in what way? Well, he's a sort of general youthfulness, too. I'm, I'm afraid they won't feel like that for long, though. No, they won't. Poor chap. Now, look here, Bob. Oh, don't quarrel with him, Ragland. The rest of us envy your clear eyed youth and certain physical well being. I, uh,. I had not realized the pleasure of mere walking until I found it necessary to hobble. I, I say, uh, you, you really don't... Uh, uh, I mean, you, you'd hardly notice the... Uh, I mean, oh, sir... Don't concern yourself, Raglan. In artistic circles, a limp is considered an asset. It um, sets one off. But really, I didn't mean to... You see what I mean. The same youthful clumsiness. Puppies gambling amidst the porcelain. You share that quality with Ronald, Kenneth. Youth. Youth? <laughs> I'd say they were infantile. Ronald's only passion in holiday time is the movies. When I saw him at lunch, he was off to the Coliseum. Oh? But that's not the movies. That's a music hall, isn't it? 
I've heard. I've never been there in my life. I thought everyone had been to the Coliseum. Well, I haven't. Neither have I. Is that the place in the Haymarket? Do you mean to tell me, Granilo, that you have never been to the Coliseum? No, I haven't. Oh. Oh, dear, dear. <laughs> Why should he have? Oh, I really don't know. It just strikes me as um, odd. Oh. Oh. You know, I'm coming to the conclusion that there's some ulterior motive about this chest picnic. What do you mean, ulterior motive? You mean it's done purely to make you spill things over your trousers? Hmm. Something like that. Oh, I suspect much worse than that. I think they've committed a murder, and that chest is simply chock full of rotting bones. It's just the sort of thing for rotting bones, isn't it? Uh, it is, isn't it? My dear, you're right. I wouldn't let you see the inside of that chest for worlds. And don't you try to bluff me out and pretend you're willing to let me see one. But, my dear, that's just what I said I wouldn't do. Yes, but surely a murderer, having chopped up and concealed his victim in a chest, uh, wouldn't invite all his friends to come round and eat off it. Not unless he were a very stupid and conceited murderer. Very stupid and very conceited. Which, of course, he might be. In fact, it's exactly what all criminals are. Oh, no. I don't think so. Well, now how about the books? We can all go in and browse about for a bit. Excellent. Uh, uh, Brandon, you say there's a good deal of Baconian material. I Come on, Kenneth. Let's pretend we both can read. Well, books aren't exactly in my line, but I say the last P.G. Woodhouse was absolute wizard. <laughs> well, Rupert, not interested in books? Only my own. You... You look fagged out, Grano. Do I? I don't feel it. No? Look, what have you been doing with yourself? Doing with myself? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, touchy, Grano. I was sleeping most of the afternoon. Always puts me out for the rest of the day. Writing anything lately? Yes. A little thing about doves and a little thing about rain. Both good. Very good, in fact. Then, of course, I'm getting ahead with the big work. Is that going well? Oh, yes, very. Indeed, it promises to be not only the very best thing I have ever written, but the best thing I have ever read. Uh, may, may I have that ashtray, if you don't mind? I'll just reach across you. Oh! Oh, oh I'm sorry. Sorry to have bumped into you. Ah, ah. So, you and Brandon leave tonight for Oxford. That's right. Arriving about three in the morning. A peculiar form of enjoyment. Why? Lovely moonlight night. Moonlight, it's raining. It's not. Open the window and see. It is coming down. It's quite a dismal night, in fact. On such a night as this, there should be portents. Blood in the streets, you know. What do you mean, blood? Classical illusion. Oh. Uh, would you want another, Rupert? No, you go ahead. A night like this demands a stiff bracer, eh, Grano? Yeah. Uh, yes. Grano. Hello? Grano, you're wanted. In here. I'm coming. Uh, c come along, Rupert. I'm all right in here. Uh, won't you join us? Grano. Oh, no. All right. Excuse me, Rupert. Not at all. Hmm. Beg pardon, sir. Uh, oh, yes, Sabo. I must clear, sir. I'll go right ahead. Thank you, sir. Oh, it's going to be a dirty night, eh, Sabo? Yes, sir. I suppose Mr. Brandon's still going. I suppose so, sir. Uh, can I pour you some more coffee, Mr. Cadell? No, no, sir, no, thank you. Have you been getting into trouble lately, Sabo? Yes. Trouble, sir? Yeah. Trouble. What kind of trouble, sir? Why? Have you a selection? Indeed, sir. Life is full of trouble. I mean with your employers. Me, sir? <laughs> no, sir. Why should you think so, sir? Well, I telephoned this house at a quarter to eight, and I heard most hysterical noises. Noises, sir? 
I was wondering whether you were the cause of it. No, sir. I was not here till five to nine. Oh. You were perhaps at the Colosseum. Uh, pardon, sir. The Colosseum? Uh, the music hall? Yes. No, sir. I haven't been there for many years. No. Not lately? No, sir. Uh, tell me, Sabo. Mr. Brandon, has he... Mr. Brandon, sir? Yes. Mr. Brandon. What's all this about Mr. Brandon? I was asking the good Sabo whether Mr. Brandon would still travel to Oxford in all this rain. Wasn't I, Sabo? Uh, yes, sir. I hope he told you we were. Sabo, is a sherry in here? In the cabinet, sir. I'll get it. What's a little rain anyway? You'll take this inside, Sabo. That'll be all for the evening. Oh, very good, sir. Good evening, Mr. Cadell. Good evening, Sabo. Do sit down, Rupert. Your stalking about like that always makes me nervous. All right, I'll just uh, perch here on the chest. Do. It makes an admirable dais, does it not? Brandon, I just thought of something rather queer. Queer? What's that? All this talk of rotting bones in chests. What about them? Do you remember when you were an infant, Brandon? And huh? We used to sit about your father's fire and you would tell precocious stories to uh, astound your elders. Yes, I remember. Do you remember your chest complex, Brandon? My chest complex? Yes. Whatever the story was, piratical, detective, murder, adventure, or ghost, it always contained a marvelous denouement with a bloody chest containing corpses. Uh, well, well, just such a one as this one. You had a perfect mania for it. Don't you remember? Yes. I'd forgotten that. What about it, though? Oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just queer, that's all. You were a morbid child. I suppose so. Have one, Rupert? No. No, thank you. Why did you say queer? No, just queer. Us all talking tonight about rotting bones in chests. It just came back to me, that's all. Oh, I see. Well, happy days, Rupert. How... How's the old man getting on with his books? Going to take the entire library away with him, as far as I can see. I didn't know you were a book collector. What exactly is your line? Well, I've... I've theories about some of the Victorians. Everything comes round, you know, in time. For example... Well, Carlyle, for example. Theories of men who are willing to well, rise above others, you know. History is the story of remarkable men. Oh, dear Brandon, Carlyle is an unspeakable person. He's got guts, anyway. And a kind of angry righteousness which you don't get nowadays. Thank heaven. <laughs> well, I must get back to my guess. Aren't you coming, Rupert? Uh, oh, right. right. I'll get the light. Uh, oh, I've left the cigarettes. Uh, go along in, Rupert, and I'll be in in a moment. All right. First door on the passage, right? Right. Brenner! Uh, uh, what the devil are you doing in here? Tell, tell all the light, Ben. What's the matter? Tell me what's the matter. I, I thought it was him. I thought it was him. Here, drink this. Why, why were you sitting here? Why were you trying to frighten me? I wasn't trying to frighten you. I wasn't even sure it was you. Why did you want to sneak in like that? You got what you deserved. Hang you, you've upset me. I wanted to see if everything was all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be all right. Give me some more of it. Get hold of yourself. Don't get drunk on that. What's the matter? Pull yourself together. Come on, come on. You can stop it if you want to. Brando, come on. It went down the wrong way. Oh. Let's go back. Ronald's Coliseum ticket. Not so loud. I haven't got it. Don't be a fool, Grano. I gave it to you. You didn't give it to me. Grano. Oh, wait, wait. My pocket. A whiskey pocket? No. Trousers. 
It must be. Which pocket was it, Brent? Look again. No. Look in your wallet. You didn't give it to me. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. You didn't. I never had it. I gave it into your hand. Oh, see if you got it. I haven't. Look, look. In every pocket. Remember, we lifted the chest. It was right here, and I gave it to you. Brano, where is it? Where is it? Hear us. I put it in your waistcoat pocket. Where is it now? Where is it oh, now? Here, Brandon. <laughs> what have you lost? My temper, Rupert. That's all. I should think so. I heard you pounding on the chest out in the passage. I'm sorry, Grano. That's all right. That's all right. We often have outbursts, eh, Grano? About trifles. Yes. On this occasion, it was a question of a volume of Baconian research which poor old Grano couldn't produce. Odd thing to quarrel about. Yes, but we do quarrel about odd things nowadays, don't we, Grano? We do. Will you join me in another, Rupert? No, thank you. As a matter of fact, I came in here on an errand. An errand? Yes, I wanted some rope. Rope? Yes, luckily I found a piece in the hall in a vase. Just the right length, isn't it? Hello. Here we are. I thought it was coming. In a moment, Act Two of Rope, starring Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. You're listening, Victor Jory and Herd Hatfield. And here is your host, drama critic John Chapman. It's time to return to our sinister room and the even more sinister chest. An unseasonable thunderstorm has increased the already heavy tension that pervades this room as Rupert continues his offhand cross-examination of Brandon. Well, quite a storm, eh, Brandon? What... What did you want that rope for, Rupert? Well, the young people are busy, oh, doing up the old man's books, and they need a bit of rope to tie up the... Well, a bit nervous, Grano. Don't like the thunder. Where's Sebo? You'd uh, you'd better mop it up with your handkerchief. Whiskey and varnish are not the best of friends. Did you hear that, Kenneth? I'm coming. I'm just terrified of thunder, aren't you? Well, I, I wouldn't exactly say that. Be careful with the books, Kenneth. Oh, dear, it's simply coming down in sheets, isn't it? Surely you two aren't going up to Oxford tonight. Certainly we are. But you can't. You'll be flooded. Uh, did you locate a piece of rope, Cadell? Yes, sir, I did. Most conveniently tucked away in a vase in the passage. A place, huh? Uh, uh, very odd. <laughs> Not really. Sherlock Holmes kept his tobacco in a Persian slipper. Oh, so he did. All right, Kenneth. You hold the books while I manage the room. Uh, if you'll excuse me, Brandon, I'll go back to the rest of the books. Of course. Don't clean me out, sir. What? Oh, oh no, 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 of course not. Grano. What? Do tear yourself away from the sideboard and see to Sir Johnston inside. In a moment. Will you go in? Now. Just stop for a spot, that's all. He's feeling no pain, eh? Came on quickly. Grano never could hold it. Oh. Uh, listen to that one. Are you afraid of storms, Lila? It's hereditary. My mother hides in cupboards. Oh, really? If it comes on again, you shall probably all see me take a violent plunge into this chest. Can you get in or is it locked? Brandon, I said, is the chest locked? Sorry, I was looking for a match. Uh, you can get into it if you want to. Isn't there a lock on it, though? Yes, there is. But we've forgotten Rupert. He's got a murdered man in there. <laughs> That's right. Put your finger on this rope, Kenneth. The parcel won't hold still. Uh, now, he's been committing murder. <laughs> there. Now the rope's right. Isn't that right, Brandon? Ah, Lila, you don't know how near the mark you are. Oh, but I know exactly what's inside that chest. What? 
A body. A dead body. What sort? An old, old man. You did him in for the gold fillings in his teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I see you've been following me. Hmm, let's see. Oh, it is locked, isn't it? A padlock at that. What have you got in it, Brandon? You've told us. Now I'm just dying. Where's the key? Uh, in my waistcoat pocket. Well, I shan't rest till I look inside. <laughs> Hand it over. I'm hanged if I do. But why not? If you're really innocent, my dear. But I'm not. My hands are red with a crime committed less than three hours ago. If I had a strong man here, he'd force the key from you. But, um, I'll be your strong man, Lila. Now then, Brandon, hand it over, or it'll be the worse for you. <laughs> uh, come and, come and get it, Kenneth. Um, and I'll, uh, and I'll give him ten seconds, eh, Lila? Afraid, Kenneth? Oh, of course not. Um, one, two, three, four... Brandon! Five, six... Do surrender. Seven, eight... No. Nine... Ten. Oh. 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 Give it here, Brandon. No. no. What men will do for me? Come on. away from me, Kenneth. There. Oh, my, my, my arm. Oh. Oh. I, 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 I say, Brandon, you could have broken my arm, you know. Gave it an absolutely foul tug. Kenneth, I'm so sorry. Really. Uh, sorry, Lila. I tried. I think he's a beast. Only a desperate criminal. How fearfully interested in crime we all seem tonight. Why, we can't even let Brandon commit this in peace. Rupert, did you mean it before when you said you approved of murder? Yes, I suppose so. Oh, but you couldn't. Your conscience wouldn't let you. Ah, but have I a conscience? He's quite right. And for one who hasn't a conscience... I can understand murder being an entirely engrossing adventure. You mean a motiveless murder? Yes. Doing someone in for fun. What a peculiar notion of fun. The only trouble with that sort of thing is you're bound to be found out. Why should you be found out? Because, my dear Brandon, it would not be motiveless at all. It would have a quite clear motive, vanity. Such a criminal would be quite unable to keep from talking about it. He can't. He won't hide, he wants to boast. To give himself away, they always do. But suppose your murderer, I mean a really clever, brilliant and competent murderer, knew that and went out of his way not to be caught. I'm talking of a genius at it. You are. But then he couldn't help talking about the fact that he was so brilliantly clever. He'd give himself away just the same. But suppose that he was so very... Beg your pardon, Brandon. Of course, Sir Johnston. I must be off, and I should like to use your phone, if I may. Of course. On the table, sir. Thank you. Grosvenor 8432. Yes. It's about time I'm off, Brandon. Uh, can I drop you somewhere? Uh, hello? Oh, no, thank you. Oh, oh is that you, my dear? I'll get a cab. Well, it's no trouble. No, he's not here. But, uh... I, I I thought he 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 was home. Yes, yes. I I I'll be along soon. Bye, uh, Lila. Yes, Sir Johnston. Uh, Ronald uh, hasn't come back. You said he'd been to the Coliseum tonight, sir. Mm, uh, that's right. The bill was over two hours ago. Mm, he was expected back for tea. Uh, uh, my wife is worried. Well, he probably had trouble getting a cab in the rain. He'll be there when you get home. Yes, yes, I, I expect so. I have your hats and coats in the hall. I... I've never known Ronald to fail an appointment. Very odd. Well, thank you for a charming evening. I shall always remember it when I read the books you so kindly gave me. No pleasure, sir. I'll help you on with your things. Good night, Mr. Cadell. Oh, but I'm leaving now as well. Night, Brandon. Good night. Good night, night, my boy. Good night. They're gone. Gone. Grano, I think I'll sit down. Well, well, 
I've got to have another, Brandon. I thought he'd got onto it. Who? Rupert? So did I. For a few moments. But that's what gave spice to the evening. <laughs> he hadn't. You sure he hadn't? Quite sure. I sometimes rather wish he had. If he had been in on this, you wouldn't have gotten drunk, Grana. I'm not drunk. A little blurred, that's all. That's all. What's it? What? Thought I heard something. Oh, be yourself, Grana. I thought it was the bell. Well, what of it? I'll go. Pour me a drink, will you, Grana? Oh. Oh, Rupert. I left my cigarette case, Brandon. I don't suppose you've seen it? No. No, I haven't. May I come in and look about? Of course. Grano, Rupert's forgotten his cigarette case. As a matter of fact, I... <laughs> I thought you might give me another drink. Mind if I sit down? No. Soda, Rupert? Uh, a splash. Cigarette, Brandon. Oh, 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 fancy. I had the case in my pocket all the time. Oh, here's your drink. Ah. Well, would you mind turning off the big light, eh? What's wrong with the light? You see, I'm a creature of half-lights. They make me more comfortable. I hope you're, you're not going to make yourself too comfortable, Rupert. You know we've got to be off before long. Oh, yes. What's the time? Um, 25 to 11. Oh. Well, I expect you're wanting to get rid of me. Not at all, Rupert. I hope not. I'm full of melancholy. And I don't want to go home. You must bear with me. It's been a strange evening. Strange evening? Why? Why strange? I can't tell you that's my trouble. I suppose it's the thunder and one thing and another... Thunder always upsets me. Besides, I'm always melancholy at this hour. Five and twenty to eleven. It's a curious hour. Did you ever read Goldsmith's Night Piece? No. I can't actually recall it. No. You should. It's about the city at night. I shall do his night piece up to date one of these days and... I shall make it five and twenty to eleven. It's a wonderful hour. I'm particularly susceptible to it. Why so wonderful? Oh, because it is. I think the hour when London asks why, when it wants to know what it's all about, when the tedium... And activity and the folly of pleasure are equally transparent. It is the hour of winking advertisement signs and taxis and buses, traffic blocks. It is the hour when jaded London theater audiences are settling down in the darkness to the last acts of plays, of which they know they knew more only too well. They know that when the curtain's down, it'll be just a question of... God save the queen, and they'll be bundled out into the chilly and possibly rainy night where they'll have to fight for taxis or rush for trains or somehow transport themselves home to a coal supper. And the prospect of another day tomorrow, exactly similar to that which has passed. For others, further horrors are waiting the nightclubs and cabarets have not yet begun, but they will do so very soon. I could enlarge upon the idea indefinitely. Five and twenty to eleven. A horrible hour. A macabre hour. 
For it is not only the hour of pleasure ended, it is the hour when pleasure has been found wanting. There. That's what this hour means to me. And it has, moreover, been thundery. Five and twenty to eleven. Yes, Rupert. But by the time you have finished making your speech, it will be eleven o'clock. In brief, my dear Rupert, you see no earthly object in living. I fear not. Do you? I? Yes. Of course I do. But then I'm interested in things. Why don't you take up exploring, or cricket, or making love, or golf, or finance, or lecturing? Or as you suggested this evening, murder. Or as you say, murder. And now, Rupert, if you've finished your drink, we've really got a bit of packing to do. You can't be so cruel. It's raining out. Can't I have another drink? Certainly, Rupert, but Granu and I really must pack. Well, can't I stay and watch you? You know, I believe you're a bit blotto tonight, too. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. I'll tell you what, I'll stay and see you off. Pour me another drink, Brendan. You've had enough. Mind your own business. Well, Rupert, it doesn't look as if we'll get off with Grano in this state at all. I'm perfectly sober. Grano. Why does he want to stay and see us off? That's what I want to know. My dear Grano, Rupert has no earthly reason for staying. Come along, Rupert. Finish up now and let me take care of him. Oh, I've got to go then. What do you mean, Rupert? You've got to go. <laughs> I don't want you to go. You don't? No. All right, then. I'll stay. Don't bother. I'll mix myself another drink. You're in a queer mood tonight, Rupert. One has inspirations, you know. Well... Cheers. I shan't be long now. No hurry. Mind if I clear? You know, I don't feel like driving tonight after all. No, there's something in the air tonight. Did you notice Sir Johnson's exit? No. What about it? Rather subdued, I thought. And pathetic. Oh, uh, Grano, I believe this is yours. What? This, this little blue ticket to the Coliseum, I fancy. He's got it. Brendan, he's got it. Hold your tongue, Grano. I believe it came from your waistcoat pocket, Grano. No. It was sticking out, you know, and I... Uh, no. I acquired it uh, from you shortly after... Some... He's got it. He's got it. Quiet, no. Grano. Quiet. Hold your tongue. <laughs> Rupert, Grano is obviously upset. Would you oblige me by leaving us? Why don't you tell me your trouble, Brandon? I might be able to help. Are you going or are you not? No, Brandon. I'm not. You see, I'm rather awkwardly situated. You are something more than that, my friend. Oh? How's that? You are very dangerously situated. Uh, perhaps not. I have a revolver, Brandon. It's loaded. Oh? With the safety off, you observe. I see Besides, it. Besides, I have a far greater weapon here. What's that? A whistle. A policeman gave it to me. I think we need a bit of air. And when did he give it to you? Right after I left here. Before I came back for my, uh, cigarette case. He's waiting at the corner within, within earshot. What do you want from me, Rupert? The truth about this blue ticket and about that chest. The truth? What do you mean? Rupert, if you're hopeless, hopelessly drunk, you, you'd better go home. I mean, it's more than suspicion. Brandon, I phoned this house at a quarter of nine and heard Grano crying there, crying for the dark. <laughs> Good heavens, what do you suspect? Murder. The murder of Ronald Kentley. <laughs> Rupert, hear that, Grano. He suspects us of murder. It's too rich. Are you trying to bluff me? Bluff you, you drunken sot. Get on out of here. Blow your little whistle. Bring in your policeman. Get out. Do what you like. What I like, I should like to see inside of that chest. See the inside of that chest. You can see the inside of 50 chests. Now get on out. You're drunk. Possibly. Nevertheless, may I look inside that chest? Yes. Very well. I will. Go on. 
What are you waiting for? Keep back. Sit down. Sit down in that chair. Sit down. Now the chest. It's uh, locked. Padlocked. What of it? Where's the key? I don't know. Why should I know? Upstairs, I think. Upstairs? Shall I go get it? Stay seated, Brandon. Pray. I can shoot the lock off. Must I? Must I? Here's your key. Here. Thank you. Now look and get what's coming to you. Thank you. Get back in that chair. You'll be sorry, Rupert. You'll be sorry. Sit down. Talk to your poor Ronald Kentley. What had he done to you? Rupert, listen. Listen to me. I want to explain. Explain? I'm at your mercy now. I can explain. Judge me, but listen. Well, Rupert, you're an enlightened man, aren't you? Yes. It's in your power to have me hang. Yes. Remember our talk tonight about the old Bailey and justice? Well, you said it yourself. You wouldn't be giving us up to justice. And something else. You're not a man of morals, are you? No, I'm not. Now, listen, Rupert, listen. We have done this thing, Grano and I, for adventure and danger. You read Nietzsche, don't you, Rupert? Yes. He tells us to live dangerously. You know he has no more respect for individual life than you. He tells us to live dangerously, and we have. We've done this thing. Others only talk. Do you understand? Listen, Rupert, you're the one man to understand. You can't give us up. Two lives can't recall one. Our lives are in your hands. You can't kill us. You can't kill. You're not a murderer, Rupert. What are you? You are not a slave to your time. In the days of the Borgias, you'd have thought nothing of this. You're an emancipated man. You can't give us up. Rupert, you can't. You brought up my own words to my face. And a man should stand by his words... I'll never trust in logic again, ever. You imply I hold life cheap. You're right. Your own included. What do you mean? I mean... I mean you've taken by strangulation a very harmless and helpless fellow creature of 20 years. I mean that in that chest now lie the staring and futile remains of something that four hours ago lived and laughed. And ran and found it good. Laughter you could never laugh. And ran as you could never run. I mean that for your cruel and scheming pleasure, you have committed a sin and bla- blasphemy against that very life which you now find so precious. And you have done more than this. You have not only killed him, you have rotted the lives of all those to whom he was dear. You've dragged here his father, an equally harmless old man, and a girl who loved him, and a friend, and played on him tonight an infamous lewd jest, and a bad jest of that. And if you think, as your type of philosopher generally does, that all life is nothing but a bad jest, then you will now have the pleasure of seeing it played upon yourselves. What are you saying? What are you doing? It's not what I'm doing, Brandon. It's what society is going to do. And what will happen to you at the hands of society, I cannot say. But I can give you a pretty shrewd guess. Rupert! Rupert, no! You are going to hang, you swine. Hang, both of you! You have just heard the best plays production of Rope by Patrick Hamilton, starring Herd Hatfield and Victor Jory. And here again is your host, drama critic John Chapman. I suppose there are two morals to this excellent melodrama. 
It's been very well played by Mr. Hatfield and Mr. Jory and their company. I'd say that one of the morals is that murder is nasty business. And the other one is that very often it makes for good theater, as it has this evening, I think. And now, let's think about next week. We like to mix our plays up on this program. So the next one will be a comedy. Samson Raffleson's Skylark, which was a great success for the late Gertrude Lawrence and Donald Cook. Mr. Cook will be playing his original role for us. And Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Havoc. This is Chapman saying goodbye until next Friday. Again, may we call your attention to next week's program on best plays, the comedy, the gay comedy of Samson Rachelson Skylark. The parts will be played by Donald Cook, who appeared in the original role, and Miss Lawrence's part will be played by June Happen. You're most cordially invited to attend next week at the same time for best plays. Rope by Patrick Hamilton was adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. In the cast were heard Hatfield as Brandon, Victor Jory as Rupert, Lloyd Bachner as Grenelow, William Podmore as Sabot, Ivor Francis as Raglan, Deirdre Owens as Lila, and Guy Spall as Sir Johnston. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Fred Way. This is Robert Denton speaking. Well, that's just about... This is the story. Stories of people, of nations, of the world, of yesterday and today, and the meaning they hold for tomorrow. Let me introduce myself. Walt Whitman's the name, a reporter by trade, a loafer by inclination, and a poet by accident. In my day, during the middle 1800s, America was growing so fast it bust out of its britches every six months. And the only reason men wore their hair so long was because nobody had time for a shave and a haircut. It was like being on an express train where people would say, this is a nice town we're coming to, wasn't it? But there's only one trouble with people in a hurry. They usually forget something. And this time, people forgot America. Hear it, Walt. Hear it. I told you it would work. Now we can get our news direct to the editorial office. What good is a telegraph key, Jeff, if you can't decipher the babbling instrument? Oh, that's easy. G. G. Behold, the instrument is spoken. G. O. L. D. Gold. That's a fine start, Jeff. V. E. R. E. Discovered. Gold discovered. Who says the days of miracles are past? Wait. Gold discovered in C. A. L. -I -F in California. Mexicans out, Americans in, and pronto, old discovered. Hey, Jeff, where do you think you're going? Out to tell the boys. The boys will have to wait. If they want news, they'll have to read it in our paper. Um, hello, uh, Walt. Interrupting? Not at all, Coatsman. Just toss those books on the floor and sit down. Don't matter, I'll stand. Walt, I want to talk to you. Well, say something. Thought you said you wanted to do that, Colton. Walt, when I bought part ownership of this paper, I thought you were the best editor in Brooklyn. And I still do, believe it or not. Are you telling me or challenging me, Colton? All I'm trying to tell you, Walt, is 
What's the idea behind an editorial like this one here in today's paper? On the gold rush? Yes. The rush for California gold is as ignoble a scramble for pennies as it is indicative of a weakness and a greed in our national character. You wrote that, didn't you? Uh, did I? Who else around this office has a vocabulary of more than six words? Webster. I'm not asking for sarcasm. I'm asking for an explanation. Here's another item. Yesterday, our country was excited over a tremendous moral issue, slavery. And with so much attention and thought, it seemed the issue might at last be solved. Today, all this is forgotten. Honest citizens have dropped their honest jobs and rushed pell-mell to seek for pots of gold at the end of rainbows. <laughs> Didn't know you could read so well, Colson. You know this paper's policy, Walt. Sure. And I know my own policy, too. What's that, may I ask? Don't write what you don't believe. You can at least be more polite. I can't be polite to slavery. Walt, I'm completely dissatisfied. Well, so am I. It so happens this country's sitting on a powder keg labeled slave question. That's more important than you or me or your piddling newspaper. Whitman, I've tried to be open-minded Just about... Just a minute. Jeff, bring over that envelope I left on Mr. Colson's desk. Sure, Walt. I'm not interested in envelopes, Whitman. Stay hey, honest, Colson. I pay you to edit the paper and you spend your time writing me letters. I'll save you the trouble of reading it, Colson. It can all be boiled down to half a dozen immortal American words. You can't fire me. I quit. That was a fine supper, Ma. <laughs> Well, a man with your appetite say that to anything, Walt. Uh, you made your mind up about helping me build that house, Walt. He's had enough time lying on the beach and just gazing at the ocean. Hush up, George. <laughs> well, what do you say, Walt? Sure, I'll help you, Pa, but only part-time. Huh? Part-time? Why, got another job? Yep. Well, you're the silent one. Why don't you tell us? What's the job? Writing some poems. For who? You. Me. Everybody. America. <laughs> George! <laughs> I wish you'd think a bit before you open that big mouth. Poetry for you, me, and America. Pass me those toothpicks, Ma. How oh, come, Walt? Well, Pa, there's two reasons. First of all, America doesn't have much poetry of her own. Just fancy imported European stuff full of fuss and highfalutin talk. And uh, what's the second reason? Well, that's harder to explain, Pa. You see, America's sort of like a big kid, all brawn and brag. Well, that's important because we're growing. But I think somebody has to holler out every so often. Just remember, America, you can't eat gold and timber and railroads. You can't preserve a free government with just brag. Take it easy. Remember, you've gotten yourself hitched up to a star called Liberty. But if you don't watch out, you're going to trip over the Milky Way. Maybe you have the gut. But don't forget, it takes a heart and spirit to make a complete man. You, you want to say all that, Walt? <laughs> Pretty much all of it, Ma. You don't need a poem, Walt. You need a rooftop. My mother was only half right. I needed more than a poem or a rooftop. I needed readers. I set up the print and published the first book of my poems, Leaves of Grass, myself. And people bought copies the way they might buy 50 cent pieces on sale for a dollar. Poetry is like a musical concert. You need a good audience to complete the job. But one day, while I was at home... Pardon me, does... Why, you're Walt Whitman, aren't you? Yes, I am. I recognize the beard. Let me introduce myself. Oh, wait, wait. Your face. Why, you're... That's right. Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson. First time I've ever heard my name used as a battle cry. Why, your name's been like a flag to me. I march behind it. I see your hat's on. Were you going marching? <laughs> no, just an ordinary walk this time. May I join you? Sure. I have a lecture in New York tonight, but I thought I'd stop and see you first. Huh? I got that copy of Leaves of Grass you sent me. Sent you the first copy off the press. Uh, what did you think of it? Hello there, Walt. Oh, hello, Jack. How's Helen? Oh, Doc says another week in bed, and she'll be fit as a fiddle and skipping rope. Again. Good. I'll be up to see her later. Bye. Bye now. You know, Whitman, you look like your poetry reads. How's that? You're big, powerful. 
You're a walk-eating barn dog. <laughs> With the accompanying odor? Oh. Hello, Walt! Hello, horse! Why don't you come over Manhattan more often? Walt, we got whiskey there that burns all the way down. I'll take you up on that horse! Oh! <laughs> that little horse. We call his older brother Big Horse. <laughs> you know, a man's nickname is more important than his given name. It labels his character, describes him to the world. You know these people, these everyday people, very well, don't you? Well, they're the only kind I do know. That's why you write about them so well. I will sing the song of companionship. And who but I should be the poet of comrades? Hey, Mr. Emerson, if you're going to quote my poetry, you'll need a drink. What do you say to a beer in here? Uh, I'll say again. Just one, though. Hey, I forgot to ask. Uh, how'd you like my book? Mr. Whitman, your book is the most extraordinary p- piece of wit and wisdom America has yet contributed. It not only encourages, it fortifies. You you mean that? Sincerely. One beer? Why, that calls for a whole round of beer. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of America's most eminent literary men, liked my book. I knew that a door I thought closed was really open. And I could walk forth into the sun. And so between jobs of writing newspaper articles, I kept writing poems about people, about Manhattan, and most of all, about America. But then, in 1860... What, Sumter? Fired on by southern troops. Hey, Pa, we're going to go to war. You've enlisted, George? A man with a Quaker upbringing? Sure, I've enlisted. You're 42, you wouldn't understand. I always thought you hated slavery. I do. But do you think we'll solve everything by killing our own people in the South? What other way is there? Fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight, not as President of the United States, but as a man humbled before the great sorrow of carrying through a necessary, though terrible task. The battle has begun, and our nation is embarked upon days which yet may be. Telegraph message for Mrs. Louisa Whitman. I'll take it, son. Any answer? My son, George Anderson. Is there any answer? What? If you want to send an answer, I'll write it down. Yeah, sure. Arriving Washington Hospital Friday. Courage. All our love. Walt. thought that as soon as I reached the capital, I would go directly to the hospital. But when I got there, I found that every other building was a hospital. I learned that my brother's regiment was only about 12 miles away at the Virginia front. And I got a pass to visit him there because the line was temporarily quiet. And then a new nightmare began. Pardon me, soldier. Huh? Which way to the 51st New York Volunteers? Down around the next band. Thanks. Thanks very much. What's the matter, soldier? Hit? Yes. My leg. Uh, here, I'll help you through it. A... No, no. Plenty worse than me. He's over there. Shot for the stomach. I'll see. Here he is. Soldier. Soldier. Oh. Can't help him anymore. Poor fellow. Dead? Great, so. He was my brother. My youngest brother. There had been a skirmish that afternoon. And all that terrible night, I kept stumbling across more wounded men. It wasn't until dawn... Walt! Hey, Walt! George! I thought I recognized that beard. Where the devil did you come from? Your face, the, the bandit. Ah, that's nothing. Hey, Osmond. Um, I 
Then I kept seeing her dying. Ah, uh, they haven't got my number yet. Gosh, it's good to see you. Come on over my tent. You're still writing poetry? No. More important things to do now. Good morning, my nurse. Oh, good morning, Mr. Whitman. Going to play your melodeon for us again this morning? Yep, the boys have asked me to. Uh, who's the lowest this morning? New boy. Bed nine. Both legs amputated. Gangrene set in. Bed nine, I'll see him. Morning, Will. Hello, Jim. Orange is getting scarce. I brought you only one today. Here. Catch. Oh, got it, Dave. Hello, Will. Hello, yourself. Hey, can I see you later about that letter? I'll be there with bells on. Hey, good morning, Will. Good morning, Jonathan. Here's your hometown newspaper, I promise. Oh, gee, thanks, Walt. And how are you today, you bandy-legged horse thief? Don't you growl at me, you con-scarn grizzly bar. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how you, Walt? Hey, hey, look, my mom, I finally had the baby. Uh, honest, fellas, look, a you baby. Here in the paper I just got you want to see. Who says I'm a grizzly bear? I'm a blamed 200-pound store. <laughs> <laughs> At nine. What's your name, son? Roger Sloan, sir. Mind if I sit down here? Oh, I'd be pleased to have you, sir. <sighs> and drop that, sir. Everybody and his brother calls me Walt. All right. <laughs> they call me Slim. It's because I was always so darn thin. Thanks for stopping here. Why? Didn't you expect me to? I'm a Confederate soldier. Your own side comes first. Both sides are my side, Slim. Uh, drink of water? No, thanks. I'm chilly now. It's crazy. First I get hot, and then I'm chilly. That's the fever, I guess. That melodeon plays pretty nice, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, how old are you, Slim? Twenty-one. And when's your 17th birthday? August 3rd. <laughs> Don't go on. I fall into that trap every time. You know why I'm asking all these questions? Sure. I heard the other men say you wrote letters to the folks so they wouldn't be listed as just missing. Oh? What shall I write to your folks? Oh, that I'm being treated well and think of them all, especially Sarah Ann. Better not mention my legs. Oh, I won't. <laughs> oh, don't. I'm not. Man isn't any less a man because he can't walk, you know? Can, can I have a glass of cold water now? I feel feverish all of a sudden. Sure. Here. I'll hold it for you. Wait. Wait. Bring in that... Fold a white screen down the aisle. When they put that around a man's bed. That means the end, doesn't it? Not always. Not always, Slim. They're bringing the screen this way, Walt. Walt, they're bringing it this way. Pardon us, please. We uh, we just want to stand this around the bed. Steady, Slim. When you write them, tell them. Here. Let me wipe your head. Melodian. My sister used to play one back home. Oh, you, you'll see them again, Slim. You can't lose a battle until you surrender. Under my pillow, you'll find a little Bible with your ledges. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. To carry my boy through till he comes home again, Mother. She has nice handwriting. She wrote that just before I left. What? Oh, I don't want to die. You won't. You won't. You'll be all right. Remember this part. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guided me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I 
opened my notebook again. And on the last page I wrote, my songs cease. I abandoned them. From behind the screen where I hid, I advanced personally to you. Camarado, this is no book. Who touches this? Touches a man. After Slim came thousands more like him. Every year the boys in new uniforms were getting younger. Bull Run. Chancellorsville. Gettysburg. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people. Well, well, we haven't seen you in such a long time, Walt. Uh, I've been pretty sick. Infected hand. Oh, yes, I heard about that. As I was saying to uh, Mrs. Mrs. O'Connor, will you forgive me if I rush off? But what's the hurry, Walt? I've got to keep my daily appointment with the president. Hey, here comes Abe now! Look very tired, don't he? Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, sir. John, who is that big fellow with a beard who says hello every morning? A fellow named Walt Whitman, sir. He radiates vitality the way a stove radiates warmth. He's helped lots of wounded men think about living again instead of dying. Mm, I can see how, too. Well, you know, John, his hello every morning sort of makes me feel I'm shaking hands with the American people. <laughs> day, I walked past the White House when Abe, I called him Abe in my mind like everyone else, when Abe went for his daily ride, I watched the carved lines of his face grow deeper month by month, as though the war were an acid that ate away even his iron courage. And then suddenly, Grant and Lee were meeting at Appomattox. <laughs> we knew it, the war was over. The great brass tongues of church bells sang out the joy that swept the nation. The bayonets could gather dust. The cannon balls turned to rust. The war was over! Oh, Captain. My Captain. Our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel. The vessel grim and daring. But oh heart. Heart, heart. Oh, the bleeding drops of red. Where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Polishing those glasses no, and no. shake hands. Wait, Grace, but it's good to see you again. Here, sit down, sit down, sit down here. Oh, you're looking fine, <laughs> Walt. I see your business looks fine, too, Papa Pop. Full house tonight. Business? Oh, say, let's talk about you, Walt. Any of the old gang around? I'd like to see him. Sure, we're over there. Henry, 
Henry is a Charlie Look who's here. Stand up, Rolf. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> See, Rolf Wittmann is back in Manhattan. Hello, folks. <laughs> with one at a time. This calls for beer, Papa Flavio. Beer? Beer, you insult me. Champagne it is. This calls for bubbles, not for foam. <laughs> I get it myself. <laughs> Same old Papa Flav, all right. So the prodigal son is back in his native town. Back to Manhattan, sadder and wiser, as the old folks say. How long, Walt? Don't know myself, Charlie. All right, gang, let's ask him all together. Ready? Still, still writing, writing poetry? <laughs> yeah, still writing. But a different kind this time. Yeah, the war changed your tune, eh? More than that, Harry. I learned what it felt like to lose all your faith, all your hope, and worst of all, all your courage. Yeah, four years of war did that to all of us, Walt, all over the country. I know. We were swaggering toward the 20th century with plenty of elbow room and jeans full of silver dollars. We had no tolerance and no compassion. I guess the war taught us both. We can still taste the blood and tears. And that's what you're going to write? No, that's past. Coming over on the ferry boat from Brooklyn, I saw the towers of Manhattan outlined against the sky. Fingers pointing toward God. We're older now and wiser, I hope. And we've got to learn a new faith in ourselves. A new belief that what we're doing is important. Not only to us right here and now, but to the whole world for generations to come. Well, here we are. Here ah. we are. Bertha, set out the glasses. Well, we made it, by gosh. Real champagne. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait now. Now we drink to Walt. Walt? Oh, soll sie leben. Oh, soll sie leben. May you live high with love and happiness. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, folks. Thanks, but I'd like to change that. Let's drink to America and her future. One song, America, before I go... I'd sing o'er all the rest with trumpet sound for thee, the future. Oh, I see flashing that this America is only you and me. Its Congress is you and me. The officers, capitals, armies, ships are you and me. Past, present, and future are you and me. What whispers are these, O oh, lands, running ahead of you, passing under the sea? Are all the nations communing? Is there going to be but one heart to the globe? Turn your undying face to where the future, greater than all the past, is swiftly, surely preparing for you. Thunder on. Stride on. Democracy. You have been listening to This is the Story, one of a series of radio dramas selected and rebroadcast for the men and women of the American Armed Forces in every overseas theater of operation. Stories of the free people, of the free nations of the world.
This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. G. Marshall. This is our bicentennial year, a time to pause and count our blessings. And among the greatest of these are the men and women of letters who flourished in our native land, who created a literature that was both typically American and universally admired. After all, it was our own Edgar Allan Poe who invented the kind of stories you hear on this program, and our own Mark Twain who carried them to the most sublime heights of fantasy and fun. At this time, we propose to give you an exhilarating taste of one of the most exciting stories of fantasy, mystery, and suspense the world has ever known. Tell the king that if I am not released from this dungeon immediately, I shall cause a mighty calamity to befall this realm. Oh, please, sir, have mercy. Tell the king that I can call forth my magic powers and destroy the sun. Destroy the sun? But... But what? Well, how can a man destroy the sun? It it cannot be done. Clarence, my boy, look at me. Do I look stupid? Oh, no, sir. Then, if it can't be done, why would I be willing to bet my life I can do it? Our mystery drama, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was adapted from the Mark Twain classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Sam Dan, and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Luden's Medicated Cough Drops. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Right now, True Value Hardware Stores offer you what's missing from almost everybody's life at this time of year. Sunlight and warmth. 
Hi, Pat Summerall to tell you they offer a General Electric sun lamp kit and a Titan radiant heater. The GE sun lamp is for fun and relaxation. Its ultraviolet light gives you a healthy, natural tan, even now when it's too cold for most of us to sit out in the sun. Get the lamp, a clamp-on holder, and a safety guard, and a sun worshiper's guide, all for just thirteen seventy-seven. And True Value Hardware Stores offer the Titan Radiant Heater for warmth. It's designed for use in barns, garages, and chilly basement workshops, so you can work in comfort, even in the cold. It gives you two fan-forced heat ranges controlled by an automatic thermostat. It's portable, and you can mount it overhead, too, out of the way. It's just nineteen eighty-eight. The GE Sun Lamp Kit and the Titan Radiant Heater. Sunlight and warmth from your participating True Value Hardware Store. And you can charge it on Master Charge at many stores. Here's a tip from your Better Business Bureau on the metric system. You know, use of the metric system as a uniform system of measurement in this country is growing rapidly. But, of course, you want to know how it will affect you, right? Well, take driving your car, for example. The kilometer will replace the mile in expressing distances. Right now, one mile is equal to 1,760 yards or 5,280 feet. Now, isn't it easier to remember that one kilometer is equal to 1,000 meters? Your car's speedometer will also change from miles per hour to kilometers per hour. So will speed limit signs on the highways. And again, the standard unit of measure will be the meter. And so when you order a tank full of gas, the liquid measure will be in liters, not gallons. For example, a fill-up of 16 gallons is equal to 60 liters. For more information on the metric system, write to Metric Information Office, National Bureau of Standards, Washington, D.C. Mark Twain begins his story with these words. It was in Warwick Castle that I came across a curious stranger. He attracted me by his candid simplicity, his marvelous familiarity with ancient armor, and the restfulness of his company. I thought I would tell you my story, but I kept a journal. Oh, how long ago that was. Do you know about transmigration of souls? Do you know about transposition of eras and bodies? Ah, well, read and learn. He was gone. I examined the sheaf of papers he had left with me. Most of it was parchment, yellow with age. Old, old, incredibly old. Carefully, as I feared they would crumble within my fingers, I began to turn the pages. And now begins this stranger's story. I'm an American. Born and reared in Hartford in the state of Connecticut. A Yankee of the Yankees. My father was a blacksmith. My uncle was a horse doctor. And I was both at first. Then I went over to the great arms factory and I learned how to make everything. Guns, boilers, engine, just about any and every kind of machinery you can imagine. I had a couple of thousand men working for me. But although they were under my jurisdiction, they refused to be under my thumb... You there. Shut that machine down. Who says so? I say so. Well, what do you think you are? I'm the boss. Well, why didn't you go soak your head? I'm giving you an order. I don't take orders from you. How about this kind of an order? Ow. Now, shut that machine down. Well, you see, you couldn't explain to him he was doing the wrong thing and wasting company time and material. So I had to develop other methods of communication. Well, that worked out pretty good for a while. But as the good book says, he who lives by the fist. We had a big, sulky fellow named, aptly enough, Hercules. A surly brute he was. <laughs> Everybody left him strictly alone. I should have left him alone, too. But I had to prove who was boss. Oh, he laid me out with a crusher alongside the head that made everything inside crack. It seemed to spring every joint in my skull. And then suddenly the world went out in darkness. When I came to, 
I was sitting under an oak in the midst of a broad and beautiful country landscape. And there was a fellow on a horse looking down at me. A fellow fresh out of a picture book. In old-time armor from head to heel, with a sword and a shield and a prodigious spear. His horse had armor on, too, with red and green trappings that hung all around him. Oh, it was all gorgeous to look at. And then this... this apparition spoke to me. Spare, sir! Who? Spare, sir! Will ye joust? Will I which? Will ye try a passage of arms? Will I what? For land or lady or knightly honor? What are you giving me? Get along back to your circus before I report you. Sir, thy incivil, discourteous, and unmannerly answer shall receive the chastisement it so richly deserves. <laughs> and don't hurry back. As he galloped off, I thought I'd seen the last of him. But wouldn't you know, he suddenly turned around, came a-rushing back with his long spear pointed straight at me. I saw he meant business, and so I was up the tree when he arrived. Violet, stand and fight! Now, friend, I don't have any real quarrel with you. Wilt thou tilt with the lads? What makes me think he's from a circus? Then draw thy sword. He has to be from an asylum. Cowardly wretch! Uh, and so I'd better humor him. Uh, friend... I be not friend of thine. Can't we discuss this reasonably? Dost thou acknowledge thyself captive of my sword and spear? Absolutely, and I'll be sure to acknowledge it to your keeper. But of a surety, thou must this acknowledge to my keeper and thine, his beloved majesty, King Arthur. How far are we from Bridgeport? Bridgeport? Uh. I wit not the name. Come. We hide toward Camelot. Camelot? <laughs> You're kidding. Of a surety, Varlis, thou art most free with thy tongue, and thou speakest the strangest language. Camelot. Camelot. I repeated the word over and over. Camelot was probably the name of the asylum from which this lunatic had escaped. Well, I walked along beside his horse, hoping, expecting at any minute to see a familiar sign. And without warning, there stood in front of me a huge castle, with flags and banners flying from the towers. I stopped. I was almost petrified with shock, because I could see the place was filled with people dressed in the most outlandish costumes. And when they saw me, they were almost struck dumb with fright. Fear not, gentle folk. This dark and evil magician can do no further harm. I have vanquished him in terrible combat. Let us now throw him into the dungeon to await the pleasure of the king. And they did it. Into a damp, dark, foul-smelling cell. And I didn't know what to think. Yes, I did. This could only be a dream. A dream that I had actually been somehow hurled back in time into King Arthur's court, a place I had hardly ever thought about or, to tell the truth, cared very much for. And then the cell door was opened, and in came a slim young fellow in shrimp-colored tights that made him look like a forked carrot. The rest of him was all blue silk and yellow lace. He looked at me, and he said, I have come for you. I'm a page. Go along. You ain't more than a paragraph. <laughs> Indeed, thou speakest a foreign tongue. Uh, what is thy name? From whence dost thou come? Ah, oh, and thy raiment. Such outlandish clothes. Well, friend, do me a service. Do you belong to the asylum or are... Uh... Fair sir, me seemeth... That'll do, thou... that'll do. You're a patient. Oh, if I could just see the head keeper for a minute. Just for a minute. Head keeper? Oh, but that is a passing strange way to refer to his majesty. Clarence. Uh, I am called Amias Le Poulet. Oh, well, I'll call you Clarence for short. You look like a good-hearted fella. Yes, tis true. And it shall be my undoing. For I was born in an unlucky year. No, there's no such thing as an unlucky year. Oh, indeed there is. Thirteen is most unfortunate. And I was born in 513. Wherefore, it is well known. Oh, wait. Clarence. Hold. Stop. Say it again. 
and say it slow. What year was that? 513. 513. <laughs> you uh, don't look it. Now, come, my boy. I am a stranger and friendless. Be honest and honorable. Are you in your right mind? Forsooth. Mm, never mind that. Either I've become a lunatic or something just as awful has happened. Now tell me, on, honest and true, now, honest and true, mm -hmm. where am I? In King Arthur's court, and it please you. And it please me. Oh, well. Uh, and uh, according to your notions, uh, what year is it now? 538, 19th day of June. No, 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 it can't be. You mean to tell me that I... I'll never see my friends again. Never again? Perhaps the divine will shall permit thee to. Well, how? They won't be born for 1,300 years. Please, good sir, be of merry countenance. Oh, merry countenance. Do you realize? Wait, 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 Clarence. What virtue are we Yankees celebrated for throughout the civilized world? Uh, mayhap I have not heard. Thrift, Clarence. Thrift. Hmm. Now your true Yankee never throws anything away. Because you can never tell when it'll come in handy. I happened to read one time that the only total eclipse of the sun during the first half of the 6th century occurred on June 21st, 538 A.D. at exactly three minutes after noon. Uh, eclipse? <laughs> Good, sir. Yes, sir, Clarence. Eclipse. Eclipse. <laughs> Is it for adventure something good to now, eat? Now, ask me how I intend to use that seemingly unimportant, insignificant, no-account, irrelevant little fact. Ask me. If it please you, sir. Mm -hmm. You say this is the 19th of June, 538? Well, Clarence, I say it's the 19th of June, 1879. What magic dost thou speak, sir? In either case, it... the day after tomorrow has to be the 21st. No eclipse is scheduled at all in 1879. Therefore, if we do have one, uh, it's no dream, Clarence. It's no dream. Come, sir. It is the signal that the dinner is done at the round table, and my master and thine, Sir Kay, desires to show thee before the king in the court. Sir Kay? Yes, sir. And what plans does Brother K have for me? Oh, sir, just not no humble monk is he. Sir K is foster brother to our liege, King Arthur himself. He will have thee kept here till thy friends ransom thee. Clarence, none of my friends have been born yet. Oh, <laughs> sir, speak not such madness. All right, let's go. Get the exhibition over with. And what if I am among lunatics? I'm smart enough to become boss of the asylum. Boss? Ah, is that thy name? Sir Boss! King Arthur's Court. How do I describe it? An immense place filled with loud contrasts, a babble of sound, a rainbow of color. The place was a madhouse, and at the center, a round table... And around it sat a great company of men dressed in splendid hues. Well, finally the king raised his hand, and it must have been a signal for silence. Sir Kay, my good brother. Yes, your majesty. Is this the sorcerer? It is even true, my liege. Yes, it must be true. Who but a sorcerer would wear such outlandish clothing? This suit cost $15. Second hand. The suit is one of enchantment. Who's that? That's a, that's Merlin, sir. Merlin? Merlin, the mighty magician whom all men fear. The suit is one of enchantment. I behold in him a creature of the devil. A creature of the devil? Your Majesty, I see the devil emanate from his body. Burn him. Well, then, if it must be done... It must be done, Your Majesty. Then let it be done day after tomorrow, the 21st day of the month, at high noon. This is not the, um, the usual manner. They do not kill. They hold for ransom. Well, Clarence, don't worry about it. Well, you say I'm not to worry, but they burn me at the stake high noon the day after tomorrow. No, Clarence. They won't be able to swing it. Swing? No, you see, I won't be here. Well... 
I wit not what thou sayest, Sir Boss. Where shalt thou be? In Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, is, is that the place of magic and enchantment where Sir Kay captured thee? Oh, it's a place of magic and enchantment, I guess. In some ways. But, but dost thou intend to return there? Oh, I don't have to return. I never left. Uh, <laughs> Sir Boss, my poor wits cannot understand. Don't worry about me, Clarence. I'm still there. All this is only a dream. And I read on in the stranger's ancient manuscript, where he says he was carried off to a dark and narrow cell in a damp and filthy dungeon, with some scant remnants for dinner, some moldy straw for a bed, and no end of rats for company. And we must leave him there until it is time to return with the second act in just a few moments. You can have great taste, lots of great taste and taste with gluten. They're medicated cough drops with great taste in every box. Wild cherry, sweet and savory, menthol cool and flavory. Honey, the way you wish with lemon, no licorice. Oh, you can have great taste, lots of great taste and taste with gluten. The medicated cough drops that don't taste medicated, they taste great. Use only as directed. Who's just about wiped out smallpox and smallpox vaccinations? Who got the world's pilots and control towers to speak English so you can land safely? Who helps you in dozens of ways? The United Nations. Learn what it's doing for you. Get the free UN booklet. Write United Nations Association, Box 475, New York 10017. There's always been a you in the U.N. Presented by this station and the Ad Council. Dreams. We all seek to understand the many ways in which God reveals his word. Throughout time, God has spoken to man in dreams. Jehovah said in the Old Testament, Listen to my words. If a man be a prophet... I make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. So, pay attention to your own dreams. They might well reveal flashes of the future, predictions and warnings of things to come. They may give you a glimpse of God's guidance to lead you back to the peace and security of his way. For your free booklet on dreams, write to the Foundation Church, 1147 First Avenue, New York, New York, 10021. That's the Foundation Church, 1147 First Avenue, New York, New York, 10021. The Yankee, a two-fisted foreman in a Connecticut arms factory, picked a fight with the wrong party one day. When he recovered consciousness, he found himself in a strange place, peopled by folk who claimed to be members of King Arthur's court. Indeed, because of his odd 19th century clothes and manner, he has been judged a sorcerer and has been condemned to the stake. The usual fate of such people in those times. Yeah. Mm. Oh. What a dream. Hmm. What an astonishing dream. Well, I've waked just in time from being hanged or burned or drowned or something of that sort. <laughs> now what I think I'll do is nap again till the factory whistle blows and then go down to the plant and have it out with Brother Hercules. I give you good morning, sir boss. What? You still here? Go along with the rest of the dream. Come on, scatter. <laughs> oh, thou art indeed most merry, Sir Boss. Thou canst laugh in the face of dire peril. <laughs> mm, let the dream go on. No, I'm in no hurry. Uh, prithee, uh, Sir Boss, what dream? Mm -hmm. What dream? Why, the dream that I'm in right now. The dream that I'm in King Arthur's court. A person who never existed. And the dream that I'm talking to you, who are nothing but a work of my imagination. Oh, indeed. And is it a dream that thou art to be burned tomorrow noon, hmm? 
Answer me that. Mm. Clarence, I need you. I, sir, boss? Clarence, the only friend I have. Don't fail me. Help me devise some way to escape this jail. Escape? Yes. Escape. Oh, do but hear thyself, sir, boss. Escape? <laughs> the corridors are filled with men at arms. Ah, uh, no doubt, no doubt. But how many? Huh? Not too many, I hope. A full score. One may not hope to escape. Uh, besides, there be other reasons. Mm hmm? Weightier reasons. Mm hmm? Other reasons? What are they? Well, tis said. Tis said. Huh? Merlin, in his malice, has woven a spell about this dungeon. A spell? And there bides not the man in this kingdom desperate enough to cross its lines with you. Oh, now, God pity me, I've told it. And and you, sir, boss. Yes? Be kind to me. Mm-hmm. Be merciful to a poor boy who means thee well, for shouldst thou betray me, I'm lost. <laughs> Sir Boss. <laughs> sir, sir Boss, please. Please. Merlin. <laughs> Merlin has wrought a spell, Merlin, forsooth. Oh, I never. Merlin, that cheap old humbug. Sir that Boss. That maundering old fool. Bosh. <gasps> pure Bosh. The silliest Bosh in the world. Beware. Beware. These are dreadful words. Of all the childish, idiotic, chuckle headed, chicken livered superstitions <gasps> I ever. Do you know why I laugh? No, but for our blessed lady's sake, do it no more. Well, I'll tell you why I laughed. Hmm? I laughed because I'm a magician myself. The... Thou? Hmm? Thou? That's absolute sooth, Clarence. Thou? A magician? I've known Merlin 700 years. Seven? Don't interrupt, don't interrupt. He's died and come alive again 13 times, and he always travels under a new name. Smith, Jones, Jackson, Robinson, Peters, Haskins, Merlin. Always has himself a brand new alias. I knew him in Egypt 300 years ago. 300? In India 500 years ago. And he's always blathering around in my way every place. He makes me tired. He don't amount to shucks as a magician. Knows some of the old common tricks, I grant you, but he's never gotten beyond the rudiments and never will. But, sir, boss... He's Boston... well enough, well enough for the provinces... One night stands and all that sort of thing, you know. But dear me, he oughtn't to set up as an expert. But Merlin. Anyway, a... not where there's a real artist. Clarence, I'm going to remain your friend right along, and in return, you must be mine. I want you to do me a favor. I get word, to be my power. Get word to the king that I'm a magician myself, and the supreme grand high yuckamuck. And the head of the tribe at that. Tell him that I'm just going about quietly arranging a little calamity here that'll make the fur fly in these parts if Merlin's project is carried out and any harm comes to me. Will you do me that little favor, Clarence? Oh, Sir Boss, please, I... I'm frightened. Now, Clarence. Pro promise me, po poor sinner that I am, poor unworthy sinner, that thou shalt always be my friend, Sir Boss. Sure. That thou shalt never turn against me. Never. Never cast any of thine awful enchantments against me. Absolutely. And thou wilt always protect me. Always. Well, then, I hasten to do thy bidding. Well, I could see how things work in this asylum. People simply take you at your word. So I was feeling good for a while. And then it occurred to me, when this boy calms down, he'll wonder why a great magician like me should have to beg a nobody like him for help. And he'll see that I'm a humbug. But then I reasoned, these lunatics can't really think. So I felt better. But then I got frightened again. I had sent the lad to scare his betters with a threat. Suppose they called my bluff. What could I do? Ah. Should have thought about my calamity first. Well, maybe the threat itself will be enough. Maybe. Clarence? Sir Boss? Hmm? Well, Clarence? Speak. Tell me. Give me the verdict. I hasted the message to our liege, the king. Yes? yes and yes. straight away, he had me led into his presence. He was frightened, <laughs> even to the marrow. And straight away, he said... I give the order for the instant enlargement of, uh, uh, 
What name is this mighty enchanter, lad? Sir Boss. Sir Boss. Rescue him at once from the vile dungeon. Clothe him in silks and furs. Lodge him as befits one so great. And let us pray that he will forgive us our foolishness. Yes, yeah, Your Majesty. Your leave to speak. You have our leave, Merlin. This threat, this calamity, of what does it consist? I know not. Lad, has Sir Boss described its awful nature? Uh, no, sire. And wherefore, lad, hath he not named it? Well, mayhap, Merlin, it is too awful. And mayhap, it does not exist. It does not exist? He hath not named his brave calamity. Verily, it is because he cannot. But Merlin, it may well be... It may well be foolish and idle vapor. Or do we dare provoke one of such great magic powers, Merlin? Let him prove his brave words. (sighs) If thou sayest so, Merlin. Lad. Your Majesty. Return to uh, uh, Sir Boss. And in all courtesy, prevail upon him to consider all the factors in this perplexed case. And name the calamity, also the nature of it, and the time of its coming. A sellout. I could have had a sellout if not for Merlin. Oh, sir, boss, delay not. To delay now were to double and treble the perils that already encompass thee about. Oh, please... Be thou wise. Be wise. Name the calamity. Is that all? Just name the calamity? Oh, yes, sir, boss. Oh, yes. Name the calamity. Yes. For one of thy mighty powers, a calamity should be but the work of a moment. Well, you just don't pull a calamity out of thin air, Clarence. Now, if I could get out of here and collect... The eclipse. Oh, the thing that thou did speak of uh, before. Uh... Clarence... It seems I recall that Columbus or Cortez or one of those people used it as a trump card against some savages. Do you follow all this? Um, no, sir, boss. Mm -hmm. Why don't I play that trick myself? Sir, boss, if thou canst arrange for a calamity... Then why not? Wouldn't be plagiarism, because I'd be getting it in nearly a thousand years ahead of those parties. Sir, boss... (laughs) <laughs> Life hangs upon it. Dost thou have a calamity? Now, just tell me, once again, tomorrow is the 21st day of June, and this is the year 538. It is true, sir, boss. Well, very well, Clarence. You shall go to the king, and I shall tell you what to say. I await thy words. You shall say to the king that at the noon hour tomorrow... I will smother the whole world in the dead blackness of night. I will blot out the sun and it shall never shine again. The fruits of the earth shall rot for lack of light and warmth. And the peoples of the earth shall famish and die to the last man. Go, tell this to the king. when the threat was made, when the sought-after calamity was described, as the stranger wrote in the faded parchment document, poor Clarence turned pale and collapsed with fright, and the Connecticut Yankee had to carry the boy out of the cell and hand him over to the guards. Well, now I must hand you over to some folk who have some words of wisdom for you, and then we shall all return here for the third act. Isn't it nice to know you're free To see the things you want to see To touch the heights you dare to reach To know you're all that you can be You seem to be in a hurry, sir. Uh, Yes, I am. You are in a hurry. Oh, yes. Well, no doubt you're rushing down to buy a Buick Electra because you know that Electra has the kind of ride and comfort Buick's famous for. That's right. And because you know it's America's second largest selling full-size luxury car. You got it. You got it. So you're hurrying because you want to get there before the Electras are all gone. That's very good. How did you know I was going to buy a Buick Electra? Well, it was on the shopping list you dropped back there, you see. Dozen eggs, quarter milk, Buick Electra. Son of a gun, I forgot the pistachio nuts. That's not on the list. Well, I forgot them anyhow.
hope for tomorrow, the children. Yet there are children in this world right now who have no hope for a brighter today. They're hungry, illiterate, living in misery, and when they grow up, if they grow up, they'll pass on this hopelessness. And it's the world's loss and the world's shame. You can help children to grow up with healthy bodies and educated minds, with a zest for life that they'll pass on to their children and to our world. Won't you please send a check to Save the Children Federation, Box 970 Grand Central Station, New York 10017. That's Save the Children, Box 970 Grand Central Station, New York 10017. Think about tomorrow. We've got to save the children and save the world. Help them to grow. Mr. Mark Twain's misplaced Connecticut Yankee. Is he actually in King Arthur's court? There's only one way to find out. Wait and see if there's an eclipse. The eclipse, as you probably know by now, shall perform a double duty. It will set the date beyond all shadow of a doubt. And it will also save our hero's life. Clarence? Did you deliver my message? Oh, yes, sir, boss. And? Oh, oh, we're struck dumb with fear and dread. Ah, let this be a lesson to you. Never lose hope, do you hear? (laughs) I hear, sir, boss. Even when it's darkest. It is even so. Now, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I could have submitted meekly, given way to fear and terror. But I thought my way out of a tight place instead. And tomorrow noon, they'll conduct me to that stake, but I won't be burned on it. No, sir, boss. Tomorrow noon, I shall become the most powerful man in the kingdom. I can't wait for tomorrow. And I'll even tell you something else, Clarence. We may not have to wait for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. True, sir, boss. Can't True. You, see? Mm-hmm. you see, the calamity that I told you to describe to these people... Oh, uh, do, do not say those dread words I'm again. I'm sure everyone's terrified. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true, Clarence? Oh, barely, sir, boss. Well, if I know human nature, they'll come here to see me, to try to compromise. And Clarence, listen... Even as I mention it, it's the compromise on its way. Listen, they're coming. And if it's a good compromise, I'll accept. But if it isn't, I mean to stand my ground and play my hand for all it's worth. Sir Kay! And to what do I owe the honor of this visit? The steak is ready. Come! The what? The steak. Oh, but there's been some mistake. The execution's set for tomorrow. The order has been changed and set forward today. Oh, uh, uh, but today I, uh, look, uh, it, no, 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 it has to be tomorrow. It has to be. Come, it's almost noon. Hasty. Lost. I was lost. There was no help for me now. I was done for good. I was dazed. I was stupefied. I had no command over myself. The soldiers took hold of me and pulled me along with them out of the cell and along the maze of corridors and finally into the fierce glare of daylight in the upper world. And as we stepped into the vast enclosed courtyard of the castle, I received a shock. The first thing I could see was the stake. We see before us one who has threatened to destroy the sun and thus end for all time all life on this earth. I say he speaks falsely. I say he is an imposter. Merlin, speak thou more gently. Mayhap he does plan something magical. There is no need to placate this this false magician, sir. Soon we shall see if he can save himself. I scarcely heard Merlin's gloating voice. I knew now. I was a man without hope, and with each passing moment, the realization that I was about to die crept inch by inch through my veins and turned me cold. Sir Boss! Uh, Sir Boss! Clarence, what are you doing here? I am thy servant, Sir Boss. It is meet that I serve thee to the end, but, uh... But there shall be no end. Mm, There shall be no end, you say? We know thou hast prepared a calamity. I have prepared a calamity, Clarence. Has aught gone amiss, sir, boss? They changed the day on me. 
The calamity was set for tomorrow, not for today. I know. And twas through me that the change was wrought. Clarence! What are you telling me? When I spoke thy words to them, when I revealed the calamity in store, oh, how mighty was the terror it did engender. Then also, I saw that I could save the sun. Save the sun, it Clarence. Would, it would not be necessary to destroy the sun. But Clarence. Yes, sir, boss. Thou canst very well destroy the sun and return to thy far-off realm. But all here would be dead. That was the idea. Yeah. The and so I pretended unto this one and that one, the king, Sir Kay, Merlin, Sir Lancelot, uh, that thy power against the sun could not reach its full until tomorrow. Clarence, so if Clarence, any would save the sun and save the world, thou must be slain today, while thy enchantments are but uh, in the making and lack their full potency. Maybe I should have explained that... <laughs> it was but a foolish lie, but you should have seen them seize it and Swallow it in the frenzy of their fright, <laughs> as if it were a mm, salvation from heaven. And all the while, I was laughing in my sleeve to see them so chiefly deceived. <laughs> see how happy the matter is spread? Happy? For whom? Well, for all of us. Uh, consider, thou wilt not need to do our son a real hurt. Make but a little darkness. A little darkness. Now, only the littlest mm. little darkness. And uh, cease with that. Sure. Mm-hmm. 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 When they see that first shadow fall, they will go mad with fear. They'll set thee free and make thee great. Have thy triumph, good sir boss. But I, uh, I implore thee, remember my supplication and do the blessed son no hurt. For, for, for my sake, and I am thy true friend. Mm. I, I can promise you this. That the sun shall suffer no hurt from me, ever. I guess when we're done in, we're done in more by our friends than by our enemies. Tomorrow I could have worked a miracle. Today, I can only be fuel for a fire. Poor Clarence. What could I say to him? How could I explain it? I wanted to frighten the king and Merlin in the court, and I did. And I also frightened Clarence as well. Hmm? I should have thought of that. All Clarence really wanted to do was to save the sun. He actually thought I would have to destroy it to prove my point. Well, well, it should be a lesson to me. But, unfortunately, I won't be able to learn from it. How do I get out of this? If it's a dream, I don't seem to be waking up. And here are the soldiers piling up rows of very flammable-looking wooden faggots all around me. Or on my ankles, my knees, my body. And I hear the voice of a monk droning something in Latin. And now, now comes a man. His face is masked, the executioner. He carries a blazing torch. He kneels down at my feet. He's ready to apply the torch. And it's no dream. Ye have threatened us with destruction. Answer him, sir boss. Remove the smirk from his evil countenance. Thou hast threatened our very font of life. The blessed sun itself. Well, show us thy powers. Merlin, do not force Your him Your majesty, to... the man is a liar. He has no powers at all. He has lied. Now, sir boss, now. Make them all quake and tremble. Poor Clarence. Poor Clarence. Well, what sayest thou? Why, poor Clarence? Because, sir boss, because... Sir boss, look. Oh, the sun. Wait, 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 wait. Look, everyone. The sun. The sun. The, thou hast begun thy magic. See the black about the sun. Uh, the, the eclipse. Hey, it, can't, it can't be. Sir boss. Sir boss, spare the sun. Apply the torch. I am Merlin. I forbid it. Away, I am Merlin. the king. Then I shall apply it myself. I am Merlin. I fear no one. Stand back, old man, before thou thou encounterest the wrath of Sir Boss. Even now, he destroys the sun. Now, those are but random clouds. Hand me the torch. It's the eclipse. Executioner, hand me the torch. I say no. Stay where you are. If any man moves, even before I give him leave, I will blast him with thunder. I will consume him with lightning. Even the king. Now as for you, John W. Merlin. Sit down. 
Sit down or you're a dead man. That's better. So, boss, be merciful. I will think it over, your majesty. To say no further into this perilous matter, mm-hmm. lest disaster follow. It was reported to us that thy full powers could not attain their strength until tomorrow. You think these are my full powers? I'm feeling very weak today. Name any terms, fair sir, even to have of my kingdom. Oh, but stop. Oh, stop this gathering darkness. I should like to, your majesty. Believe me, I should like to. Thou shouldst like to. Mm, But once begun, these calamities are difficult to untrack. It's best not to start them. We understand full well. But each moment it grows more dark. And see, the people are struck dumb with fear. As they should be. How long, oh, how long shall thy anger last? Oh, your majesty, sir boss, never remains wrathful too long. I implore thee, sir boss. I shall let this darkness grow deeper for a little while longer in order to serve as a lesson... We have learned our lesson. Have you? Then let all be silent while I gather my powers in order to reverse this terrible darkness and save our glorious son, Clarence. What day is this? The, the 21st. The 21st? Mm-hmm. Hang it. You said it was the 20th. Oh, by thy favor, sir, boss. Numbers flow through my head as water through a sieve. Well, then, if it's the 21st, this is the 6th century, and this is King Arthur's court, and I might as well make the most of it. Oh, King, hmm? I have reflected. Whether I blot out the sun for good shall rest with you. These are my terms. You shall remain king over all your dominions. You shall appoint me, your perpetual minister and executive. Oh, yes. Oh, pay early, me, yes. Pay me 1% of such actual increase of revenue over and above its present amount as I shall succeed in creating for the state. Anything thou wilt demand. And if I can't live on that, I shan't ask anybody to give me a hand. Is it satisfactory? Anything. Now, please, good sir boss, restore the sun. Very well. First, uh, you must untie my hands that I may use them in this business. Away with his bonds. Set him free. Do him homage. He is the king's right hand. His seat is on the highest step of the throne. And now, good sir, sweep away this creeping night. Bring us light again. And let us bless thee. I would say that you have all had just enough. Let all stand. Let all look toward the heavens. And now, I declare, let the enchantment dissolve and pass harmlessly away. Oh, the sun. Look, Look, the silver rim of the sun emerges. The sun returneth. I, the boss, have so commanded. All hail the boss. And so he became the boss. And to a primitive country, he brought the blessings of soap and toothpaste and gunpowder and books and railroads and telephones. And how did it work out? Well, this is only the exciting beginning of the story. Our purpose is to get you to go to the book itself and enjoy Mark Twain's glorious spoof on... Well, uh, when Mark Twain spoofs, he spoofs just about everything. But before you run to your library or bookstore, wait a few moments for me to return. America's big, beautiful travel value is available again. Greyhound's All-American Ameripass. Seven days unlimited travel for only $76. Seven consecutive days of travel everywhere Greyhound goes in America. Canada, too. Go where you want, when you want. Be a real free spirit. Leave when you like, any day, every day of the week. 
Only Greyhound serves 48 states. You don't pay for your all-American Ameripass until you're all set to go. And like Greyhound's three other Ameripasses, you'll enjoy special discounts on hotels, meals, sightseeing, and other good things. So get going with a Greyhound All-American Ameripass. Seven days unlimited travel for only $76. It's a great way to get in touch with family and friends for less money. Because Greyhound's in touch with more of America. Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. All we could hope to do in the limited time allotted us was get him there. You, of course, should follow his progress. And in this bicentennial year, what could be a happier celebration than several hours with the most American of all writers, Samuel L. Clemens? Or, as he would have it, Mark Twain. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Robert Dryden, Russell Horton, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Lawyer Wilson. What could he have said? Hay, feed, and grain merchant, Wilson. What could he have said? Go down the list. Robert Titmarsh, Ella Fallett Weeks, Archibald Wilcox, Ingoldsby Sergeant. What could he have said? What could he have said? Oh. It was the only topic of conversation. The 19 Incorruptibles, starting with Banker Pinkerton on top and ending with poor Edward Richards on bottom, walked about with white and drawn faces as if each of them was feverishly figuring out a way to get at that money. A head of steam was building higher and higher and fiercer and fiercer. Sooner or later, it would have to bust. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and the Greyhound Ameripass. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Sophocles say, the gods hate utterly the bray of bragging tongues. And haven't we also been taught that pride goeth before destruction? Certainly, the prophets and the sages and the poets have had enough to say about the besetting sin of pride. Why, then, is pride so prevalent? The subject intrigued Mark Twain so deeply that he created one of the deadliest stories about pride ever written. Our mystery drama, The Man That Corrupted Hadleyburg, was adapted from the Mark Twain classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Sam Dan, and stars Fred Gwynn. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. According to Mark Twain, you could cheat just about anybody. Back along the turn of the century, there was a town called Hadleyburg, 
which advertised itself as the most honest and upright place in the world. Incorruptible Hadleyburg, envied by its neighbors. And yet, one day, untainted, irreproachable Hadleyburg fell from grace. How did it happen? May I introduce you to Jack Halliday? I knew it would happen one day, and I said so, but nobody listened to me. After all, I was only the editor of the Hadleyburg Gazette, and it was a paper that lost money. So what did I know about anything? Anyhow, putting the story together, here's what happened. One night, old man Richards, who works at the bank... He's one of the 19. I'll tell you who they are later. If I have to stop to explain everything at the beginning, I'll never get started. Well, old man Richards and his wife Mary are having supper. Edward, I know you're tired, dear, but you must have your supper. I'm not hungry. I'm, I'm so clear worn out. You know, Mary, it's hard to be poor at our time of life. Grinding away the salary... Another man's slave. Oh, but, Edward, we have our good name. Yes. Yes. And that's everything. Don't mind my talk. It's just a moment's irritation. It doesn't mean anything. Who's that? Someone's at the door. Who would knock at this hour? You sit, Edward, and finish your supper. I'll see who it is. Who is it, Mary, dear? What? That's strange. There's no one here. But we distinctly heard someone knock. <gasps> Edward. What is it? Come here quickly. Edward, look. Look at what? On the doorstep, this... this bundle. It's a sack. Oh, what does it mean? It means someone left a sack on our doorstep. Yes, but what, for what reason? Well, let's bring it inside and find out. Here, let me... Oh. Mary, I, I I, can't lift it. Oh, well, now what do you suppose can be in it? There's a piece of paper attached to it. Uh, here, let me put on my spectacles. Yeah. Oh, Edward, what does it say? It says, uh, to be published or the right man to be sought out by private inquiry, either will answer. This sack contains gold coin... Weighing 160 pounds and four ounces. Oh, Edward. Help me. Help me drag it inside. Oh, mercy on us. Uh, quickly. Uh, shut, shut the door, Mary. Oh. Lock it. Oh, my. Oh, Edward. What do you suppose? The, the, the paper. The paper. There's more written on it. Oh? I, I was a gambler. A ruined gambler. Oh. Hmm. I arrived at Hadleyburg late at night, starving and in rags. I begged for help, and I luckily begged of the right man. He gave me $20. He also gave me life and hope. I returned to the gambling table. Oh, Edward, who would have given a stranger $20? I became rich, and I remembered a remark he made. It gave me the inspiration to reform, and I have. I don't know who that man was, but I want him found, and I want him to have the money in this sack. Oh, Edward, can you imagine how much money there is in there? I would find him myself, but I cannot remain here. But this is an honest, incorruptible town, and I can trust you folks to help me. But how can we help? The man can be identified by the remark he made to me when he gave me the $20. Oh. Please publish or reveal what I have told you so far to anyone who you think might be the right man. If he says, yes, I was that man, and the remark I made was such and such, open the sack, and inside you will find the sealed envelope with the remark. If he has made the correct statement, give him the gold. Oh, can you imagine, Edward... Oh, that gold. You may publish what I have revealed to you in your local paper and add the following instructions. Thirty days from now, let the candidate appear at the town hall and hand his remark in a sealed envelope to the Reverend Mr. Burgess and have the Reverend Mr. Burgess destroy the seals, open the sack, and verify the remark. 
Someone in this town befriended a stranger. Gave him $20 and now... And, and, and now... And now that man who set his bread afloat upon the waters shall become rich. Oh, Edward, what, what, what was it? Uh, was I that man? <laughs> uh, was I that benefactor? Yes. Uh, no, Mary, no. Oh, well, just as well. We could never accept that gold anyway. It was gambler's money. We must make the inquiry public. All the other towns will be sick with envy because no stranger would ever trust such a thing to any other town but Hadleyburg. Uh, let me run over and tell Jack Halliday. I didn't believe him till I came running back to the house with him. And there was the sack, and there was the letter, just as you've already heard it. Well, you remember I said Edward Richards was one of the 19? Sure. There are 19 leading citizens of Hadleyburg. Ed Richards is the least of them. The poorest, the most unimportant. He just about makes it under the wire. Well, these 19 set the tone and spirit of Hadleyburg. The 19 uncorruptibles. Just keep them in mind. Well, I said to Ed and Mary Richards, let's get this money right over to the bank and have old Pinkerton put it right in the vault. And we roused him out of bed, and he did it. And the whole town turned out. Everyone became so excited. <laughs> you can imagine. Anyhow, poor old Edward Richards finally went home. I think I know who that man was, Edward, who gave the stranger the $20. Hmm? Barclay Goodson. Yes. Yes, you may be right, Mary. Mm -hmm. It would have been like Barclay. May he rest in peace. Do you remember what he said about this town? It may have been honest, but it was narrow and self-righteous and stingy. And I remember how he was hated for it, too. I guess he was the best hated man around here, except for Reverend Burgess. Former Reverend Burgess. Hmm? Wait. Doesn't it seem odd that the stranger should have appointed Reverend Burgess to deliver the money? Mary, Burgess isn't a bad man. Oh, nonsense. He would still be a minister of peace. It was all because of the rumor of his being with that woman. Well, he was guilty. No. No, Mary, he wasn't. He was innocent. Hey, but what are you saying? Mary, I w was the only man who knew he was innocent. What? I could have saved him, but... Uh, you know how wrought up the whole town was. It would have turned everyone against me. I just didn't have the courage. I... Oh, I see. I have another confession, Mary. When there was talk of riding him out of town on a rail, I... Well, I sneaked over to his house and warned him to leave until things cooled off. Oh, Edward, if anyone had found out... It scares me yet. Everybody thought it was Goodson who warned him. And when folks started to mumble about him... <laughs> Goodson buckled on his forty-five and invited them to state their case to his face. Oh, that was just like Goodson. The way it was like Goodson to give that twenty dollars to a tramp. Hmm? Why are we so sure it was Goodson? It couldn't have been anyone else. Oh, why didn't we keep the gold? Mary. Why didn't you realize we could never find the right man because he's dead and buried in his grave? Do you realize what As you long was... as the money would go to someone who needed it as badly as we do, who would have been hurt? You know how we've been raised, how, how we've been shielded against all temptation, so it's absolutely second nature not to hesitate for a moment when an honest thing has to be done. Oh, I know. But it's an artificial honesty, and as weak as water when temptation really comes, as we have seen this night. Mary, there's no use Oh, going Lord on. knows I never had any doubt about my indestructible honesty. Until this minute. Now, dear, you mustn't go on this Edward, way. I know exactly what you're thinking right now. You do? You are thinking. If a body could only guess what the remark was that Goodson made to the stranger. Yes. Then I feel ashamed about it. Well, that's what I'm thinking myself. Mm. If only we could guess. Maybe we don't have to guess. What? We're all creatures of habit, Edward. Yeah. I suppose that's... You can almost predict what a person would say in a given situation. Now, take Mr. Pinkerton, the banker. Suppose a beggar were to ask him for charity. What would he say? <laughs> Why isn't an able-bodied man like you gainful employed? Exactly. Now, think of Goodson. What were some of the things 
Goodson used to say. But, Mary... Now think. Now think, what were Goodson's best-known remarks about... Charity, for instance. Mary, even if I could remember, that's no guarantee that Goodson would have made the exact same statement on this particular night. Would it do any good? Yes. Because then you would write it down on a piece of paper, seal it in an envelope, and hand it over to the Reverend Mr. Burgess. And suppose... uh, Suppose Mr. Burgess then breaks open the seal, and it comes out that what I claim he said wasn't the remark at all. Well, nothing ventured... Nothing gained. Do you realize the whole town will be there? The, 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 the whole county? The whole state? We, we I, I, I would be disgraced. Oh, you could brazen it out. Mary, I'd be terrified. The money. Oh, the thought of all that money is driving us out of our minds. Mary, why don't we just go to sleep? Sleep? Oh, oh, are, are you going to be able to sleep? You know what we're going to keep asking ourselves? Yes. <laughs> yes. What could he have said? Yes. What could Goodson have said to the stranger? What could he have said? I was also sure it was Goodson. Goodson had to be the benefactor. But what did he say to the stranger? Well, if you think that only Edward and Mary Richards were plagued by the question, let me tell you, they had plenty of company. No one was getting any sleep in any of the houses of the incorruptible 19. For instance, Lawyer Wilson. What could he have said? Hey, feed and grain merchant Wilson. What could he have said? Go down the list. Robert Titmarsh, Ella Fallett Weeks, Archibald Wilcox, Inglesby Sergeant. What could he have said? What could he have said? It was the only topic of conversation. The 19 incorruptibles, starting with Banker Pinkerton on top and ending with poor Edward Richards on bottom, walked about with white and drawn faces, as if each of them was feverishly figuring out a way to get at that money. A head of steam was building higher and higher and fiercer and fiercer. Sooner or later, it would have to bust. And it did. You know perfectly well that what we have here is a situation where an irresistible force is about to encounter some highly movable objects. Incorruptible Hadleyburg is in for a workout. Is Mary Richards correct in her analysis? Will the town's reputation collapse under its first real test? It may. It may not. Just wait here till I return with Act Two. Why do you climb a mountain? Because it's there, is the usual answer. And in this case, the simplicity of the reply contains a universal truth. Nature abhors a vacuum. The very fact that something exists can motivate someone to do something about it. Here you have Mark Twain's town of Hadleyburg. It has a reputation for honesty. This fact by itself is enough to inspire someone to try to destroy the reputation. Jack Halliday continues our story. I wish I could tell you what went on in Hadleyburg as the weeks went by, and that fateful Friday drew near. Everybody from Hadleyburg was walking around with a long face. Everyone agreed that the benefactor had to be Goodson. But one thing kind of intrigued me. Why was Reverend Burgess named as the judge or referee or whatever? Burgess, who'd been treated so shabbily by the town. Could all this be a trick on Burgess's part to get even? Reverend, I think I've been your friend. Yes, Jack, you have. How do you figure in this sack of gold business? I have no idea. When Goodson was alive, you two were close. Well, 
I suppose we were kindred spirits. Reverend, you know more than you're telling. I'm convinced of it. Why is everyone so sure the benefactor is Goodson? Well, who but Goodson would give a stranger $20? Oh, now, wait, 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 wait. You would, Reverend Burgess. You would. Well, for that matter, Jack, so would you. Where would I ever get $20? <laughs> if you had it, you'd give it away. And for that matter, so would poor, timid little Edward Richards. <laughs> Think about it. I thought about it. And the more I thought, the less sure I was of anything. Meanwhile, as I found out later, the mailman had been to the Richards' home and left behind a letter. And what a letter. Dear Mr. Richards, I have just returned from Europe and heard about the event in your town of Handleyburg. You don't know who made that remark, but I do. It was Goodson. Oh, do you see, Edward? Shh, shh. We were old friends. That night I passed through your town, and Goodson waited with me at the railroad station. Some tramp approached him and asked for a handout. I saw him give the man the money, and I heard what he said. Edward, why would this man After write... After the tramp left, Goodson and I talked till my train arrived. He'd mentioned practically all of his fellow townsmen, and I could tell he actively disliked most of them. Oh, that does sound like Goodson. He did mention your name as a rare exception. Oh. He said you had done him a good turn once, and that possibly you may not have realized the full value of it. What was that, Edward? He said he wished he had a fortune so that he could leave it to you. Well, then, in that case, if you really did him that service, you are his legitimate heir and are entitled to the gold. Oh! I trust to your honor and honesty as a citizen of Hadleyburg. I will reveal to you the remark that Goodson made. This is it. You are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Very truly yours, Howard L. Stevens. Oh, Edward, the money is ours! Mary. Mary, did do you realize I'll have to tell a lie? What lie? I'll have to claim that I was the one that gave the $20 to the stranger. Oh, that's a technicality. Edward, you read what this Mr. Stevenson said. Will you do deserve the gold? And, and so... Oh, it, and, it, and why do I deserve the gold? Why? Because, as Mr. Stevenson pointed out, you did Mr. Goodson a good turn once. No. What do you mean, No. I don't remember ever having done Goodson a good turn. Oh, come, you're always helping people. No, I remember. I did Burgess a, a good turn, but not Goodson. I never had anything at all to do with Barclay Goodson. I was afraid to be seen with him. Oh, think. No. No, I, I didn't. Oh. Mary, I know all this honesty Hadleyburg brags about is a fraud, but <laughs> I'm too old and... I'm too tired, and maybe I'm too frightened to change my ways. And, and I just won't have anything to do with it anymore. Edward! No, it's my very last word on the subject. Well, that's how it was at that point with Ed and Mary Richards. That letter bore an out-of-state postmark. But do you want to know something extremely interesting about that letter? It came in 19 copies. Nineteen. And that letter was delivered to 19 homes in the village of Hadleyburg. Each and every one of the 19 incorruptibles received it. Dear Mr. Wilson, I have just returned from Europe. Dear Mr. Wilson, last night I passed through your town. You're far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Good morning, Jack. Well, Mr. Bolson. Uh, uh, Jack, I've been thinking. Uh, I I don't advertise enough. I agree. I always held if you sell hay, feed, and grain, folks come and buy what they need anyhow. But now you've changed your mind and uh, you want to advertise. Yeah, you guessed it, Jack. What's gotten into you? Well, we got all those strangers in town on account of... Uh, you know what? Wilson, what's really on your mind? Uh, Jack, uh, the reporters keep asking me questions about myself, you know. 
And, uh, well, I, 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 I don't know what to tell them. Well, just tell them the truth. Well, I do. But it sounds kind of stuffy. I guess it would. Yes. So, uh, what I was thinking, Jack, was that you might write me a kind of short autobiography. Nelson, you're an old fraud. Oh, Jack, you know all about me, and I'm willing to pay you. All for... right, Nelson, but I'm warning you. I intend to get to the bottom of this. Jack. Ah, it isn't old Roy Wilson himself. Your old rival, Wilson, was just here. Hey, really? Now, what can I do for you? Well, uh, you want me to write your autobiography? Uh, no, not at the moment, Jack. I, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I want to arrange for some advertising. Well, I believe it isn't ethical for lawyers to advertise in this state. Oh, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't dream of advertising my law practice. Oh, you wouldn't? Well, uh, what would you advertise? My intention of running for the state senate. Say that again. I said I intend to run for the state senate. Oh, come on, Wilson. Who'd vote for you? I have every prospect of victory. You're the most unpopular man in town. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I think people will be eager to vote for me. Oh, do you? Well, why on earth should anyone even dream of voting for uh, you? Now, now, how much does a full page cost? <laughs> I've never seen such a change in the atmosphere. Everybody walked around with a smile. Everybody seemed to have a new lease on life. That is, everybody among the 19 Hadleyburg incorruptibles. Why, even Mrs. Inglesby Sargent, who came in to give me the full information on a church supper, seemed to be burst. And don't forget to write, Jack, that everyone is to bring a covered dish. I never forget. Uh, Jack... Uh, I'm thinking of ordering some special cards. Oh, uh, yes? Uh, you know the Sheridan Mansion? Well, I think I finally convinced Ingleby to buy it. Well, that would uh, take a lot of money. Oh, that's not going to be a problem very much longer. Oh, it isn't? Why not? Oh, that would be telling. Uh, uh, Jack, a simple, tasteful engraved card to read uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ingleby Sargent at home at number one, a Sheridan Place. Oh, do you suppose we could change the name of the square to Sergeant Place if we own the property? I know how much money it takes to buy that mansion, and if you've got all of it, you can afford to do anything. It made no sense at all. I couldn't account for it. What was the sudden outburst of sunshine and roses among all the 19? Bright plans, extravagant spending... Had all these people lost their minds? Only one person seemed unchanged. Edward Richards. Mary, leave me in peace. Edward, no, the money is rightfully ours. But I keep telling you, I didn't do any service at all for Goodson. And I keep telling you, it may have been some tiny, picky thing that you can't even remember. Don't weaken my resolve. Goodson befriended a stranger in the presence of a witness. Mary. And in so doing, he made a remark. The witness, a friend of Goodson's, remembering that Goodson felt kindly to you, wants to do you a good turn. Now, that's all there is. Yeah, I could believe it. I I could accept it if... If what? If I could ever remember doing Goodson a good turn. Oh, Edward, you must have. What? How? Well, things are, are relative. Oh, please, Mary. Oh, did you ever say hello to Goodson on the street? Well, of course. Well, that's a good turn. That's the... the Did the, most people ever greet Goodson? Smile, say hello, tip their hats, shake hands, or stop to chat? Hardly anyone. No, I didn't either. I I just... Yes? I just smiled and nodded. And that was enough. Oh, don't you see, Edward, that little bit? No, really. As Goodson said, you wouldn't know the value of it. Now, who else would say hello to Goodson? Oh, Edward, can't you see the hand of providence? Oh, come, dear, write. Write. You are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Mary, do you think I should? I think you should. And you think you should. Now, all we need is the paper, the pen, and an envelope. <laughs> Yes. 
Yes, indeed, that's all you need. People do become a bit erratic, not to mention unhinged at the prospect of a fortune in gold or anything else for that matter. Well, here goes incorruptible Hadleyburg. Can we salvage anything? The cleanup begins when I bring you Act Three in just a few moments. Mm. You are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Such a phrase is worth in the neighborhood of forty thousand dollars, which may be small potatoes today but it was certainly a bumper crop about 80 years ago. The question is, how many people know that phrase, and how many of them are willing to utter it? For this information, we need to hear from Jack Halliday, the local editor. The town hall never looked finer. The place was festooned with all kinds of flags and bunting, You'd think it was the 4th of July. The sack of gold sat on a table in the center of the stage, and it made mouths water all over the house. Finally, Mr. Burgess was introduced, the Reverend Mr. Burgess. Everyone in town loved him now, and he spoke without rancor, as if nothing had happened. Ladies and gentlemen, I have here in my pocket an envelope. Mary. I'm scared. What to be scared the about? The shall open. And here is the letter inside. Mary. Mary, that's on blue paper. I do. We didn't use blue paper. And it reads as follows. The remark which I made to the poor distressed stranger was, you are very far from being a very bad man. Go and reform. Signed, Jeremiah Bilson. What? Jeremiah <laughs> Mary, Mary, did you hear something? Order, order, please, order. I see that Mr. Wilson is also on his feet. Why do you rise, Mr. Wilson? Because you call my name. No, sir, no, no. I read the name Bilson, which is signed here. I, Jeremy Bilson, signed that letter. You were still a liar and a fraud. I'm the one who befriended that poor stranger, Mr. Chairman. I wrote you a letter myself. I, William Wilson. Well, uh, just, just, just a moment. It, it seems I have another envelope in my pocket. <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it, that's mine. All right, all right, then, I shall read it. The remark I made was, you are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Signed, William Wilson. The chair recognizes Jack Halliday. Uh, both of them couldn't have made the same remark. Both of them didn't. Mr. Wilson said, you are very far from being a very bad man. Wilson said, you are far from being a bad man. No, very. <laughs> Therefore, you should open the sack, sir, and read what the test remark is. Well, with your permission, ladies and gentlemen... I hereby break the seals and open the sack. Mary, Mary, what have we done? Do you suppose he has our letter in his pocket? I, uh, I find here two envelopes. One is marked the test remark. On the other it says not to be opened until all written communications addressed to the chair have been read. Let's hear the test remark, Mr. Burgess. Um, this is what the benefactor claims he said. You are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. That says it. That's exactly what I said. And Bilkin is a liar and a fraud. And I'll 
Mr. Mr. Wilson, you're out of order. No, no, I insist. I am the man who befriended the stranger. I know what I said. I was in my office writing this note to you, Mr. Burgess, when Wilson came in on business. And he may have seen the note on my desk, and therefore... That's an infamous lie. Yes, and he couldn't even cover it correctly. Order, gentlemen, order. Neither of you has quoted the remark correctly. Please. The full remark is you are far from being a bad man. Go and reform. Or mark my words, someday for your sins you will die and go to hell or Hadleyburg. And try to make it the former. <laughs> the hallmark on it, eh? Order! Order! Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman! Two out of 19 incorruptibles have succumbed to temptation, I think. Our fair town of Hadleyburg now has a new image. I won't shoot any man who improves my honesty! Yes, sir! <laughs> Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn this meeting. We cannot do so at this point, Mr. Halliday. Why not? Because we have other claimants for the prize. I have received a number of letters. Perhaps one of them can repeat the true remark. Oh, Mary, Mary, we're doomed. We'll be disgraced. Letter number three. You are far from being a bad man. Signed... Inglesby Sergeant. <laughs> you, you're required. You are far from being a very bad oh, man. Oh, who's incredible as that? Oh. <laughs> Nicholas Whitworth. <laughs> you are very far from being a very bad man. It became a picnic after that. The house was in hysterics. One by one, the incorruptibles were stripped naked. Figuratively speaking, that is. Mary, we're, we're going to be disgraced. Oh, Mary. Why did we do it? I don't know what ever got into me, Edward. Oh, forgive me. He's, he, he's saving us for last. I know it. Oh, Mary. Oh, all I ever had was my good name. Now, I don't even have that. Oh, pray. That's all we have left. Pray that Burgess will be merciful. Yes. Yes, let us pray. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that's all. Uh, Mr. Burgess, how many of those letters did you receive? Uh, Nineteen. Well, sir, I've been holding count, and you only read 18. Oh, did I? Oh, well, I, I must have been mistaken. I guess it was only 18. 18? We have 19 incorruptibles in Happy Birds. But only one of them is the genuine article. Only one is truly as advertised. I propose a cheer for the cleanest man in town. The only so-called important citizen... Who didn't try to steal that money? Edward Richards! And now I shall read the other letter in the sack. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no test remark. Nobody ever made one. What? <laughs> order, order, please. Order. <laughs> there was no beggar. No contribution. At one time, I passed through your town. I was offended by your lofty, snobbish pretensions. I was insulted by your overbearing vanity. I decided to discover if your vaunted integrity was genuine. And now you have seen what I have done. I'm sure I caught every last man to whom I wrote that letter... Tipping off the test remark. That's right. He did, down to the last man. Well, 
The contents of the sack belong to all who claimed it. Now, wait a minute. You mean these shoppers get the gold after all? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Yes, order, please, no. ladies and gentlemen. I must abide by the instructions. And so I shall now cut open the sack and distribute the contents among... Among... What is it, Mr. Burgess? Friends, this isn't gold. These are just gilded pieces of lead. Mr. Chairman! Mr. Chairman! Yes, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I propose we auction off the sack and give the proceeds to the one honest, incorruptible left. Ed Richards. Oh, yes. 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 Come on. Oh, 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 oh,
You couldn't have cleared me. You had no real evidence to offer. You see, I was to blame. I was guilty. Like everyone else, I'm only human. Like everyone else, I too could be tempted. Hadleyburg is a well-corrupted village. I guess there isn't an awful lot more to tell. Hadleyburg had its name changed by special permission of the legislature. And what its new one is, uh, I won't say. But we're a town now, like other towns, neither better or worse. But at least we're human, which is about as good or as bad a thing as you can say about anyone. Thank you kindly for your attention. And thank you, Jack Halliday. This has been a visit into the Mark Twain country of Hadleyburg. And you can find a Hadleyburg almost anywhere you look, even in your own hometown. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton in Notorious. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. With the collapse of Nazi Germany after World War II, it was commonly believed that many of Hitler's more fanatic followers escaped to the Western Hemisphere to pursue their relentless plotting for world domination. Our play tonight, while purely fictional, is a sample of how these isolated groups may operate and how they may be brought to justice. It's Alfred Hitchcock's thrilling hit, Notorious produced by RKO, and stars its original leading lady, Ingrid Bergman, and Joseph Cotton, two of Hollywood's leading performers. Notorious might take place in any city, but actually we find ourselves in teeming and exotic Rio de Janeiro, one of the most exciting cities of the New World. I have an airmail letter from a friend of ours who made a flying visit to Rio, and reports while shopping in the fashionable Copacabana section, I purchased several exquisite examples of Brazilian lace. Imagine my surprise when I examined them to discover each piece labeled Wash Only in Lux. Fortunately, Lux flakes are available at almost every store in Rio. So were we to stay here longer, I'd have little trouble following such sensible advice. Well, for that message from Rio de Janeiro, all our thanks as we take you shortly to that colorful metropolis with Act One of Notorious, starring Ingrid Bergman as Alicia Huberman and Joseph Cotton in the role of Devlin. It's the height of the tourist season in Miami, Florida, and the passengers of a plane from New York have hastened to their hotels, all save one, a Mr. Devlin, who has gone directly to a building owned by the United States government. There, in an obscure and private office... And last Thursday, John Huberman, traitor, was sentenced to 20 years in the federal penitentiary. So I heard, Prescott. Congratulations. Oh, thanks, Devlin, but I didn't drag you down here to pat me on the back. Huberman has a daughter here in Miami. Oh? Well, she was in no way involved with her father or with any of the other Nazi agents who worked against us during the war. I believe she can be of great help to us now. That's what I want you to find out. You've approached her? Well, not yet, but we know a great deal about her. Oh, here's her photograph. Alicia Huberman. Hmm. Attractive. Very. And something of a problem. 
Miss Huberman is not what our mothers would have called a nice girl. Out every night, drinks a lot, gets arrested once a week for reckless driving. Huh? But whatever she may be, we think she's still a good American. I, uh, I've made arrangements for you to meet her tomorrow night. That should be pleasant. Yes. Tomorrow night, Alicia Huberman is throwing a party. If it's a customary party, it'll be loud, long, and alcoholic. On Sunday, she plans to leave on a cruise with friends. I want you to find out if she'll go to work for us instead in South America. South America? Yes, Rio de Janeiro. Well, here's the whole file on Miss Huberman. Look it over and then start asking questions. Do this often, Miss Huberman? Leave your party, go for rides at two in the morning? Oh, I thought you invited me to take a ride. Didn't, it, didn't think you'd accept. Oh, oh. Yeah, don't you think I'd better drive? No. No, I thought that was understood. Or do you think I'm drunk? Oh, huh? no, uh, no. You no. know something, Mr. Uh, uh, well, Devlin. Devlin, Devlin. How do you get to my party? <laughs> the Hopkins, remember? No. No, I don't remember. Anyway, you were saying... Anyway, I like you. You're quite a boy, aren't you? Oh, huh? terrific. How am I doing? 80 miles an hour. Oh, you can stop grinning. I don't like gentlemen who grin at me. <laughs> I was really grinning at the man in the mirror. What mirror? I mean, what man? A man on a motorcycle. We're being pursued. Cops. Oh, they make me sick. Oh, I'm glad you're stopping. I think this cop wants to talk oh. to you. Oh, am I drunk? If I am, I go to jail. Oh, my whole family in jail. Who cares? <laughs> Having a time for yourself, aren't you? you know, people like you ought to be in bed. And drinking, huh? Well, just a minute, officer. No arguments, mister. Yeah. Why do I want your license for? She was at the wheel. This isn't the driver's license. Huh? Oh. Sorry. Okay. Sure you can handle it? I think so. Well, you ought to know. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait. Uh, that, that, that cop, he saluted you. Did he? Why, you... Double-crossing. You're a cop yourself. Now, we'll argue about that later. Right now, I'm taking oh, you home. Get out of my now, car. Now, look. You're not taking me move anyway. Move over. I'll get drive. Out of, get your hands off me crashing yeah. my body. You are a federal cop, aren't you? I aren't said you? move over. Get out. Leave me alone. You're trying to get something on you me. You better calm down. Get out. Get out. Get out. Well, I'm sorry, Miss Huberman. First time this week I've socked a lady. <laughs> Morning, Alicia. Feeling any better? Oh, what do you care how I feel? You cop. <laughs> it's eight o'clock. Oh. Your other guest left about three hours ago. Oh, oh uh, want a refill for that ice bag? Say, so what's all this about? What's your angle? What angle? Why did you crash my party? I wanted hmm? to meet you. Oh, so you could frame me? No, I've got a job for you. Mm, don't tell me. There's only one job that you coppers would want me for, but I'm... I'm not a stool pigeon, Mr. Devlin. <laughs> My department has authorized me to offer you a job in Brazil. Oh, go away. Some of no. the German gentry whom your father once worked for are in Rio now, busy as little bees. I'm not interested. We're working with the Brazilian government to smoke them out. My chief thinks that the daughter of a... Of a traitor. Well, mm -hmm. he thinks you could be valuable to us and you could make up a little of your daddy's peculiarities. Why should I? Patriotism. Patriotism. <gasps> Uh, waving the flag in one hand and picking pockets with the other? That's your patriotism, and you can have it. What do you have? My own life. Go away and leave me alone. Your own life? What's that? Good times and laughs with people I like. No underhanded cops who want to set me up in a shooting gallery. People of my own kind who treat me right and like me and understand. I like Mr. Hopkins. What about Mr. Hopkins? Just phone. Said to remind you, his yacht sails at noon. They're all calling for you at 11. Oh, then why don't you get out of here? The plan to Rio leaves tomorrow morning. Then you must drop me a postcard, Mr. Devlin. Rio must be beautiful this time. We're coming into Rio, Miss Huberman. Well? Well, what? When are you going to ask me why I changed my mind? Why, I took a plane instead of a yacht. Well, you're here, aren't you? As soon as we land, we'll look up Mr. Prescott. Who is Mr. Prescott? Our boss. Mm -hmm. Miss Huberman, just now when I was talking to the pilot... I told you we were coming into Rio. He told me something else. A message came in over the radio. Your father. What about my father? He... He committed suicide this morning in his cell. Oh. I'm sorry. I don't know 
why I should care, but, but I do. When I found out about my father a few years ago, who he was, what he was doing, everything went to pot. I didn't care what happened to me, but, but now I suddenly remember how nice he, he once was, how nice we both once were. Anything I can do? No. No. It's a very curious feeling, as if something had happened to me, not to him. You see, I don't have to hate my father anymore. Or myself. Well, Dave, how do you like the apartment Mr. Prescott found for me? Well, it's very attractive. Will I be staying here? I wish I could tell you. I don't know. Well, will you know? Soon, I think. Huh? Prescott's meeting now with the Brazilian intelligence. Oh, so you fixed dinner, huh? Mm-hmm. Have time for another drink? Oh, thanks, I've had enough. Well, aren't you impressed? I'm practically on the wagon. Well, it's a phase. You don't think a woman can change? Sure. Change is fun for a while. For a while. You've been sober for ten days now, and as far as I know, you've made no new conquests. Well, that's something, isn't it? Mm, ten days. Practically whitewash. What, it, what a rat you are. I'm very happy, Dev. Why won't you let me be happy? Nobody's stopping you. Why don't you give that copper's brain of yours a rest? Every time you look at me tells you, no, 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 stay away from her, it says. She's no good. She never will be. Alicia. Go on, Dad. Go on. You can take my hand. I won't blackmail you for it afterwards. Thanks. You are afraid. Afraid you're falling in love with me? That wouldn't be hard to do. Oh, no, no, no. Careful, Debbie. Careful. Huh. You enjoy making fun of me, don't you? No. I'm making fun of myself. I'm pretending I'm a very nice, unspoiled child whose heart is full of daisies and buttercups. It's a nice daydream. Then what? I think I will have another drink. Yeah. Thought you'd get around to it. Why won't you believe in me, Dad? Just a little. Why won't you? How do you know I don't? I know because you're sore. You've fallen for me and you don't like it. No, people will laugh at you. Poor Dad. Poor Dad in love with a no-good gal, huh? It must be awful. Come here. Hey. Don't say anything, Dad. Just kiss me. Don't say anything. What's the matter with you, Devlin? Something wrong? Wrong? No, no. Nothing's wrong, Prescott. I, uh, I'm sorry I had to send for you. I'm sorry I interrupted your date with Miss Huberman. Yeah. Well, here's the setup. Okayed by Brazil Intelligence. The leader of the German agents here in Rio is a man named Alex Sebastian. Well, if we know who he is, why can't we pick him up? Oh, sure, sure, we could pick him up. The next day, someone else takes his place, and whatever it is they're working on continues. Their headquarters is Sebastian's home. We need somebody to get inside that house. Somebody in Sebastian's confidence. In other words, Alicia Huberman. Right. You said you were having dinner with her when I called. I'll go back to her apartment then and tell her. She's good at making friends with gentlemen, hey, so... that's meant to be funny, I... The devil's eating you. I... I don't know if she'll do it. You haven't even discussed it. No, but... I don't think she's that type of woman. She, she's never been trained for that kind of work. They'll, they'll see through her. Miss Huberman was chosen for two reasons. One, her father was a Nazi agent. Two, Sebastian once knew her in Washington. Sebastian knew her? Yes, he was in love with her. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, you know it now. We've got to get Miss Huberman inside his house and find out what's going on there. How, uh, how does she meet him? Well, I think the riding club would be best. Sebastian rides every morning. The rest is up to you and Miss Huberman. You've hardly said a word, Deb. My cooking isn't that bad. It's a little well done, maybe, but still. I'm sorry I was so late getting back. Uh, Prescott, uh... Please. Uh, What's the matter, Deb? Trouble? In a way. All this secrecy is going to ruin my little dinner. Come on, handsome. What is darkening your brow? Uh, later. No, no, no. Now. Look, I'll make it easy for you. The time has come when you must tell me that you have a wife and two adorable children, and this madness between us can go on no longer. But you've heard that line often enough. Oh, that wasn't fair, Deb. Then skip it. You remember a man named Sebastian? Alex Sebastian? Yes. He was one of my father's friends. I had quite a crush on you. Oh, I wasn't very responsive. Well, he's in town. 
part of the combine that built up the German war machine. He hopes to keep on going. Something big? All the earmarks. We'll have to contact him. Go on. Let's have all of it. We're meeting him tomorrow morning, and you're going to go to work on him. Mata Haring. She makes love for the secret papers? Prescott's orders? Yes. Did you say anything? Well, I mean that maybe I wasn't the right girl for such shenanigans. No. I figured that was up to you if... if you cared to back out. Mm -hmm. I suppose you told him that Alicia Huberman will have this Sebastian eating out of her hand in a couple of weeks. She's so good at that. Always I didn't say anything. Not a word? For the little lovesick lady who cooked dinner for you? I told you that's the assignment. Don't get cross, Deb. I'm only fishing for a little bird call from my... my dream man. One little remark such as... uh, how dare you suggest that Alicia Huberman, don't you, Miss Huberman, be submitted to so That's ugly a fate? That's not funny either. Oh, darling. What you didn't tell Prescott, tell me. That you believe I'm nice. And that I love you and that I'll never change back. I'm waiting for your answer. What a little pal you are. Never believing in not a word of faith. Just down the drain with Alicia. That's where she belongs. Oh, death. Ah, pour me a drink and tell me what I do for Uncle Sam. We'll meet Sebastian on the bridal path. When he questions you about me, I'm with Pan American Airways Public Relations. Anything else? I happen to meet you on the plane from Miami. The less the tale, the better. That's all. That's all. My beautiful dinner. Cold. Cold as ice. <laughs> I can't get over it, Alicia. Meeting you this morning, (laughs) all places of bridal path in Rio de Janeiro. How do you know I wasn't looking for you, Alex? Oh, if I could only believe that. (laughs) You should. Didn't I prevail upon you to take me to dinner? Uh Ah, prevail. (laughs) You look very well, Alex. After four years here, dullness and disintegration. You look younger than you did in Washington. Entirely due to your presence, Alicia. You always affected me like a tonic. Who are you looking at, my dear? That man who just came in. Do you know him? I, I don't think I do. His name is Prescott. Espionage. Oh. The American embassy is loaded with them. Really? They bothered you since you came here? No, 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 not yet. That's one reason I left Miami, to get away from their snow queen. I wondered why you left your father. He insisted, Alex. He was so unselfish. He kept begging me to leave. I had no idea he, he was going to die. Many have died, Alicia. We mustn't let our spirit die with them. Perhaps I can help you forget. Oh, Alex. There's... There's someone else, of course. Is there? Who, Alicia? That uh, Mr. Devlin who was with you this morning? <laughs> Mr. Devlin doesn't interest me in the least. I, I've i just been so lonely. I could have gone riding this morning with Peter Rabbit. <laughs> you will let me help your loneliness? Oh, you're very sweet to forget what a, what a brat I was once. Well, then I'll test your repentance immediately. Will you have dinner with me again tomorrow night? My mother's giving a little party at home. Oh, Alex, how nice. Are you sure she won't mind an extra guest? Oh, an old friend is never an extra guest. (laughs) Thank you, Alex. You look very beautiful, Miss Huberman. Don't you agree, Devlin? Sebastian is sending his car for Miss Huberman. I suggest we get out of her apartment. Oh, there's time. Now, part of your job tonight, Miss Huberman, will be to get the names of all the men you see in Sebastian's house. You mean the Germans? That won't be difficult. Don't underestimate them. They're a very keen and desperate bunch. Anything else? No, nothing. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, uh, unless you have something urgent to report, we'd better avoid each other for the next few days, just in case Sebastian's crowd wants to check on you after the night. Very well. And don't meet here when you do. What about the racetrack, Devlin? The racetrack's fine. We can arrange a date by phone. Night, Alicia. Miss Huberman, well, well, good afternoon. Mr. Devlin, how nice seeing you again. Uh, picking any winners? You alone? No, Alex and his mother. Where? In the box in the clubhouse. I'm sure they can't see us. Play it safe and keep smiling. Yes. Well? I've seen Alex twice since the dinner at his house. Who was there? His mother, her servant named Joseph, hmm. and four other men. William Rosner, Eric Matisse, Emil Hupke, and Professor Anderson. Go on. Have you ever heard of Anderson? No. He, he's some kind of scientist, medium height, gentle face, uh, 60 years old, uh-huh. gray hair, deep crease on his forehead. 
You writing this down? Oh, I'm just trying to check these horses on my program. Uh, look happy, will you? What about him? Who heard of him? No. He made quite a scene at the dinner about a bottle of wine. A bottle of wine? Yes, it was on the buffet. Hooker became quite excited. He said it should be removed at once. Well, what happened? They just ignored him and kept this conversation going. Hooker seemed quite flustered, apologetic. I, I couldn't figure it out. Did they serve the wine? No, not that particular bottle. Do you think it had any significance? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, what brand was it? All I saw of the label was... Vintage, 1939, 1934. Has Hooper pulled anything since? I haven't seen him since. Well, what else? Just a minor item you may want for the record. Well? You can add Sebastian's name to my list of playmates. Oh, pretty fast work. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? His mother suspects me. What? Oh, don't worry. She believes I'm after her son's money. You betting on this race, Mr. Devlin? We're about to start. No. Alex says number 10 is sure to oh, win. I can't help recalling some of your remarks about being a new woman. Daisies and buttercups, wasn't it? What are you angry about? You knew very well what I was doing. Did I? You could have stopped me with one word. No, you threw me at it. I threw it, you know. Now keep your eyes on the race. Use your binoculars. Didn't you tell me to go ahead? A man doesn't tell a woman what to do. A woman tells herself. You almost had me believing in that little hokey-pokey miracle of yours that a woman like you could change her spot. Oh, you were right. That's why I didn't try to stop you. The answer had to come from you. I see some kind of luck. That's right. But you never believed in me anyway, so what's the difference? Yeah. I got you number 10. What if I had believed in you? What if I had figured she could never go through with it? She's been made over by love. You only once have said that you loved me. Oh, listen. You chalked up another boyfriend. That's all. No harm done. I hate you. No occasion to. You're doing fine work. I'll see that they're told. Who? Oh. We're having a meeting tomorrow with Barbosa, Brazilian intelligence. In case you're interested, number 10 is winning the race. Yeah, Sebastian knows how to pick them. That's all you've got to say to Oh, you. dry your eyes, baby. It's out of character. And be quick about it. Here comes Dreamboat. Oh, no. Oh. Mr. Devlin. Sebastian. Oh, Alex. Oh, what a wonderful race. Alicia tells me you had a bet on that number 10. Sorry I didn't meet you early, Alicia. Well, I'll see you soon, I hope. Yes. What's the matter, Alex? You're not at all excited about the race? I didn't see the race. I was watching you and Mr. Devlin. You had an appointment to meet him here? Oh, don't be absurd. I just happened to bump into him. You didn't appear anxious to get away. Oh. I watched you. I thought maybe you were in love with him. Alex, really, I detest him. Well, I'd like to be convinced. Would you maybe care to convince me, Alicia? <laughs> You know Mr. Devlin, Senor Barbosa? Yeah. Mr. Devlin. And this is Mr. Beardsley, also of our office. How do you do? Senor Barbosa, Brazilian intelligence. Sit down, gentlemen. Well? Our little theatrical plan is working, Senor. Good. Thanks to Miss Huberman, we know that Otto Rensler is working here in Rio. He was one of Hitler's scientific wizards, now known as Professor Anderson. Anderson? And that body found in the surf two days ago. Yes, identify. His description fits Emil Hooker. One of the boys who must have said the right thing at the wrong time. I'd still like to know about that wine bottle. Excuse me, senor. Uh, yes? Miss Huberman has seen Mr. Prescott or Mr. Devlin. Here? Yes, sir. Show her in. I don't like this or coming here. Uh, she's had me worried for some time. A woman of that sort. What sort is that, Mr. Beardsley? Oh, I don't think any of us have any illusions about Miss Huberman, have we, Devlin? Not the slightest. Miss Huberman is first, last, and always not a lady. She may be risking her life, but when it comes to being a lady, she doesn't hold a candle to your wife, sir, sitting in Washington playing bridge with three other ladies of great and impeachable honor. Take it easy, Dev. Sorry. Well, I think those remarks about my wife are uncalled for. Go on, I apologize. Oh, come in, Miss Huberman. Mr. Beardsley, Senor Barbosa. How do you do? Senorita, you have the esteem of my government. But we're worried about your vesting this office. I promise not to break the rules again, but I need advice. I couldn't find Mr. Something Devlin. happened? Yes. Mr. Sebastian has asked me to marry him. Well, well. I'm to give him my answer at lunch. I didn't know what the department might think about such a move. You're willing to go that far for us, Miss Huberman? Yes. If you wish. Devlin, may I ask what inspired Sebastian to go this far? He's in love with me. And he thinks you're in love with him? Yes, that's what he thinks. Gentlemen, it is the cream of the jest. Then, then it is all right. Oh, it's an ideal marriage. For us. Yes, everything seems to be arranged perfectly. I don't think you need me here any longer, Prescott. Oh, no, but we... Uh... Oh, excuse me, then. Uh, 
Oh, uh, congratulations, Alicia. Thank you, Beth. I knew you'd be impressed. In a moment, we will return with Act Two of Notorious. Meanwhile, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. I looked for you last Monday evening, Libby, at the Metro Golden Mayor premiere of Cast Timberland. Oh, I was there, Mr. Keeley. <laughs> But I don't wonder you didn't see me in those crowds. It certainly was an exciting opening. It looked as if practically every star in Hollywood turned out to see the screen version of Sinclair Lewis's powerful novel. You know, it seemed just as dramatic the second time, even though I'd seen a preview at the studio. Spencer Tracy is marvelous in the title role. With Lana Turner for romantic interest, well, it just couldn't miss. The triangular love story is always a great theme. Especially when Zachary Scott is the rival for Lana Turner's love. A perfect cast and a gripping play like that is every producer's dream. <laughs> and every feminine moviegoer will envy Lana Turner when, as Ginny in Cast Timberlane, she goes on a shopping spree in New York. She buys herself an expensive glamour wardrobe, including some wonderfully wispy nylon stockings. I said to myself, if John Kennedy here had been technical advisor... He would have included a shot of her buying Lux Flakes to take care of them. Well, Libby, it's highly improbable or highly probable that Sinclair Lewis heroine did. Because smart women everywhere know that Lux makes stockings last long. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I know that the studio kept those stockings lovely as new for retakes by washing them with Lux Flakes after every wearing. A wise procedure for women everywhere. Because tests show that stockings actually last twice as long when they're washed with Lux. It was really surprising how quickly identical stockings, washed with a strong soap or rubbed with cake soap, went into runs. The luxed ones kept going twice as long, and the colors looked so much fresher, too. That extra wear is just like getting an extra pair of stockings every time you buy a pair. That's why Lux Flakes are America's favorite stocking care. We return you now to William Keeley. Continuing with Act Two of Notorious, starring Ingrid Bergman as Alicia and Joseph Cotton as Devlin. A few hours have passed. Elated by Alicia's consent to marry him, Alex Sebastian has just brought the news to his mother. Marry her? What are you, a moonstruck boy? Of course she is beautiful, but... But what? But many things. Her sympathies, for instance. Where do they lie? I've told you a dozen times, Mother. Alicia does not concern herself with politics. At her father's trial, why did she not testify on his behalf? Because her father insisted she be kept clear of it. So she says. Mother, are you accusing Alicia of lying? I accuse only you. Thinking of marriage at a time like this. Risking everything we have worked for. Suffered for. Oh, Alicia knows nothing. She will know nothing. But I know. Know what? That she came here for one purpose. To capture the rich Alex Sebastian for her husband. Ah. And she has succeeded. Oh, you're being absurd. We will discuss it more fully tonight. We will not discuss it tonight. You're jealous, just as you've always been jealous of any woman I've been interested in. Now, Alicia and I shall be married next week. Be private. We shall both be pleased to have you present, if you wish. Come in, Joseph. Did you want something? Only to tell you how happy I am that you and Mr. Sebastian are home again. The house needs you, madame. Thank you. You had a pleasant wedding trip? Very. Oh, as long as you're here, Joseph, my clothes. I'd like all my dresses put out on the bed, please. I have aired all the closets, madame. Mm, but there isn't enough closet space in this bedroom. Isn't there a storeroom down the hall? Uh, yes, madame. But the door, it is locked. Then bring me the key, please. Mr. Sebastian's mother, madame, she has all the house keys. Oh. Do you know where Mr. Sebastian is? I believe he is having a business meeting in his study. Business meeting? Professor Anderson, madame. Yes. And the other gentleman. What are you saying, Professor? That I have news for you, my friends. My work is done. Oh, you've been successful. Yes, Alex, yes. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, Alicia, my dear. Come in. Oh, I didn't know you were busy, Alex. Some of the closets seem to have been locked. Could you give me the keys? The keys? You mean my mother hasn't given... Yes, I'll get them for you at once. Excuse me, gentlemen. Shall I go with you, Alex? No, you just wait in your room, Alicia. Mother! Mother, where are you? 
Are you sure this is all right, Ted? Meeting you like this in a public park? Oh, stop worrying. You're talking about keys. Yes. His mother keeps them. Yes, all but one. The key to the wine cellar. Alex keeps that one himself. Joseph told me. Then get it from him. Get it? How? Don't you live near him? What do I look for in the wine cellar? Look for a bottle of wine like, like that one that unnerved the late Mr. Hooker. Vintage 1934. All wine bottle look... Bottles look alike to me. I'm no master, You're doing all right. It's no fun, Dad. Uh, too late for that now, isn't it? Look, why don't you persuade your husband to throw a large shindig and introduce his bride to Rio Society next week, say? Why? Invite me and I'll try to find out about that wine cellar. I don't think my husband's interested in entertaining. Don't underestimate your charms, Mrs. Sebastian. You can promote a party. It won't be easy getting you there. He thinks you're in love with me. Then, uh, tell him that you think if you invited me and I could see how happily married you are, the horrid passion I have for you might diminish. Uh, I'll try. Good. And get the key. I'll be looking forward to seeing you, Mr. Depp. It's always a pleasure meeting you, madame. Good day. <laughs> Still shaving, Alex? Oh, do hurry, dear. Our guests will be arriving soon. Oh, don't tell me your dress. Of course. Oh, let me let me look at you. Well? Oh, Alicia. <laughs> like a dream. A dream. <laughs> now, please hurry, dear. Oh, don't go. Stay there and talk. Oh, what about? Oh, your dressing table. What's wrong with my dressing table? Do you mean to say you carry all these things around in your pockets? <laughs> Oh, what thing? Oh, talk about a woman's purse. Look at this litter. Papers and letters, two wallets, cigarette case, cigarette holder, keys, <laughs> keys. You know, you know, my dear, I'm really surprised that Mr. Devlin's coming tonight. The key to the wine cellar. Alicia. Y yes, dear. You're suddenly silent. Don't worry. I don't blame anyone for falling in love with you. Oh, it's not that I don't trust you, darling, but when you're in love at my age... Alicia, is anything wrong? Wrong? Oh, my word, you look so serious. Oh, I'm a fool. I should never have mentioned Devlin. Forgive me, darling. Of course. Well? What? What do you want? Hold your hand, dear. Mayn't oh. I kiss your hand? Oh, Alicia, not that <laughs> clenched up little fist. Are you hiding oh, something Alex, in your hand? Alex, doesn't it occur to you that, that I might like to kiss you, too? Oh, Alicia. Alicia. Good evening, Mr. Sebastian. Mr. Devlin, I'm glad to see you. It's kind of your bride to invite me. Well, we both invited you, Mr. Devlin. Uh, Excuse me, Alicia. I must introduce Madame Astrid. The key? Yeah, in my hand. Good. Well, this won't be easy. He's quite sensitive about you. He's going to be watching us like a hawk. How's the liquor supply up here? What do you mean? I mean, if it should run out, he'd go down to the cellar for more, wouldn't oh, he? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. That's quite a point. But you must work fast. I can't. I'm supposed to be a guest here. I'll slip away later on. You better go to your friends. I'll find you. It's a nice party, isn't it, Alicia? It's a wonderful party. You handle things perfectly. I'm very proud. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. What, what happened to Mr. Devlin? I haven't seen him for an hour. Oh, he's around, I imagine, trying to drown his sorrows. Oh? Excuse me, dear. I think I'll ask the office to play something lively, or we've had nothing but waltzes all evening. This is the pantry, huh? Yes. Anyone see you come in here? No, I don't think so. And uh, is this the door to the wine cellar? Yes, for heaven's sake, Dev, hurry. Oh, lots of time. I I'll be out in the garden. There's a door from the wine cellar that leads to the garden. When you get downstairs, open it. You'll be there? Yes, I'll be there in case anything happens. Now, hurry. in it. Look. Sand. 
sand. It was, it was filled with sand. It, it couldn't be sand. Probably some kind of metal ore. I've got to try to clean this up. I'll push the glass under the bottom shelf. What, what, what about the sand? I'm taking some of it for a sample. It's a little weird, isn't it? Here. Here, I'll put this bottle in place of the one you broke. It has the same label. Stop shaking. Well, I have a feeling we're so slow. Well, I... Shh. Someone's come. No, relax. Look, there is. Listen. Yeah, get out of here. No, 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 not upstairs. The door to the garden. But he's coming that Keep way. Keep quiet. It's Alex. He sees us. Keep looking at me. No. I'm going to kiss you. No, no, he'll only think that... That's what I wanted to think. There. Oh, there. It's almost as if we meant it, wasn't it? Now, push me away. I'm sorry to intrude on this tender scene. Alex, Alex, I... I couldn't help it. He's been drinking. Why are you out here? Or did he carry you off? Oh, Alex. You love him. Oh, no, no, I don't. Please go, Ted, please. For what it's worth as an apology, Mr. Sebastian, your wife is telling the truth. I knew her before you, loved her before you, but wasn't as lucky as you. Sorry, Alicia. He kissed you. Oh, Alex, don't I... I came out here because he threatened to make a scene unless I'd seen yes, him alone. He kissed you. But I couldn't stop him. I tried. Oh, I don't. We'll talk about it later. We have guests inside. You are not coming with me? I came to get more wine. No, I, I'd better go back with you. People... People may wonder. Alicia, darling, it's late. I thought you went upstairs long ago. I've been helping Joseph clean up. Besides, you you said you wanted to see me. Oh, uh, uh, Devlin. Yes. Oh, I acted like a stupid schoolboy. Once again, I'm ashamed of myself. You do believe me? Oh, Alicia, of course. Thank you. Aren't you coming up there? No, not for a while. Professor Anderson's still in the study. Sleep well, Alicia. Good night, Alex. Thanks for being so nice. Mother! Mother! Come in. Why are you up so early? I need your help. Something is wrong. It's a great deal. Alicia! I have expected it. I knew it. I knew. Who is it? Mr. Devlin? No, no. It's much more serious than that. I am married to an American agent. Alicia. Late last night after she went to bed, Joseph came to me. There were some bottles to be returned to the cellar. He asked me for the key. This key. It was gone. Gone? Where was it? Ten minutes ago when I woke up, it was back on my keychain. She'd been down there, the wine cellar. It is easy to see now. I knew long ago, but I did not see. They picked her up because of her father. No. I must have been insane to behave like an idiot, to believe in her. Oh, stop wallowing in your memories. But I'm done, Mother. I'm finished. They'll find out. Anderson, Eric, Martis, Rossner. Oh, look what they did to Hoopka. He did next to nothing, and I betrayed them. I do the same thing myself. Kill the fool who betrayed them. There is no need for them to find out. Oh, they're too clever. Who would imagine that you are married to an American agent? No. For a while, at least, the enormity of your stupidity is your protection. But Alicia, I'll take care of her myself. No, not that way. I stood looking at her just now. She lay sleeping in there. Be so easy. You are almost as impetuous as you were before your wedding. You barred me from that episode. Let me arrange this one. No one else must know what she is. There must be no suspicion. She must be allowed to move about freely. But she will be on a leash. Then, then, in time, it will happen. But it must happen slowly. She will become ill. Remain ill for a time. Until one day... We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. stars will return with Act Three of Notorious in a moment. Our guest tonight is that rarity in movie town, a native Californian, long blue-eyed Jacqueline White. 
I understand you've been interested in a movie career since childhood, Jacqueline. That's right, Mr. Keeley. And now you've seen your dream come true with many successful picture roles. Well, I was especially happy with my part in RKO's new picture, Night Song. You gave a very fine performance, Jacqueline, as Merle Oberon's best friend. She was wonderful in her role, Mr. Keeley. It's an inspiring performance. And Dana Andrews at his best in those tender, sensitive love scenes with Merle. Dana told me he really enjoyed playing the part of a composer because he loves music so. There's plenty of that in Night Song, and for every taste. I loved every minute we were working. But I did have a twinge of envy when I saw those gorgeous clothes designed for Merle Oberon. One negligee in particular. It was very simply made, but the softest, most beautiful satin imaginable. Merle told me she was going to have it copied for her own wardrobe. And uh, John Kennedy might be interested in something else she said about it. Something about luck? Oh, yes. Because she didn't think it would wash until the studio luxed it, and it came out lovely. Was she impressed? RKO, just like other leading Hollywood studios, insists on Lux care for all nice washables. So what could be safer for a star's own lovely things? Or for any girl's? And here's another interesting point. Did you know that with Lux care, you can have three times as many pretty underthings? Well, that's for me, Mr. Kennedy. But how do you figure it? Well, underthings washed the Lux way stay lovely three times as long. Tests prove that. Identical slips and nighties washed the wrong way soon look faded and drab. So, instead of replacing slips often because they're old-looking, you can buy extra new ones, have three times as many. And as you say, Jacqueline, that's something any girl would like. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss White. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. Be sure to join us after our final curtain for a brief chat with tonight's stars. Here's the third act of Notorious, starring Ingrid Bergman as Alicia and Joseph Cotton as Devlin. The passing days have brought to Alicia not the slightest inkling that her husband and his mother are well aware of her real purpose in the Sebastian residence. Now, in response to a phone call from Prescott, Alicia meets Devlin in a quiet corner of a public park. I'm sorry I couldn't make it on time, Dad. Gets a bit lonely squatting on a park bench all day. I was ill. Oh, don't let it alarm you. I'm all right now. Prescott said you'd have a message for me. I want you to know you can be proud of yourself. That sample of sand I got shows uranium ore. Your job from now on is to help us find out where the ore is coming from. Anything else? Putting some new men on the case, you may soon have a new contact. You're leaving? Possibly. Paris may be more interesting. Yes. Yes, there really isn't very much for a brainy fellow like you to do here anymore. That's right. I'm going stale, I... Say, so you don't look so hot. Well, this fresh air will help me. Drink too much, son? No, oh, don't be so charitable, Death. It could be a hangover, you know. Back to the bottle again, huh? It lightens my chores. Big party? Oh, just a family circle. Must have been quite an evening. Well, go on, have fun. There's no reason why you shouldn't. No. Well, goodbye, Death. You mean goodbye? Just goodbye. Goodbye, fresh air isn't as good for hangovers, I thought. Sit down, you're still tight. No, I, I don't want to. Where are you going? Home, back home. Alex is coming home early. I'd better be there. Alex, the drug. You were able to get some more. Yes, I've got it. Mother, you're sure? You're sure she doesn't suspect? She knows she is ill. That is all. She is going to feel a little worse after dinner. As a matter of fact, right after she drinks her coffee. Well, we might all go into the living room. Joseph will bring our coffee in there. Alicia. Yes, Professor. My dear, you uh, you don't look at all well. Alice, what, uh, what's wrong with her? We, we, we just don't know. <laughs> it's those highballs I sneak on the side. Balls? Oh, darling, don't <laughs> joke about it. Why, she hasn't had so much as a sherry all week. Well, hadn't you better see the doctor, Alicia? I never go near doctors. They always want to cart you off to a hospital. <laughs> Perhaps you belong in a hospital. When did all this start? Oh, no, I don't know. Maybe maybe after the party. I still I think a sea trip would be much better for you, darling, than doctors and hospitals. Oh, no, no, no. I'll be all right. What about the mountains? Altitude fresh air. I'm going next week. Oh, you're leaving us, Professor. I'm sorry. I'll miss you. Well, you could come with me. 
The Amores Mountains are beautiful, covered with flowers. What Alicia needs is rest, not mountain climbing. I've heard about the Amores and those, those little native towns. Are you going to Leopoldina? No, no, no. I am going to Santa Maria. Well, here's our coffee. Just leave it, Joseph. I'll serve. Yes, madame. <laughs> I will not allow you to wait on me, madame. I can serve myself. No, that uh, is not your cup. My cup? No, that, that's Alicia's cup. Well, what I... uh, it's, it's not quite full, you'll notice. <laughs> oh, you're giving our little secret away, Professor. Oh. Yes, we, we have a confession. You know how Alicia loves coffee, Professor. Alex and I think she has been taking too much. We... Cheat a little. Here you are, dear. Thank you. Ah, is it, uh, is it hot enough? It's fine, Alex. Uh, perhaps Alex is right, Alicia. About rest. When you are young, rest is the best, Doctor. Ah. Uh, oh, excuse me, Alicia. I want to go to bed, I think. Oh, the pain again, darling. I'm sorry to complain all the time. May I take you to your room? Oh, please forgive me. I'll be all right. Alex, I, I'm worried about her. We wanted to call a doctor yesterday. But she simply... Mr. Wo- Sebastian! Mr. Sebastian! Yes? What is it, Joseph? Mr. Sebastian! She collapsed! No. No, no. Go away. No. It's all right, Alicia. No. It's all right. You'll feel better soon. No, I... You're here in your own bed. I don't want... Please let me call the hospital. Professor, uh... you're already late for your meeting with Eric Matisse. Oh. Yes, I... I must go, I suppose, mm. Good night. I'll go to the door. Joseph. Yes, madam? She must have absolute quiet. Disconnect I... the telephone. No, no. Take it out of the room, Joseph. No. Five days now, Prescott. Alicia hasn't been near the park for five days. Uh, she was to check with one of us at least every other day. Yeah. That must be quite a bin she's on. No. No, I don't think so. Well, you were the one who said she was drinking. I've had time to think it over, I don't believe it, now. Why should she lie about it? I don't know. I, I don't know, but it, it wasn't a hangover. She was sick. She looked like the ragged end of nowhere. Yeah, well, it still sounds like a hangover to me. Well, I'm... I'm going to pay a call. Now, wait a minute. Don't worry. I won't mess anything up. Just a social call. I'm a friend of the family. Well, call me when you get back. I'll do that. <laughs> for a man about to be leaving for Paris, I... want to I'd... talk to you later about that. I'd like to see that transfer held up for a while. I'm very sorry, Mr. Devlin. Mr. Sebastian asked me not to disturb him. Company? He's in the study with some business associates, sir. How long will he be tied up? I do not know. Mrs. Sebastian at home? Yes, sir, but she is very ill. Oh. Oh, uh, how long has she been ill? A week, sir. Has she had a doctor? I believe so, sir. I really do not know. We are very concerned about her. If you will wait here, Mr. Devlin... I will tell Mr. Sebastian. Let's go on, Professor. This sounds serious to me. Yes. What happened Monday? The same thing, Eric. When I left the bank, a man was following me. And and, and this morning when I I went to the ticket office, he was there again. Yes? I'm very sorry, sir. But Mr. Devlin is calling. Oh, uh, tell him I'll be with him in a minute. Yes, sir. Now, the ticket office. What man, Professor? What did he look like? Obviously not a Brazilian. It's hard to describe him. Alex. Mr. Devlin, he's waiting. Well, I, uh, let him wait here. This is terrible news, Professor. This is terrible. Alicia. Alicia. Tim. Tim. Oh. How did you get up here? Uh, I'm supposed to be downstairs waiting for your husband. Oh. Oh, I'm so glad you came. I couldn't stand it anymore, waiting and wondering. Alicia, what is it? I'm sick. They're poisoning me. I couldn't get away, Dad. I tried when I was too weak. How long? Ever since the party. Alex and his mother, they found out. Come on. Try to sit up. Yes. Here. Let me help you. I've got to get you out of here. I thought you'd left real. Oh, I, I had to see you once more and speak my piece. I was I was getting up because I love you. I couldn't bear seeing you and him together. You love me. Uh, but why didn't you tell me before? Oh, I, I just couldn't oh. see straight, think straight. You love me. Long ago, all the time since the beginning. Here. Here, darling, your robe. I can't tell. I'm afraid they gave me pills to sleep. Yeah, you've got to keep awake. Keep talking. Keep talking. 
Jim, my coat, put it over your robe. Alex, Alex and his mother, they, they don't want the others to know about me. They... Don't stop talking. What happened? Alex found out. Not the others? No. No, they'd kill Alex if they knew. Matisse would kill him. He killed Emil Hoopke. Yeah, put your arm around me. Yes. You've got to stand up. Oh, damn. I say it again. It helps. I love you. I love you. Alicia, please, stand up. Come on, talk, talk. Professor Anderson. Yes. Sand comes from Imoris, Mom. We'll find it. A town called Santa, Santa Massa. Good, good. We'll take care of that later. Now you're on your feet, Alicia. Yeah. Now move them. Mm. Move them. Walk. Start walking. They're all down there. And you stop. We can't make then it. You've made the doorway. The stairs aren't far. I've got hold of you, darling. Yes. You've got to walk yourself. If you don't keep moving, you... Oh, don't ever leave me. Mm -hmm. You'll never get rid of me again. I never tried to, Dad. Brace up. Yes. Here he comes. What is this? Oh. What are you doing, Alicia? What is this, Mr. Devlin? I'm taking her to the hospital to get the poison out of her. Poison? How would you like your friends down there to know? I'm taking Alicia back to her room. No, Dad, no. I've got a gun, Sebastian. No. It'll raise quite a rumpus if you try. Alex, be quiet, Mother. Alex, he knows. Yes. What is happening, Alex? Alicia. She yes. Now stay right where you are, Sebastian. Yeah, go on. Go. We're going there. We're going downstairs. You haven't forgotten what they did to Emil Hoopker, have you, Sebastian? Help you, Alex. Yeah, I'm glad you have a head on you, madame. I'm not afraid to die. You've got your chance to die right here and now. Just call your friends to come out in the hall and tell them who Alicia really is. You need any help, Alex? No, we can handle her. Now where are you taking her? You answer that one, Sebastian. To the hospital. Alex, talk to them. I'm glad she's going, Alex. You should have waited not this long. Well, what do I do, Sebastian? Start shooting? Oh. Hold on, darling. Hold on. Only 20 yards to go out yes. the front door and then into my car. Alex, what are you doing? Who's that one? Matisse, Eric, Matisse. Alex? Uh, uh, we're, we're taking Alicia to the hospital, Eric. She had another attack. Uh, Mr. Devlin heard her scream as he was waiting for me. Uh, uh, come, Alicia, come, yeah. come. I phoned the hospital as soon as I saw how she was, Mr. Matisse. Why didn't you send for an ambulance? Here, Alex. Your coat. Oh. You are not going with them, madame? No. Alex will call me. I'll wait here. Oh, the poor child. Yeah. I'll open the door. A few more steps, Alicia. Yeah. How do you feel? Oh, the air. Dizzy. Take some, take some deep breaths. Uh, I'll open the car door. Oh, you made it. You made it, Alicia. Sit down, darling. Yes. Easy. Yes. Easy now. Hurry, please. Hurry. They're in the doorway. They're watching me. Close the door, Sebastian. Just a minute. I must go with you. No room, Sebastian. You must take me. I can't go back to That's them. That's your headache. Please, please. Please. Alex. Come here. Alicia. Alicia. I have just been up to her room. There is no telephone in her room, Alex. How could he have called the hospital? Alex. Will you come in, please? We wish to talk to you. Before our stars return for their curtain call, Libby Collins and I have some really big news for the ladies. A brand new, easy-to-enter contest. Tell about the wonderful prizes first, John. They're just about the most sensational prizes you ever heard of. $100,000 in gorgeous furs and cash. Imagine, first prize every week for five weeks is a $3,000 mink coat. And if there's a girl in this country who wouldn't like a mink coat, I haven't heard of her. And there are other superb prizes, too. Three fur coats worth $1,000 each. Five fur jackets worth $500 apiece. Twenty fur scarves, each valued at $200. Fifty scarves worth $100 apiece. And that's not all. There are 250 additional prizes every week. Each one, a crisp $10 bill. And here's a really unusual feature. We don't select the fur for you. No, ma'am. You choose it yourself. The kind of fur, the style you want, at any furrier you want. Or you can take your prize in cash if you prefer. There's a contest every single week for five weeks. So if you don't win the first time, try again. This is just about the easiest contest to enter you ever heard of. Here's all you do. On entry blank, available at your dealer, or on any piece of paper, write 25 words or less telling why you like any one of six famous lever products. Lux Flakes, Lux Toilet Soap, Life Boy, Rinseau, Swan, or Spry. Yes, any one of these products, 
and you can send in as many entries as you wish every week. Just be sure to include with each entry a wrapper or box top from any one of these six lever products. Print your name and address on your letter, together with the name and address of the dealer from whom you buy your lever products. Mail your entry to Lever, L-E-V-E-R, Lever Fur Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. The first contest closes in just about two weeks, February 8th. So get your entry in tonight or tomorrow, sure. Entries received after this date will be entered in the next week's contest. Winners of the big prizes will be announced on this program. Incidentally, you have to live in the continental United States, Alaska, or Hawaii to enter. The contests are subject to all federal, state, and local regulations and to the complete rules printed on entry blanks you can get from your dealer. Now, I'll repeat. Just write 25 words about why you like any lever product. Lux Lake, Lux Toilet Soap, Life Boy, Rinso, Swan, or Spry. Be sincere. Give us your own experience. Print your name and address on your letter. Print your dealer's name and address, too. Because if he helps you to win, he too will get a prize. Enclose a wrapper or box top from one of these six products. Address your letter to Lever, L-E-V-E-R, Lever Fur Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. I'll repeat that. Lever Fur Contest, Box 1, New York 8, New York. There are five weekly contests. You can enter as often as you wish. So get busy, and a beautiful fur coat may soon be yours. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. It's time for that tradition of the theater, a curtain call for our stars. And here they are at the footlights, Ingrid Bergman and Joseph Cotton. We enjoyed you both immensely in tonight's play. And incidentally, Ingrid, one could say that word notorious applies to the kind of character you play in your next Enterprise production. I guess you could say that of Joan Madubil, whom I play with Charles Boyer in Archer Crown. Very different kind of Joan, then, from the one you're currently so famous for. Nothing alike but the names, Joan. I understand, Ingrid, you've become quite a winter sports enthusiast these days. And my husband and I just returned from four weeks of skiing, Bill. Well, there's nothing like skiing. Well, the way I do it, there's nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were a skiing enthusiast, Joe. Oh, yes. Down south, where I come from, I used to get quite a kick out of it. Oh, no. They, they have snowed on down south. Not much, but they have those newsreel theaters where you can sit with, where you watch the experts whizzing down frozen mountainsides while you sit comfortable and warm. That's really getting pleasure out of skiing. <laughs> oh, while Joe does his armchair exercise next Monday night, Bill, what will you be presenting in this theater? Next week from 20th Century Fox, a rollicking romance of the theater. The backstage adventure of a lovable, laughable couple in their climb to success. It's that musical screen hit, Mother Wore Tights. Starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. And in this warm, nostalgic story... Betty and Dan present those popular songs that made the original screenplay such a smash success. Yes, Mother Wore Tights was a great hit, Bill. And it ought to make a great hit with your audience next Monday, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night, and thanks for the call. <laughs> Most of us are happy insofar as we look forward to the future, to security and continuing to have those simple luxuries and pleasures we deserve through work and careful, conscientious saving. And there is no form of saving that is at once so easy and so safe and at the same time so helpful to your economic welfare as United States savings bonds. They offer you a cash reserve plus profit for United States savings bonds return $4 for every three that you invest. Buy them where you work through the payroll savings plan or if you're self-employed, through the bond a month plan at your bank. Make United States savings bonds the basis for your future happiness. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Betty Grable and Dan Daly in Mother War Tights. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood.
Joseph Cotton appeared by arrangement with David O. Selznick, producer of Alfred Hitchcock's The Paradine Case. Heard in our cast tonight were Joseph Kearns as Alex Sebastian, Gerald Moore as Prescott, and Janet Scott as Madeline Sebastian. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Mother Wore Tights, starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. Pepsodent won by three to one. Yes, in a recent survey, families throughout America compared new Pepsodent toothpaste with the brands they'd been using at home. By an overwhelming average of three to one, they preferred new Pepsodent with Irium over any other brand they tried. They said new Pepsodent toothpaste tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, with families who made comparison tests, Pepsodent won by three to one. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Mother Wore Tights, starring Betty Grable and Dan Daly. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>